Section Zero of Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages by Wilhelm Wagner. Section Zero. Introduction. Legend is not history, but in legend we find embodied historical truths, manners and customs of past ages, beliefs and superstitions otherwise long forgotten, of which history itself takes no account. Legend has preserved for us, maybe in romantic dress, maybe under altered names and circumstances, stirring pictures of heroes and heroines, who once have lived and suffered, fought and conquered, or have faced death with trustful courage. Pictures, too, of men of equal prowess, as strong in evil as in might, who, victorious for a time, have yet ever met a stronger power than theirs, stronger in virtue, stronger in might. As we write, the shadowy forms of terrific alboying, raising aloft his goblet fashioned from royal skull, the noble Siegfried, with his loved Kriemhild, and the jealous Brunhild, brave King Dietrich, the gentle, patient Gudrun, and her beauteous mother Hilda, all flit before the mind, framing themselves into a vivid picture such as must have lived in the imagination of our early forefathers, stirring them on to noble actions, restraining them from evil working. Thus has good in all ages fought against ill, and all races of men have sung its victory in strains but slightly varying. And so will it ever fight, no matter how our more elaborate ideas of what is good or evil may vary, the nation always glorifies the great and noble according to its own unreasoning reason. This volume contains the principal hero lays of the six great epic cycles of the Teutonic Middle Ages, and to them we have added the great mythical Carolingian cycle, which centered round the persons of Charlemagne and his heroes. The latter is mostly of romance origin, and was composed by court troubadours for the delight of the royal palace, wherefore it never became the true inheritance of the masses. Beside these French poems stand the bread and ones of King Arthur and his knights of the round table, which later took up the legend of the Holy Grail into their very heart, and at this period found their way to Germany, where they met with a more romantic and poetic treatment at the hands of the court minnesingers. But these foreign importations never found a true home amongst the German people. They never became popular. The native hero lays, on the other hand, even though less beautiful in conception and in form, lived on through centuries, and even to this day exist, though disguised and degraded. For in the marketplaces of Germany, and at the few old English fairs that yet remain, the peddler bookseller gives in exchange for the farthing piece printed versions of many of these old legendary tales. Siegfried's battle with the dragon, the rose garden, Alberic and Elbegast's adventures, and other wondrous histories of Teutonic epical origin. But this literature is fast dying out if, indeed, it may not by this time be said to be already dead. In Iceland, however, and in the Faroe Isles, tradition still holds her throne unconquered. She yet sings to the listening greybeards, to the men and women, and to the growing youth, of Odin and his mighty rule, of Hunir and the wicked Loki, of Thor and Freuder, and Freya, queen of heaven, a Fenris wolf and the Meathgarth serpent. In the long winter nights she still tells of bold Sigurd's Siegfried, 
deeds and battles, of Gudrun's faithful love and dumb grief beside the body of her lord, of Gunnar's marvellous harping in the garden of snakes, and the listeners hold it all in their memory, that they may sing and tell it to their children and their children's children. And so do they cherish the time-old legends of their fathers, that the ardent youth may still be heard to adjure his bride to love him with the love of Gudrun. The master revile his dishonest workmen as false as Regan, the evil dwarf, and the old men to shake their heads and say of the daring lad that he is a true descendant of the Volsings. At the dance, Sigurd's songs are yet sung. At Christmas tide, a grotesque Fofnir takes his part in the mummery. Thus old German tradition in her wane has found an asylum, perhaps a last resting place in the far north, driven from their first home by strangers, the myths of Greece and Rome. Every schoolboy can tell of Zeus and Hera, of Achilles and Odysseus, every schoolgirl of the golden apples of the Hesperides, of Helen, of Penelope. Yet to how many of our older folks, even, are the grand forms of Siegfried, Kriemhild, and Brunhild more than mere names? It is true that a tendency is now springing up in England and in Germany once more to inquire into these old tales nay, beliefs, of our common ancestry. It is true that we have a Morris, and they a Wagner, but we should wish to see the people of both nations take a more general interest in a subject of such intrinsic worth to them, their long-forgotten heritage. It is not the history of class books that they will find in it. It is that of their father's manners and customs— of their joys and sufferings, their games and occupations, festivals and religious observances, battles, victories and defeats, their virtues and their crimes. Such is the golden field that lies beneath our feet, which unheeded we have let lie fallow, till it has almost faded from memory. In a previous volume, Osgarth and the Gods, the tales and traditions of our northern ancestors, we have endeavoured to give an account of the religion of our ancient Norse parents. In this volume, we are occupied with their legendary lore. To what extent these legends formed part of their religion proper, it is impossible for us now to say. Of later origin and more poetic treatment, they stood in a similar position toward the old Teutons as the later Greek heroic legend stood to the Greeks of history. Some say, and the learned Grimm amongst them, that the heroes were historical men raised to the dignity of gods, others that they were humanized gods themselves, but maybe neither theory is exactly true, though both contain a portion of the truth. In the hero legends, we certainly find heroes possessed of the distinctive attributes of certain gods, and we are tempted to add others to their characters, but we consider that these divine qualities were looked upon rather as divine gifts of the gods, and did not thereby exactly deify the recipients. It was similar with the Greeks— and perhaps with all nations at a stage when their heroes really formed an essential element in their belief. The gods were never human heroes. The heroes never became gods, though each approached the other so nearly that we are often misled into assuming that they were identical. W. S. W. Anson End of Section Zero Recording by The Story Girl Section 1 of Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mickey Lee Rich 
epics and romances of the middle ages by wilhelm wagner section one from part one the amelung and kindred legends section one langobardian legends chapter one alboin and rosamund untroubled by the conscientious scruples of the historian the poet throws the glamour of his genius over the events he relates when taking for his theme the great deeds of the past he strives to make them live in the hearts of his hearers the story of Alboin and Rosamund has a strictly historical foundation, although many poetic liberties have been taken with it. For instance, it is contrary to fact that the heroes of this and the following tale were predecessors of Theodoric, for Alboin did not march into Italy at the head of the Langobards until the year 568 AD, whereas Theodoric died in 526, and his Gothic empire was destroyed in year 553 nevertheless we give the stories in their poetical order as the natural connection between them is thus kept up the germanic gepid and langobards and the asiatic avars were inhabitants of pannonia i e hungary and the neighboring provinces at the time this story begins war and hunting were the occupations of the freemen while the serfs tended the flocks and herds and cultivated the land now it happened that Alboin, son of Lingobardian ruler Adwan, conquered and slew a son of Thurisand, king of the Gepid, in fair fight. He then took possession of the armor of his vanquished foe, and bore it in his arms to his father's hall, just as the warriors of his race were assembling there to hold a high festival. He would have joined them, but his father forbade him, saying that it had always been held by the sages of the olden time that no prince was worthy to sit at the table of heroes until he had been given a suit of mail by some foreign king. The young man snatched up his battle-axe, but remembering in time that it was his father who stood before him, turned and left the hall. He mounted his charger and set out with his train for the land of Gepid. He arrived at the royal stronghold, when King Thurisand was feasting with the princes of his people. Alboin approached the king, and placing himself under protection of the laws of hospitality, begged that he might be furnished with a suit of armor forthwith. The Gepid were displeased with the boldness of his manner, but Thurisand received him kindly and gave him a seat at his side. Many beakers were drunk, and the conversation at table grew more and more unfriendly, for Kunamend, the king's eldest son, was angry and jealous at a stranger, being given his place beside the king. To prevent further disagreement, Thurisan sent for the minstrels to come and enliven the company. They came. They sang the glorious deeds of their forefathers, and especially those done by Alderic, who destroyed the power of the Huns lastly they called upon the young men before them to follow in the footsteps of their ancestors careless whether fortune rewarded their efforts or not yes said kunamund when the song was ended fortune is blind and throws her favors at the feet of the mean-spirited creatures with white bands round their knees that makes them look for all the world like white-legged hacks and every one knows it takes a deal of beating to make them go the Langobards always wore the white bands alluded to, so they knew that the scornful words were directed against them. Alboin's blood was up in a moment. He started to his feet, and he told Kunamon to go to the place where he had fought his brother, and there he would see how shrewdly the white-legged hacks could kick. A tumult immediately arose, which was with difficulty calmed by the old king, who then gave Alboin the armor he had craved and sent him away with his followers without loss of time, lest worse should come of it and the rights of hospitality be broken. As Alboin rode away, he passed Rosamund, Kunamund's fair little daughter, who was playing at shuttlecock with her maidens, and as he passed, he looked at her long and earnestly. Rosamund Peace lasted between the Langobards and the Gepid while the old kings Adoin and Thurisand lived but after their death a bloody feud broke out between the rival tribes at length kunamund and many of the noblest gepid fell under the axes of alboin and his people upon which the langobardian king had his enemy's skull set as a goblet in a silver rim and used it for drinking solemn toasts at the great feasts then he married rosamund and she poor soul hated him as the murderer of her father she had to feign love though she would willingly have strangled her husband with her own hands she bore her lot as well as might be 
all the while nursing the secret hope that she might one day avenge her father's death. Alboin had no idea of the thoughts that filled his wife's heart. Intent on conquest, he crossed the Alps into Italy at the head of his own people, at those Gepid who had followed the fortunes of their princes and of other adventurers who had joined his train. This he did in response to an invitation from the Roman general Narsus, a victor over the Ostrogoths, who, feeling himself slighted by the imperial court, had determined on vengeance. Alboin carried all before him and destroyed every town and fortress that did not at once open its gates to receive him. Pavia alone offered a lone resistance. During his three years' siege of that city, the Langobardian king made raids into the neighboring country and brought it under his rule. One warrior alone was equal to him in prowess, and that was Paradis, a giant who was said to possess the strength of twelve ordinary men. At last the gates of Pavia opened, and Alboin, who had sworn to put the inhabitants to fire and sword, rode in under the archway. Just then his horse stumbled, and a priest exclaimed that this was an omen that he should die a violent death if he kept his word. The king believed the warning, forgave, and spared the city. The Regicide Alboin gave a great feast to his warriors, at which much of the fiery wine of the south was consumed. The talk of the guest was of the great deeds of Wodan, the god of battles, and how he and Frigga had led their fathers to victory. Then they spoke of their own conquest of the Gepid and their victories in Italy. In the midst of this, Alboin, intoxicated with wine and pride, commanded that the goblet made of Cunamon's gold should be brought, and turning to Queen Rosamond, desired her to pledge him it. She hesitated. Why? he cried. Know you not, Rosamond, that I love you more than aught in the world besides? Show me now your love and obedience by doing what I bid you. She looked at him in silent entreaty, but her hesitation aroused his anger. He raised his hand to strike her, and then she lifted her murdered father's skull to her lips. None could tell whether she drank or not, for, flinging the goblet on the table so violently that the wine ran out, she said, "'I have obeyed you, but you have lost your wife.' Having uttered these words, she rose and left the room. A hoarse murmur of indignation passed from mouth to mouth for no one approved of what the king had done, and he, suddenly sobered by his wife's words and actions, got up and left the hall. Alboin did not see Rosamond again until the following day when she went about her usual duties quietly. The insult seemed to be forgiven and forgotten, but Rosamond could neither forgive nor forget. She dreamed of vengeance. At last she persuaded Helmagus, the king's shield-bearer, to murder his master. But when the moment for action came, he feared to do the deed. So the queen turned to Paradeus for help, and by means of flattery and sweet words brought him over to her side. One evening he slipped into the king's room and slew him. Before Alboin's death became known, the conspirators, of whom there were many, got possession of the royal treasure and hid it away in a secret place. Soon after this, Rosamond announced her betrothal to Helmagus and named him as Alboin's successor in royal power. The nobles assembled to debate the point, and after much discussion, it was agreed by a large majority that the murderer of the great Alboin was the last man who ought to succeed him, that he should rather be punished for his crime. Hearing how matters were going on in the council, the conspirators fled. The Retribution Guarded by her faithful Gepid, Rosamond and her accomplices reached Ravenna in safety with the treasure they had carried away with them. There they placed themselves under the protection of Longinus, exarch and viceroy of the Eastern Emperor. They had not been there long when Longinus, having fallen desperately in love with the fair widow, or with the wealth of which she was possessed, asked Rosamond to marry him and she at once consented on condition that the viceroy freed her from Helmigus, to whom she was already bound. Longinus gave her a cup of wine mixed with the deadly poison, telling her to give it to Helmigus the next time he complained of thirst. This she did. Her victim drained half the goblet at a drought. The poison was so strong that he immediately felt he was doomed, and drawing his sword, forced her to finish what he had left. Thus the murderers died and their great treasure fell into the hands of the Roman viceroy. 
but the story tells us that wealth did not make him happy and that it was the ultimate cause of his death we have still to learn what become of paradeus the giant he was so used to deeds of violence that he thought the murder of alboin a mere nothing placing himself at the head of the band of the gebed he set out for constantinople and offered his services to the emperor his great strength gained him a high position at court and raised him in the master's favor as time went on he became discontented with the treatment he received thinking it hardly consistent with the gratitude he deserved for his manifold services some of his angry words were repeated to his master who determined to make him powerless to hurt the throne one night when paradeus was snoring off the effects of a drunken orgy a number of men crept into his room chained him hand and foot and put out his eyes his howls of pain were so terrible that they made all in the palace and the neighborhood tremble the blind giant showed himself quiet and obedient so that his guard ceased to fear him but still they never took off his chains until one evening he begged to be allowed to wrestle before the emperor maintaining that his strength was unabated he was led into the great hall and there amid the general applause proved himself as mighty an athlete as he had ever been suddenly he heard the emperor's voice and dashing in that direction plunged a knife he had concealed about his person into the hearts of two great officials of the court whom he mistook for the emperor a few minutes more and he had fallen under the spears of the bodyguard so one by one the murderers of alboin all came to a violent end and the langobards for want of their leader failed to gain full possession of their fair southern land they had come to regard as their own End of section 1. Recorded by Mickey Lee Rich. Occasionally their power was revived for a time by some able king, such as Rotharis, 636-52, the subject of the following legend, till it was finally broken by Charlemagne the Frank in 774. Section 2 of Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages by Wilhelm Wagner. Section 2 King Rother, The Twelve Messengers. Bari is the name of an Italian town which, small and unimportant as it is now, was once a mighty seaport in those old days the harbor was deep and large and full of ships while in the town itself were numerous palaces and houses surrounded by gardens and orange groves here it was that the great and glorious king rother the father of his people and the terror of his foes held court amongst the dukes counts and nobles of the land the race course was close to the sea and there the young warriors were wont to congregate to throw the spear and practice such sports as teach agility while the women and maidens looked on and distributed prizes to the successful candidates for honour one day king rother was seated on his throne surrounded by his counsellors watching now the people now the sports and now the restless waves that were beating against the shore there was a troubled look upon his face turning to his old and faithful banner-bearer duke berthshire of moran who sat beside him look he said do you see how the waves raise their foam crowned heads high in the air dash forward and then vanish without leaving a trace behind the kings of the earth resemble them in this so indeed do all men what do you say cried the duke do you not hear how many songs are sung in your praise do you not know that such songs live on from generation to generation and that your name and deeds will therefore be spoken of with admiration till the end of time that is poor comfort replied the king what is the future to me when the present is so tame and joyless a happy home were better to me than the songs of which you speak there go your seven sons bold leopold at their head their helmets wreathed in token of victory you live a second life in them and their love will sustain you in your old age what good is my throne to me i have not a wife nor child i shall wither like an old tree or become the laughing-stock of children in my age then why do you not marry asked the duke laughing heartily 
you are in your prime and a famous warrior you might pick and choose any one you liked for a wife no one would say you nay from a simple maiden to a high-born princess you say that i am free to choose said rother bitterly kings are more fettered in their choice than other men they must marry in their own degree or their children cannot succeed them and may even live to curse them i have travelled in many lands but i have never yet seen the princess i could have wished to make my wife nay then sire if you are so hard to please returned berchther after a deep and thoughtful silence i think i know of a lady who might suit you if you are willing to risk your head for her sake the king desiring further information berchther showed him a portrait of a lovely girl who he said was the daughter of the emperor of constantinople rother could not take his eyes off the picture and exclaimed that she and she alone must be his wife very good my lord said birchther but that is a more difficult matter to bring about than you think i must explain what i mean the emperor constantine is so devoted to his daughter that he will not part with her and if any man be he count duke or king is bold enough to go and ask for her hand he at once orders his head to be cut off and what is the good of a headless wooer i think answered rother that i shall meet with a better reception than that the emperor of the east will know how to bear himself to the ruler of the west but now call my counsellors together that i may tell them what i intend to do when the council was assembled the king told his ministers the whole story adding in conclusion that he intended to do his wooing in person they strongly dissuaded him from this upon the plea that the king being the chief of the state had no right to endanger its safety by risking his head unnecessarily rother at last gave way much against his will the debate as to who should go to constantinople lasted a long time for each man felt that his head was of at least as much value to himself as the king's could possibly be to the state then leopold birchther's brave son rose with six of his brothers and declared in their name and his own that they were ready to go as soon as the ships were fitted out for the journey whereupon five noble counts emulating the valour of these seven announced their willingness to accompany them preparations were made for the departure of the twelve ambassadors and at last the day came on which they were to set sail just before the anchors were lifted the king came down to the harbour his gold-stringed harp in his hand and sang them a farewell song so strangely sweet and stirring that it moved them as wooden's songs used to move the hearts of their fathers in the olden time it seemed to them as though the god of battles were calling on them to be up and doing the music ceased and then rother took leave of them saying if ever you are in need and you hear that song you may know that i am near and will help you the hawsers were unloosed and the ship set sail after a voyage that lasted for days and weeks the travellers sighted the golden horn the port of constantinople and as the sun was rising over the city they landed at the wharf they dressed themselves in velvet and heavy gold brocade and cloaks trimmed with ermine every one turned to gaze after them as they passed up the street towards the palace none knew who they were or whence they came but all thought they must be the ambassadors of some mighty prince the emperor was yet in bed dreaming of the feasts and carousals in which his heart delighted when the empress awoke him and said get up constantine the messengers of a great king have come to see you they bring tidings of vast importance you must receive them with all due honour and respect when the emperor was ready he desired the ambassadors to be brought to him in the throne room where he received them courteously at first all went well constantine was pleased that his friendship and alliance should be sought by the ruler of the west and expressed his delight in no scant terms but when leopold went on to say that his royal master had also commissioned him to ask in his name for the hand of the princess oda the emperor's wrath knew no bounds he ordered his guards to seize the foreign hounds and cast them into prison 
when the guards had left the hall with the twelve ambassadors constantine began to pace the floor rubbing his hands and muttering behead drown hang which shall it be ah it were best to hang them it would be a grand sight twelve fine gentlemen in gorgeous raiment brought at once to the gallows st maurice grant that the wondrous spectacle may bring us glory constantine said the kindly empress beware what you do is our beautiful daughter never to marry would it not be a good thing to give her to king rother and let her rule the west with him as we the east if you slay the messengers he has sent rother will assuredly ally himself with the heathen king of desert babylon and with his help seek your destruction saint michael and his holy angels will protect us against the mind of the godless host of infidels replied the emperor sanctimoniously ah said the prudent wife do not be too sure of that he has other things to do he has to fight for the conversion and salvation of the wild heathen tribes take my advice and keep rother's messengers as hostages that our hands may be strengthened when their king comes over the western sea and demands them from us at the head of his army the council pleased the emperor and he gave orders that the prisoners should be well guarded the sailing of the heroes the weeks and months rolled into a year and still the ambassadors did not return to bari every heart was full of an undefined dread had they perished at sea or at the hands of the cruel tyrant to whom they had been sent none could answer old birch there one day went to the king and said sire my heart is sad i can bear my sorrow no longer i had twelve goodly sons helfrich the eldest was slain fighting the barbarians near the elbe in the far north seven have gone to constantinople in your service and have never returned i will go and see if i can find them you must not go alone returned the king i will call a meeting of the royal council and ask my wise advisers what were best to be done after a stormy discussion in which weighty arguments were often enforced with still weightier blows it was determined to follow the advice of the eldest councillors these aged and reverend men were of the opinion that it would be bad policy to send an army against constantinople for were the messengers still alive the emperor would assuredly put them to death when he found that rother had appeared in the guise of an enemy it would be far better they contended to send a richly appointed assembassage composed of good men and true to spy out the land and see if it were not possible to save their friends and gain the hand of the princess at the same time king rother announced his intention of placing himself at the head of the expedition and as birchther refused to be left behind count Amelger of tangeline was appointed regent preparations for their departure went on apace noble warriors came from all parts of the kingdom to offer their services among those accepted were twelve men who were so tall and so heavy that they could have nowhere found horses strong enough to bear their weight king rother alone knew who they were and he received them as old and trusted friends they were asprian osburn chief of the northern giants and eleven of his tallest men at length all was ready and the ship set sail amidst a blare of trumpets a fair wind filled the sheets which were edged with cloth of silver and the vessels glided through the glassy deep as if drawn by swans the king stood high on the deck of his galley when he touched his harp and sang of a woman's love and manly courage the hearts of the heroes were fired to deeds of daring and the mermaids and dolphins dipped their heads out of the waves and played about the prows and listened to the lay then rother called his chiefs about him and told them that he intended to go cunningly to work when he got to constantinople he would introduce himself to the emperor as dietrich a noble of king rother's country who had been outlawed by his sovereign and who now craved constantine's protection he further desired them to begin at once to call him by his assumed name that they might make no mistake on their arrival 
the voyage was uneventful and the adventurers soon reached their destination the first to land were dietrich and old berster and then followed the flower of rother's army lastly the giants appeared inspiring awe and fear in every heart all were clothed like princes in splendid attire and with jewelled armor the empress received the strangers with courtly grace and even the emperor looked pleased to see them strangers he said we should like to know from whence you come who you are and what brings you to our good city before granting you permission to remain here we would fain know more about you mighty sovereign of greece hungary and bulgaria answered dietrich we come from the realm of king rother where i bore the title and power of duke i held my liege lord in all his battles but as i was always victorious he grew jealous of my good fortune and i had to fly for my life i have come here as a fugitive with my faithful vassals and all the wealth i could carry and now i entreat of you to grant me your protection for which i will repay you by faithful service in the field you are an honest man replied the emperor and you shall receive a fitting welcome i was afraid at first that you had come on the same errand as the ambassadors of king rother who asked me to give my daughter in marriage to their master i have them safe under lock and key where even the light of the sun cannot reach them had your request been the same as theirs you and your men would have suffered the like fate on hearing these words the giant asprian started forward the whole room trembling beneath his mighty tread my lord he cried laying his hand upon his sword you might perhaps have found that a more difficult task than you imagine before you took us prisoners many of your guard would lay low and who can tell whether you yourself would have escaped scatheless we are not lambs to be slaughtered at the will of any man constantine did not much like this address and tried to smooth down the ruffled feelings of the giant after some further conversation he invited the strangers to dine at his table while they were eating a tame lion of which the emperor was very fond began to steal the food from under the hands of the guests asprian's wrath was roused by the tempting morsel being snatched away from him and starting up he seized the beast in his powerful hands and flung him with such force against the stone wall of the banqueting room that he fell never to rise again constantine desired his guards to turn the giant out of the hall but the empress whispered oh take care what you do that man is not to be defied with impunity king rother must be very powerful to have outlawed such men as these take my advice and set his messengers free let them take our daughter home with them that she may be the wife of a great king and that she may induce her husband to be our friend and ally constantine listened in angry silence at length he desired his wife to be silent reminding her that when once he had made up his mind on any subject he never changed dietrich and his friends took up their abode in the lodging the emperor had assigned to them and there they had their treasures borne by the sailors a labor that lasted many days many were the gifts they showered on their new acquaintances amongst others on lord helm and a brave and somewhat poor warrior named arnold the latter was so touched by their kindness that he swore to help his benefactor whenever he could the fair oda the story of dietrich's wealth and generosity became known in the palace and princess oda was seized with an intense curiosity to see the hero of so many tales she took counsel with herland her chief lady-in-waiting as to how she might accomplish her purpose with most propriety then acting on her advice she begged her father to get up some races and allow her and the ladies to watch the sport the emperor consented and on the appointed day a large assemblage of spectators appeared on the course the crush of people who collected around dietrich was so great that none of the ladies of the court were able to get so much as a glimpse of him the next day oda called herland into her room and promised her five gold bracelets if she could contrive a secret meeting between her and the stranger herland promised to do her best 
she went to Dietrich's lodging, taking every precaution against being seen, and gave him her mistress's message. He refused to go and see the princess, lest the news of his having done so should leak out and come to the emperor's ears. But before dismissing Herland, he gave her a golden and a silver shoe as a present. She hastened back to her lady and told her all. He is a noble man, said Oda, and cares more for our honor than for his own safety. I will keep the shoes in remembrance of him, and I will give you instead as many gold pieces as they will hold. Herland was satisfied with the proposal, and now tried to put the shoes on her lady's feet, but could not, for they were both made for the same foot. Go, cried the princess, he is not true. I will have none of his gifts, and will think of him no more. Take back the shoes and throw them at his feet. Wise Herland understood how to interpret her mistress's command. She hastened to Dietrich, and told him that the princess was very angry with him, but that her curiosity to see him was so great that she would no doubt pardon him if he took a proper pair of shoes with his own hand. Dietrich seized the first moment when he could reach the princess's apartments unobserved, and knocked at the door. He stopped on the threshold in amazement at the wondrous beauty of the maiden who advanced to meet him. She was also struck by his stately bearing and the resolute expression of his handsome manly face. She had intended to show him her displeasure, but she could not. She could only listen to the grave and sensible explanation he gave of his conduct in not at once obeying her commands. And when he asked permission to put the shoes on her feet, she could not deny him. In course of conversation he mentioned Rother's offer for her hand. And then, little by little, he told her his secret, and the reason that had brought him to Constantinople. He asked her for her love, and she promised to be his wife. He now showed her that her father's sentiments being what they were, their only chance of happiness was to fly together, and explained that before they could attempt to make their escape his faithful servants, who were still confined in the emperor's dungeons, must be set at liberty. He begged Oda to try and set them free. She promised to do her best, and pointed out the gloomy tower in which they were imprisoned. Next day the princess appeared before her father, dressed in deep mourning, and told him that she had had a dreadful dream that night. Her room had seemed full of flames from the nethermost hell, and she had heard a voice call to her that if King Rother's twelve messengers were not brought out of their dungeons, and furnished with clothes, food, and wine, she would fall under eternal condemnation. That was the devil's voice, not an angel's, answered Constantine, and I will not, on such a command, give up the rights I possess by the grace of God. But if it will make you happier, Oda, I will allow the prisoners to have their liberty for a short time, on the condition that some one will offer his life to me as bail for them that they will not try to make their escape. Oda left her father's presence much comforted, for she had made up her mind what to do. THE LIBERATION OF THE MESSENGERS When the emperor, his guests and courtiers, were seated at dinner that day, Princess Oda entered the hall, followed by her ladies. She went round the table and told all and sundry of her desire to liberate the twelve prisoners, and of the condition her father had made. Now who, she asked, will let his head be surety for the heads of these unhappy men? A dead silence reigned in the hall. At last Dietrich rose in his place, and in a loud, clear voice offered himself as hostage for the men, upon which the emperor ordered the twelve counts to be brought out of their prison, taken to the bath and provided with clothes suitable to their rank and condition. This was done, and while the poor fellows, scarcely able to believe their senses, were seated at the meal provided for them, someone outside began to play the harp. They listened intently, a deep flush dyeing their sunken cheeks, and a flash of joyful surprise brightening their sad eyes, for they recognized the air. "'It is he! Our king is near! He has come to save us!' they whispered in awestruck accents. 
Weeks passed, and light and food did their work in restoring the strength of the prisoners. One day the door of their room opened, and Rother came in dressed in his full armor. "'You are free,' he said joyously. But he had scarcely time to greet them when Birchther rushed forward to embrace his sons, followed by Wolfrat, the hero of Tegling, Strong Asprian, and Wildot, his inseparable companion." Rother told Leopold and the rest about their voyage, and that he was only known to the Greeks by the name of Dietrich. Then he told how he had won the love of fair Oda, and through her help had gained their freedom at the risk of his own life. But the best was yet to come. Imilot, king of desert Babylon, had invaded Constantine's realm with a mighty army, and had demanded half the empire, and the hand of Princess Oda for his son, Basilistum. The emperor, not knowing what to do, continued Rother, I offer to help him if he would allow you to join me and my friends. He consented, and so you are free to become my comrades in battle. Your armor and weapons lie without. Widal was so delighted at the thought of fighting that he gave way to a stentorian burst of laughter and nearly knocked the emperor down by accident when he came in to tell the prisoners that they were free. War and Victory Of all who followed Constantine into the field on that occasion, Dietrich and his men were most worthy of notice, not only because of the magnificence of their accoutrements, but from their noble appearance. Chief amongst them were brave Wolfrat of Tegling in Bavaria, old Duke Birchther of Maran, his son Leopold of Milan, and other counts of the West, and lastly huge Asprian and his giants. These consulted together on the eve of the day fixed on for the great battle, and determined that when the Greek and Babylonian forces were asleep, they would quietly slip out of their own camp, and, if possible, into that of the enemy. At midnight they set out on their dangerous enterprise. They passed the sentinels by means of the password they had taken care to find out, and softly made their way to the king's tent. It was a warm but dark summer night. Not a star was visible. The king's bodyguard were asleep at their post. They never awoke again on earth. Wolfrat stabbed them as they slept, to guard against surprise. Widalt entered the royal tent, and picking up Imelod in his arms as though he had been an infant, desired him to be silent as he valued his life. The giant's loud voice awakened some of the servants who slept near, and they rushed into the tent to save their master, but were speedily slain. The whole camp was now astir, but the efforts of the soldiery were in vain. Confused by the darkness and their sudden awakening, many were killed, while a greater number fled, and sought refuge in their ships. Rother and his handful of followers had thus won a complete victory, and before daybreak had returned to their tents with Imelot and some other princes of desert Babylon whom they had taken prisoners. Thoroughly tired with their hard night's work, they threw themselves on their couches and sought well-merited repose. Not so the Emperor Constantine. Contrary to his usual habit, he was up and about at a very early hour, and ordered the horns to blow to rouse the camp. This done, he desired that his troops should pass before him in companies. All were present except Lord Dietrich and his companions. Aha! laughed the Emperor scornfully. So that fellow's high talk was all swagger. I will go see what keeps him and he trotted away to Dietrich's tent. When he got there, he found that all was silent as the grave. Motioning to his attendants to help him from his horse, he advanced to wake the sleepers. In the first tent he saw the grim giant Woodall stretched upon a panther skin, while in the background a man was tossing about on a bed of straw, bound hand and foot. The emperor did not dare to wake the sleeper. He stepped over him carefully, and advanced close to the prisoner. I'm a lot, in deadly fear lest he should be murdered on the spot, shrieked out who he was, and offered the half of his kingdom in exchange for his life. The noise wakened the giant. He sprang to his feet, and seizing his club, shouted to Dietrich to come, 
for some treason was being hatched in their very tents. He would certainly have killed both monarchs on the spot, had his companions not hastened to his side and hindered him. When Constantine heard the occurrences of the previous night, he was filled with surprise and admiration. He gave a solemn feast in honor of the victory, which in public he ascribed to himself, for were not Dietrich and his companions in his pay at the time? In order that the empress and her ladies might not be kept in ignorance of what had happened, Constantine sent Dietrich and his men on in advance to bear the news to the capital. Bringing Home the Bride The western heroes rode back to Constantinople light-hearted and happy, for Dietrich had told them that the hour of their return home was near. The first step, in his opinion, was to proclaim that Imelot had conquered and dispersed the Greek army, and was rapidly marching on the capital. "'All is lost!' they cried, when the citizens came out to meet them. "'Fly! Save yourselves while you may! Imelot's wild horde of savages will soon be upon you!' Then, galloping to the palace, Dietrich entreated the empress to come on board his galley with her daughter and her ladies and to bring anything of value that she particularly cared for. They soon reached the strand. Ode across the plank leading to the vessel, her hand resting trustfully on Dietrich's arm. Then the plank was withdrawn and the ship pushed from land. The empress wept and begged that she might be taken too, but Dietrich explained to her the true state of the case, and telling her who he was, assured her that Oda was going home with him to rule over the West as his beloved queen. Ah, said the mother, much comforted, be kind to her, noble hero, and take my blessing on you both. Think of me sometimes, as I shall think of you. After a pleasant voyage the travellers arrived at Barry, where the marriage of King Rother to the princess was celebrated with all pomp. When Constantine returned with his victorious army to Constantinople and learned what had happened, he was very angry. Had he not feared Rother and his gigantic allies, he would have sent an army to Bari to fetch back the princess. The whole city was in such confusion that King Imelot had not much difficulty in effecting his escape and returning to his own land. The emperor did not fret much when he heard this news. He could think of nothing but the loss of his daughter. He cared not for the rich dishes in which he used to delight, nor for the delicate wines his steward brought to tempt his appetite. He grew thin and pale, and his clothes hung loose on his shrunken frame. THE MOUNTEBANK One day when he was alone in his room, a chamberlain came to him and announced that a clever mountebank had come who would be sure to amuse his majesty and turn his thoughts into a pleasanter channel. The mountebank was admitted. The emperor watched him perform all his curious tricks without a smile. But when the man sang of a woman who had been stolen from her home, and whose friends had freed her by means of cunning, not strength, he listened with his whole soul in his eyes. When the song was finished, he signed to the man to approach him, and asked him if he could bring Oda home to Constantinople. "'Give me,' answered the Montebank, "'a goodly ship, well fitted with merchandise, and I promise to bring the lady back to you. You may send some of your soldiers with me, if you like, that they may cut off my head if I fail to keep my promise.' Before long the ship was laden and ready for sea. It was a fast sailor, and there were many able seamen on board, to say nothing of the soldiers the emperor had sent to see that the player was true to his bargain. All went well during the voyage, and the ship at last reached the port of Bari. The mountebank landed and set to work to find out all that he could about the royal family. He found that King Rother had gone to Riffland with his troops, leaving Leopold of Milan regent in his place. He congratulated himself on his good luck when he heard this, for he thought his plan would be easier of accomplishment during the king's absence. On return to his ship, he made ready to show off his conjuring tricks on board the vessel. Crowds came, tempted by the unusual sight. He then brought out his silks and precious stones and offered them for sale. Amongst his wares was a pebble. 
people asked what good a wretched common pebble could do him. This stone, he said, taking it gently in his hand, is worth a ton of gold, for if a queen should touch a lame or impotent man with it, he would at once become strong and well again. Ah, sighed one of the lords, if that were only true, I would give half my county were it really so, for I have three children, all of whom have been lame from their birth. They would soon jump about and play like other children, replied the mountebank, if your good queen would only come on board my ship and try the virtue of the pebble. The count hastened to Queen Oda and told her his story, and she, with her usual kindness, said how willing she was to cure the children if she could. She at once set out for the vessel, but no sooner were she and her ladies on board than the landing plank was slipped, the hawsers were unloosed, and a fresh wind catching the sails, the ship was soon out of sight of land. Rother to the Rescue The citizens of Bari clustered about the harbour not knowing what to do, and Leopold vainly sought a ship that could be got ready immediately to pursue and overtake the robber's vessel. At the same moment King Rother's horns were heard proclaiming his return. As soon as the king was told what had happened, his decision was formed. "'We must take an army to Constantinople,' he cried. "'My dear wife has been stolen from me by force and cunning, and by force and cunning I will win her back.' Old Duke Birchther shook his grey head, but said that he and his men would follow the king. Leopold, Wolfrat, and the other princes of the realm promised to do the same. Messengers were sent to bear the tidings to all parts of the kingdom, and soon a great army was assembled. Rother picked out the bravest warriors to accompany him, amongst whom were Asprian and his giants. The rest he sent home. Meantime the ships that were to bear the little army had been got ready, and after a favourable voyage reached the neighbourhood of Constantinople. Rother gave orders that the vessels should be run ashore in a small bay, surrounded on all sides by a thick wood, which stretched in the direction of the city, and which would serve to conceal both ships and men. "'We are safe here,' said Rother to his nobles. "'The populace have an unspeakable terror of this wood,' which they believe to be peopled by monsters of all sorts. Let the men encamp here, and I will go to the city in a pilgrim's dress and see what is going on. There was a general outcry at the idea of the king adventuring himself alone in the enemy's stronghold, and many of the princes offered to go with him. He, therefore, consented to take the Duke of Moran and his son Leopold. Before starting, Wolfrat gave him a tiny horn, telling him the sound it made was so shrill that it could be heard for miles around. "'As soon as we hear it,' said Asprian, "'we shall come to your help with clubs and swords.' "'Yes,' laughed Widalt, "'and then there will be many a broken head. "'I can promise you.' The three pilgrims set out on their way. After going some distance, they saw a horseman coming towards them in shining armor. They asked him if there were good news in Constantinople. Not at all, he answered. Look, King Rother gave me this coat of mail, and my good sword and a thousand gold pieces to boot, for I had lost both land and wealth at the hands of miscreants, and now I find that the Greeks have stolen away his fair wife, and are about to marry her to that cruel demon Basilistum, son of Imelod, king of desert Babylon." for when Imelod escaped from here, he collected a great army, and marching into the Emperor Constantine's land, took him prisoner, and now demands the half of his empire and the Lady Oda for that unlicked cub, his son, who, according to the present arrangement, is to remain here after his marriage, that Constantine may not be deprived of his daughter's society." All the Christians in the place tremble to think of the persecutions that will follow. Oh, that King Rother would only come! I would join him with all my men as sure as my name is Arnold. Truly, said Rother as they parted, a kind action often brings unlooked-for reward. The city was full of life and feasting. 
I'm a lot, Constantine, and their followers were hobnobbing together in the banqueting room in the greatest peace and concord, for Constantine was overjoyed at having settled the vexed question of his daughter's marriage without losing her altogether. The hunchback bridegroom sat between his father and his would-be father-in-law and close to sad Oda and her equally sorrowful mother. The doors were wide open that the populace might come in and watch the proceedings. So the three pilgrims were able to enter unnoticed, with their hats pulled down low over their brows. They heard Constantine, I'm a lot, and Basilistum boast of how they would scornfully entreat and hang King Rother and all his giants if they ventured to come within their reach. During the laughter and confusion caused by these speeches, Rother managed to slip a ring bearing his name into his wife's hand, and she, with a look of intense relief, showed it to her mother. "'Rother is here,' cried the hunchback bridegroom suddenly. "'He has just given my wife a ring with his name engraved on it. "'Seek him out and seize him.' Swords were drawn, tables overturned, and noisy shouts heard on every side. Rother and his companions came forward, and the former said clearly and distinctly, "'Yes, I am here. I have come to claim my wife.' and if the king of desert Babylon or his hunchback son deny my right, I am ready to prove it on their bodies with my good sword. I'm a lot laughed till the hall re-echoed. Fight with you? he cried. A poor little kinglet like you? No, no, you must be hung. He must be hung, repeated the courtiers. To the gallows with him, and his comrades too, continued the Babylonish king. "'Seize them and bind them till the blood starts from their fingers.' "'The heroes had only their pilgrim staves, "'and these were poor weapons wherewith to defend themselves "'against the swords and lances that were pointed at them. "'They were taken and bound. "'No hand was raised to help them, "'although many a hearty fellow in the crowd "'had cause to remember Dietrich's kindness. "'A king,' said Rother proudly, who has often looked death in the face on the battlefield, knows how to die when his time comes. Let the executioner do his work in the haunted wood, where Constantine has already had so many innocent men put to a shameful death. A good idea, quoth the emperor grimly. There are gallows there that will just do to hang the stealer of women and his comrades on. That is right, laughed Imelot and then the monsters who inhabit the wood will come at night and play many a merry prank with their bones. If their friends the giants should come over the sea in search of Rother and his crew, we will hang them, too, and they may find themselves in good company. The whole army shall see how great Imelot revenges himself upon his foes. The preparations for the execution were finished in a few hours, and the prisoners were borne to the haunted wood amidst an immense crowd and the music of drums and trumpets. The populace were curious to see a king hanged. And so it is, Dietrich, kind Dietrich, sighed one, while another laughed and answered, What does that matter to us? It is all the same whether a man is a king or a beggar when he comes to be hung. Ah, yes, said a third, the rope is an uncomfortable necktie for any man but that it should be tried on a crowned head is a thing I never expected to see. The procession arrived at its destination. The prisoners were led to the foot of the gallows. "'Be of good cheer, Sir King,' said the executioner. "'You once gave me a handful of gold pieces, and to show you my gratitude I have provided a silken rope for you that will do the business very quickly. The other two gentlemen must put up with common hemp.' I'm sorry to say. By St. Michael, I never did a day's work before that I liked so ill. Pray loose my hands for a moment, good fellow, asked Rother, that I may say a prayer. A pious wish, replied the man. I will also pray to my patron saint, and beg him to take you straight to heaven from the gallows tree. He loosed the king's hands as he spoke, and then began to pray. Meanwhile, Rother drew out his horn from under the pilgrim's mantle, where it was concealed. Three times its wild call sounded over mountain and valley, like a cry for help to the faithful friends who were waiting fully armed in the depths of the wood. But King Imelod, growing impatient, 
commanded that the executioner should himself be hung if he delayed any further to do his duty. The man was frightened and began to bind Rother's hands again, but at that moment a loud noise was heard in the background. It was Arnold, who, with his men, had joined Rother's other friends, and who now came with them to the rescue of his former benefactor. There was a fearful battle. Imelot and many more fell fighting desperately, while Basilistum was slain during the fight. The whole army of desert Babylon was scattered or destroyed. After the victory, King Rother asked for the emperor, but found that Constantine had thought prudence the better part of valor, and had long before fled to the palace, where he had taken refuge in the women's apartments. His courage had all ebbed away, and he begged his wife and daughter to entreat Rother to save him out of the hand of the giants, those veritable children of the evil one. The ladies were soon ready to go out and meet the ruler of the West. They placed the timid emperor in their midst, and accompanied by numerous train, set out for the wood. The first people they met were the giants. Asprian's falcon eyes at once spied out the emperor, carefully as he tried to hide himself. Stretching his long arm over the empress, he seized him by the scruff of the neck and flung him on the ground. Widalt raised his club to put an end to him as he lay there senseless, but his master stopped him, saying, Not so, Widalt, away with the miserable wretch to the gallows. The giant caught the emperor up as easily as if he had been a baby, and went dancing along the road to the gallows with him in his arms. But they soon came up with Rother and his heroes, and the king pardoned Constantine. He could not have done otherwise. His wife was once more in his arms, and where love rules, wrath and vengeance have no place. When they all met in the banqueting room that evening, the emperor found himself unusually hungry after the many and varied emotions he had gone through, and it is said that he devoured a whole leg of mutton and drank an immense quantity of wine. King Rother left the whole of the Eastern Empire, which he had just conquered, in the hands of his father-in-law, and then set sail for Bari accompanied by Queen Oda. Arrived there, they went on to Rome, where a second marriage was solemnized with great pomp. Rother and his wife lived long and happily together, and had many children. We shall hear pleasant things of their daughter, Herka, or Herche, or Helke, and their granddaughter, Herat, as time goes on. End of section 2《Section 3 of Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages by Wilhelm Wagner》Section 3 Part 1st Section 1 Chapter 3 Ordnate A great king once lived in Lombardy, he was richer and more powerful than any other monarch far or near. His name was Ortnit, and his dominions extended over the whole of Italy, from the Alps to the sea, and even included Sicily. The neighboring kings were all his vassals, for possessing the strength of twelve ordinary men, he was of course victorious in every battle. And yet he was not contented, an inward unrest prevented him from enjoying his wealth and greatness. He often sat dreamily at table, tasting nothing, and deaf to all that was being said around him, deaf even to the minstrels when they sang songs in his praise. He frequently wandered alone up in the mountains, seeking adventures, slaying robbers and destroying the wild beasts that preyed upon the farmer's flocks and herds. But this did not satisfy him. He sighed for something more. One day, when he was standing, as he often did, on the seashore, watching the waves that rose and fell, tinted by the light of the setting sun, a mist came up out of the water. A few minutes more, and it parted slowly like a veil, showing a wondrous sight. It was that of a castle with towers and barbican, and on the battlement stood a woman, such as he had never seen before in all his travels. He could not take his eyes off her. The effect of her beauty on him was like enchantment. 
Then the mist gradually closed again, and Lady and Castle vanished as completely as if they had never been. While Ortnit was still staring at the place where he had seen the lady, he heard a step behind him. Ah, it is she, he thought, and turning quickly clasped and kissed, bearded Elias, prince of the wild Rusen, who was his uncle. The newcomer returned the embrace heartily, and then said, You are a good lad to receive your mother's brother with as much transport as a lover his sweetheart, but you have been gazing at a bit of sorcery down there, and that accounts for a great deal. Try to forget what you have seen, or your royal head may soon be displayed from the towers of Montabior, where the lovely witch lives with that old heathen, her father. She's a real person, then, cried Ortnid quickly. She must be mine. I would stake my life to win her. What is that you say, answered Elias? A king's head for a woman's curl? That would make a new song for the minstrels to sing in Lombardy. How am I to find her? asked the king. Tell me the story, which I suppose some wandering fiddler has sung. Why, nephew, replied the elder man, I have seen with my own eyes and have heard with my own ears what I am now going to tell you. It is no minstrel's tale I am going to amuse you with. Mahorel is the name of the maiden's father, and he is the ruler of Syria, Jerusalem, and other eastern lands. When I was returning from my pilgrimage to the Holy Sepulchre, I arrived one evening at the gates of Castle Montabur, weary and footsore, and the Saracen porter had compassion on me, took me in, and showed me no little kindness. Then it was that I saw the wicked heathen king, whose skin is as black as that of a moor, and also the beautiful princess Sidrat. I heard it said that he intended to marry his own daughter when her sick mother was dead, and that was why he cut off the heads of all the wooers who came to ask for the prince's hand in marriage. Seventy-two skulls already green from the towers of Castle Montabur. Say, bold youth, do you intend to offer your hand to the Moorish king as the seventy-third? I have been through many a strange adventure before now, returned Ortnit, and I shall try to get the better of the infidel. On the following day, the notables of the realm were summoned to a council. The king told them that he intended to make a campaign in Syria and desired their help in calling together his army. After many attempts to dissuade Ortnit from such a fantastic enterprise, all was at last settled as he wished, even to the appointment of the governors and deputy governors in whose hands the country was to be left during his absence. The only person besides the king who carried his point was Elias who insisted on his right to go to Syria or anywhere else he chose and expressed his firm determination not to lose sight of his nephew. As the counts were separating, Zacharias appeared. He was lord of Apulia and Sicily, a heathen, but a faithful comrade of the king. When he heard what they had settled, he at once announced his readiness to provide a ship to take the armament across the sea, for which offer the king thanked him warmly. On the advice of Elias, it was agreed to put off the expedition until spring, when the weather would be more favorable for a sea voyage. So the king had to smoother his impatience as best he might. He was very lonely, for he knew that no one quite sympathized with him. His mother indeed did her best to persuade him to give up the enterprise by setting its dangers plainly before him, and telling him how ridiculous it was to be so much in love with a woman whom he had only seen in a vision, and about whose character and disposition he knew nothing. He fretted against the idleness and uniformity of the life he was leading, and determined to ride up into the mountains for something to do. When he went to take leave of his mother, she begged him not to go for fear of some accident happening to him, but finding that he was not to be dissuaded, she took a ring from her finger, saying, If you are determined to go, take this ring. The gold is thin, and a stone of little apparent value, but it possesses a magic power that could not be bought with a kingdom. Go where you like, in the wild mountains, but first of all ride down the road to the left that leads over the heights to the lake, then sideways, under a wall of rock, to the valley. Look about till you find a spring gushing out of a rock, and close to it a great lime tree. There you will have a more wonderful experience than any you could imagine. Her voice trembled with nervous excitement, and her tearful eyes seemed to entreat him to ask her no questions. 
Dwarf Albridge. Ortnick rode away. He forbade any of his serving men to accompany him, saying that he wished to be alone. The cool fresh air blowing about his temples cheered him and chased away the fumes that troubled him. The sun began to sink as he entered the wood where he had to dismount and lead his horse because of the low-growing branches of the trees. The night was so dark that he lost his way and did not succeed in getting out of the wood again till daybreak. When he gained the open, he rested a short time to let his horse graze in the meadow and to eat his own breakfast. After that, he set out again for the mountains and at length reached the wall of rock his mother had mentioned. He rode along the foot of it as she had told him, till he heard the gurgling of the spring, and on turning a corner saw the lime before him. It was an immense tree, and early as it was in the year, it was already covered with leaves and blossom. Horton it found on looking around that it was in a wide meadow, on which grass, clover, and many colored flowers grew in rich abundance, while the number of birds that nested in the lime tree was quite unheard of. A curious feeling came over the king. It seemed as if he must have heard his bird's song of welcome in his childhood, and all at once he remembered a ditty his mother used to sing. He began to hum it softly. It was a song about all the little birds and the music each made after its kind. Sweet as a summer day, and all in honor of Albrich, king of the wood. Albrich, king of the wood. Ortnit was sure that he had once heard more about him than that, but what it was he could not tell. Had he not played with a child of that name once? As he was puzzling over these confused memories of the past, he happened to glance at his mother's ring. The stone in it was shining like a fire and lighting up the face of a lovely child who lay asleep in the grass close by. Poor boy, said the royal hero compassionately. I wonder who brought you to this lonely place, how anxious your mother must be about you. I cannot leave you here to die of hunger or fall a defenseless prey to the wild beasts. He had already fastened his horse to a branch, and stooping down he lifted the boy in his arms to carry him away. But to his intense surprise he received such a blow on the chest that he not only let the child fall, but himself tumbled on his back. He had scarcely recovered his footing when he found the child holding him so tight that he had to exert all his strength not to be overthrown. It was a strange sight to see the tall king and the wonderful child wrestling furiously together. Flowers and grass were trodden on the foot, shrubs and low bushes broken and torn, when Ortnit at last flung his opponent on the ground and drew his sword to slay him. But angry as he was, he could not do it when the little thing gazed at him so entreatingly and begged in such a sweet, soft voice that he would not murder him when he was defenseless, but would accept in exchange for the life he granted him a valuable suit of armor consisting of helmet, shield, and coat of mail of wrought gold and silver, and last, not least, the sword called Rosend, whose blade had been rendered strong and durable in dragon's blood. When Ortnit demanded a hostage for his opponent's good faith, the little creature told him that hostages were impossible to find in that wild mountain country. But Ortnit might trust his word, for he also was a king, and ruled over a far wider domain than Lombardy, though truly his realm lay beneath the earth instead of upon it, and his subjects were employed day and night in working in metals. Finding that no hostage was necessary, or indeed procurable, the hero allowed his prisoner to get up. But before the latter went to get the armor he had promised, he said that he would like to have the ring Ortnit was wearing, and that he scrupled the less to ask for it, as it did not appear to be of great value. I cannot give it to you, replied Ortnit, for it was a present from my dear mother, who would never forgive me if I parted with it. And you call yourself a hero, sneered the little creature. You who fear your mother's blows. Tell me, what do you do when you are wounded in battle? Do you cry like a baby when you see the blood flow? If you were to hew me in pieces, replied the Lombard, painful as that would be, it would hurt me less than a tear or a sigh from my mother. Well, good squire of Danes, continued the other, it can at any rate do the ring no harm for me to look at it and touch it. I am in your power, am I not? 
your sword is in your hand, and I am without a weapon. After a little hesitation, the king consented to let the boy draw the ring from his finger. But scarcely was this done when he vanished from before his eyes, suddenly and without warning. Ortonit felt bewildered. He heard the boy's voice, now at a distance and now near, making sarcastic remarks on the beating his mother would give him when he went home, and finally announcing that he would pelt him with a few pebbles to show him how well he could do it. Ortonit defended himself for some time against the terrible storm of sharp stones that rained upon him. But at last, seeing that neither his great strength nor his sword were of any avail, he turned to his horse and prepared to ride away. On perceiving this, the hobgloblin exclaimed, Wait a bit, friend good man. I am sorry to think the stripes your mother will give you. Listen to me. I have many important things to talk to you about. If you will give me your royal word of honor that you will not revenge yourself for the trick I played you, I will give you back your ring. Very well, answered Ortnit. I promise on my honor. And if I go on to talk ill of your mother? No, cried the king, I will never forgive that. You may say what you like about me, but my mother is the purest and most perfect of women. I quite agree with you, said the little creature. You may listen to me without feeling that I shall slander her, for I am Alberich, king of the dwarves, and you and I are more nearly related than you think. I will tell you the truth. But first, take back your ring. I trust your word of honor. The moment Ortnit felt the ring in his hand, he slipped it back on his finger and immediately saw the boy standing before him. You must know, great king, pursued Albrich, that you have to thank me for your land and people, castles, towns and victories, and also for your marvelous strength. Your predecessor, whom you call father, married when he was an elderly man, the youthful sister of the prince of the wild Rusen. The marriage was childless. Husband and wife in vain prayed heaven for an heir. Your mother was the best and most virtuous woman in Lombardy, but she wore herself away with fretting about what would become of the country and herself when her husband died without an heir. She foresaw that the nation would be split into factions, that civil war would desolate the land, and that she herself might be chased from Lombardy, a homeless exile. I often heard her plaints when I entered her room and seen. The older the king grew, the more her anxiety increased. Then, well, you must know it sooner or later, I became her second husband. Monster, you lie, shouted Ortnit, drawing a dagger from his side, but he could not use it, for the smiling boy looked up at him so fearlessly. Your anger is bootless. You had better let me finish my story. Young as I look, I am five hundred years old. Small as I am and big and strong as you are, I am yet your father. I proposed to the king that he should secretly get a divorce from his wife and let her marry me. He consented, but she would not. She refused. She spent days and months in weeping and only gave away at last when her husband insisted. She and I were married secretly by a priest. No one guessed what had happened. And when you were born, you were supposed to be the old king's son. I did not win my wife's heart, however, until her first husband was dead. After that, I used sometimes to bring her here. You and I played together among the flowers like two children, and I sang with the birds that wild song of theirs about the king of the wood, which your mother often sung to you again at Castle Garden. When you grew to be a man and a hero, I was often at your side and seen. While the battle raged all round you, and on those occasions I have often turned aside the point of some murderous weapon that threatened your life. When you cross the wild ocean and strive to win the Moorish maiden for your wife, I will be there to help you, so long as you wear that ring on your finger. You have only to wish for me, and you will see me. Now, wait a few minutes. I'm going to fetch the armor that no weapon can pierce, and the sword Rosen, which can cut through steel and iron and even dragon scales. Ortonit felt as though in a dream. While he was still thinking over all that he had just heard, the sound of heavy steps and the clanking of armor startled him out of his reverie. Turning round, he saw Alberich, who, with the help of a sturdy dwarf, was bringing his promised gift. On the top of the silver helmet with gold and wrought was a priceless diamond. The whole suit of mail was of marvelously beautiful workmanship and sparkled with gems wherever gems should be. The sword was in a golden sheath, its handle was a shining carbuncle, and on the sharp steel blade 
were golden figures and the letters forming the king's name. Hortnit was amazed at the beauty of all he saw. He put on the armor and it fitted him exactly. Then he picked his tiny father up in his strong arms and kissed him on his rosy mouth, and Alberich returned his embrace with much affection. As the king rode away, the last words he heard were, Do not forget the importance of that ring. Never give it away. If you turn it on your finger, I will at once be with you. When Ortonit got home, he was received with joy by all his retainers, and his mother, who was watching for his arrival, signed to him to come to her. He instantly ran up the steps and whispered as he kissed her, I have come from Father Alberich. You know, she asked, hiding her face on his shoulder. I know, he answered, that I love and honor my dear mother. May came at last. The army assembled and marched south through Tuscany, Rome and Naples, whence they embarked for Sicily, Messina being the place fixed on for the general meeting of all the forces. Arrived there, they found faithful Zacharis ready with his ship, in which he had stowed away not only enough provisions for the voyage, but also merchandise in case it should be wanted. Soon every man was on board. A favorable wind swelled the sails, and experienced seamen steered the ship through the wild sea. City of Southers After they had journeyed a long time, the welcome cry of land was heard from the masthead, and soon afterwards those on deck had a distinct view of the shore and the wharfs of Tyre. But at this moment the skipper came up to the king and said, Sire, we are all lost, there is no wind to carry us past this place. They have sighted us already in the town and will soon send out their pirate ships to chase us. Come, nephew, said Elias, throw the cowardly dog overboard to drink brotherhood with the fishes. Have we not swords enough to defend ourselves from the moors? Sir, replied the skipper, the heathen would throw Greek fire on board. Neither sword nor shield can do against that. The ship will be burned, and all the men either burned therewith or drowned. No one knew what to advise, so all stood silent about the king. Suddenly a voice was heard from the masthead. All arms below, bring up the merchandise, and let the sails be reefed, lest the enemy guess that we thought of flight. Hey day, it's Alberich, said Ortnit. How could I have forgotten him? He looked up and saw the king of the dwarves leaping rapidly down the mast to the deck. In another moment he was at his side. He forgot both the ring and me, said Alberich, but a father does not so soon forget his son. Now hasten and see that my commands are carried out. Much ashamed of himself, Ortnit gave the necessary orders. All weapons of offense were stowed away below, and the costly ware Zacharis had provided were spread temptingly on deck. Meanwhile the dwarf climbed the mast again, and as soon as he was aloft, shouted to the moors, See here, we are peaceful merchants bringing wares from Italy. Give us free convoy into the harbor of Tyre. Elias stared up open-mouthed at the top of the mast. The flag was flying there as usual, and no one was to be seen. What voice was that he had heard? Is the devil on board? he asked, crossing himself. Or is it a good spirit? Whom did you speak to, nephew? Who called from the top mast, even now? A good spirit, replied Ortnit. A little dwarf who will help us out of our own difficulty. You shall see him with your own eyes. With these words he slipped his magic ring on his uncle's finger, and the latter was much astonished to see the small childish figure descending the mast, still more when Ortnit gave him a hasty sketch of all that had taken place. The Tyrian galleys had by this time come up with the ship. Their commander, who introduced himself as constable of the city, inquired whether the object of the strangers in coming to those seas was really to trade with them. Satisfied that they were what they appeared to be because of the number and splendor of their wares, he at last gave them leave to enter the harbor, and even to land if they desired to do so. In the course of that afternoon, the townsfolk bought many rich Italian stuffs at a very low price. In the evening, the two princes held counsel together as to what was now to be done. Elias advised that a sudden onslaught should be made on the castle, and that everybody there, young or old, should be put to the sword. Before Ortonit could answer, Alberich broke into the conversation by saying that such a conduct would not be fair, that no one who desired fame and glory would take his enemy unawares, but for fear any heralds sent to the infidels should be murdered by them, 
he undertook to bear the message of defiance himself. Alberich hastened to Montalbioe by unfrequented roads. Arrived there, he saw King Macharel standing on the ramparts, enjoying the cool of the evening air. Listen to me, Moorish king, cried the dwarf from the castle moat, and mark what I tell you. My master, King Ortnit, desires that you will give him your daughter to be his wife, and queen of Lombardy. If you refuse your consent, he bids me declare war on you at once, and warn you that he will attack Tyre before daybreak tomorrow. After conquering it, he will come on to Montabura, punish you for your evil deeds, and marry your daughter. So, goblin, cried Maharel angrily, you want to arrange a marriage, do you? You will find both your own head and your master's adorning the battlements of my castle before long, if you persist in your foolish scheme. But where are you? I cannot see you. Down below you, in the moat, was the answer. The king flung a heavy stone down upon the place where he supposed Albrecht to be, but missed his mark. He called out his guards and made them search the whole neighborhood, but they returned at nightfall, baffled and disappointed. That evening, Ortnit made an onslaught on the city, and found it totally unprepared for any attack. However, the Tyrians soon got under arms and made a gallant defense. All in vain, Ortnit was victorious after a hard struggle in which many of his faithful followers were slain. When he returned from pursuing the Tyrians, Ortnit went to the place where his uncle had fought, and found him lying on the ground surrounded by his people. Was he dead or only wounded? The king bent over him anxiously and loosed his helmet to see if he were yet alive. His heart had not quite ceased to beat. As Ortnit was raising him in his arms, he happened to touch him with Alberich's ring, and in a moment Elias was on his feet, whole and sound as though he had never been wounded. It was well for Ortnit that it was so, for in another instant he and his men were attacked by the trained bands of the city who had rallied once more. At length they also were beaten back with immense loss, and Tyre was really in his hands. Those of the citizens that were left saw fealty to the king of Lombardy, who then gave orders to attend to the wants of the wounded, both friends and foes. He allowed his followers a few days' rest before leading them against Montabur. Castle Montabur after much consideration, it was agreed between Elias and the king that Albrecht was the best person to be standard-bearer during the assault, and the dwarf at once consented. The warriors were filled with amazement when they saw a warhorse preceding them with the royal banner apparently floating by its side. The invisible standard-bearer must be an angel, they said in awestruck tones. Nothing of importance happened during the march. All went well, for Albrecht led the van. At last... Castle Montabur loomed in sight, a grim fortress perched on the top of a beetling crag. Mahorel had heard of their approach and was in readiness to receive them. He had strengthened the garrison very considerably and was confident of victory. At first it seemed as if his confidence were well founded, but at the very moment when the Saracens appeared to have success within their grasp, the tide of fortune turned. Albrecht climbed the walls unseen and by a great exertion of his marvelous strength, hurled one heavy catapult after another down from the walls into the moat below, while the men who had been working these engines of destruction were struck motionless with terror when they saw the unwieldy machines disappear as though shoved from their places by invisible hands. Ortney seized the right moment to push the advantage the dwarf had gained for him, and renewed the assault more vigorously than before. Sidrat the Beautiful Alberich now left the walls, and opening a side door made his way to a tower-like building that rose above the battlements. This was the temple where the Moors kept their idols, Mahomet and Apollo, two enormous figures carved in stone. The king and her daughter, beautiful Sidrat, knelt before the idols, praying for protection from the invaders. Suddenly Sidrat felt her hand grasped gently by an invisible hand, at first she was frightened and then comforted, for she took it as a sign that her prayers were heard. But the unseen friend was Alberich, and not a hidden god. He whispered, Your gods are dust. I am a messenger from another world, and have come to save you and to teach you to worship the true god. The girl started to her feet in terror and hastened to her mother who was kneeling at a little distance. 
Meanwhile, the dwarf flung the idols down and broke them in pieces, and the women were more alarmed than ever, for they felt convinced that an evil spirit was at work within the temple. Albrecht went back to the princess and drew her to the barbican, whispering, See, that is the hero who desires to make you his wife and queen of his realm. Involuntarily she looked down and saw Orchnit fighting valorously, driving all before him and looking godlike in his grace and noble bearing. She could not turn away her eyes. He was even now advancing to attack her father. They exchanged one or two blows, the last of which split Maharel's shield. Orchnit raised his sword to strike again, but Sidrat uttered a loud cry of agony, and he refrained, for at the same moment he saw her standing on the barbican, and knew that she was the maiden he had loved ever since he had seen her image in the magic castle on the sea. "'You see the royal hero?' asked the dwarf. But receiving no answer, he went on. "'Go down to the moat tomorrow morning at daybreak. Your father will allow you to do so if you tell him you are going to call upon your gods to return to the castle. But when you reach the moat, you will find the king waiting to speak with you.' Knowing that his advice would be followed, he left the princess. The battle had ceased to rage as furiously as before, and all were weary after their exertions. Ortnit's men retired to the riverside, where they were to encamp for the night, and the moors shut themselves within the fortress. All night long Ortnit dreamt of Sidrat, and then awoke and wondered whether she would come to the thrusting place. In the early morning, before the sun was up, the king mounted his horse and rode away alone to Montabur. He concealed himself beneath the spreading boughs of a tamarind tree, and waited and waited, doubting, fearing, would she come or would she not? At length, a postern door opened, and a white figure came out. Sidrat, he cried, and clasped her in his arms. To horse, delay not a moment, whispered the dwarf. Go down that way, past the waterfall. Ortnit at once obeyed, placed the maiden upon his horse and mounted himself. It was high time. He had scarcely got beyond arrow shot when a watchman on the tower recognized him by his helmet and sounded the alarm. Mahorel and his men at arms hurried down to the fight. Several times the fortune of the day changed sides, and when at length the battle was over, the besiegers were too much weakened in number to attempt to carry the castle by storm while the besieged were also in woeful plight, and their sorrow was increased by the loss of the princess. Ortnit began his retreat next morning. He found on his arrival at Tyre that his ship was in good order and ready for sea. So he gave orders for a speedy departure, and soon the gallant little army was speeding homewards with Princess Sidrat and much spoil. The Moorish girl proved a willing pupil when the Christian priests of Lombardy taught her their religion. So she was baptized and received the name of Liebgard, Soon after that, she and Ortnit were married at Castle Garden, and the whole country rejoiced in the king's good fortune. The Toad's Eggs Ortnit and his wife were very happy together, and smiling peace rested on the land. Honors were showered upon the hero of so glorious a campaign, and even the imperial crown of Rome was placed upon his head. One day when Ortnit and his queen were seated in a banqueting hall, the orioles feasting around them, a stranger was announced who said that he had come from the east and was the bearer of rich presents to the royal pair. After a few minutes' delay, the ambassador was admitted. He was of gigantic height, wild of aspect, and said that his name was Vele. He announced that King Mahorel had sent him to make friends with Ortnit in his name and for his fair daughter's sake, that the king, in token of his reconciliation with his son-in-law, has sent him the finest jewels to be found in all Syria. Having thus spoken, Vele called his wife, Ruth. She at once appeared and was even taller and more hideous than himself. She dragged four great coffers into the hall, the contents of which she unpacked and displayed before the king and queen and all the court. The first contained dresses and steel wares of every sort and kind. The second was full of silver bracelets and ornaments of wonderful workmanship. The third was the same, except that the ornaments were of gold instead of silver. The fourth case was opened by the man himself, who lifted out of it, very carefully, two enormous eggs of strange form and color. These are the eggs of the Abrahamic magic toad, said the man. And when they are hatched, which my wife will see to, you will find in each the wondrous toad stone. 
that shines like the sun in a dark place, or else a marvelous creature that will defend your coasts against every invader if you only feed it well. I am King Maharel's chief huntsman, and understand how to bring up the beast, and feed, and teach its duties. So I pray you, appoint me and my wife a damp and quiet place amongst the mountains, where we can watch over the eggs. Next year my royal master himself will cross the seas, make friends with you in person, and see the miraculous result of our care with his own eyes. The queen's heart was filled with joy at these signs of her father's forgiveness, and throwing her arms round her husband's neck, she entreated that the proffered friendship should be accepted. The courtiers were quite of her opinion, but Zacharias, the faithful heathen, shook his head and spoke his distrust both loudly and clearly. No one listened to him. The king gave orders that the giants should be well treated and provided with food and all they needed in the mountains by the governor of the province in which the place most suitable for hatching the eggs were situated. High up in the mountains near Triant was a marshy bit of ground extending far within a cavern at the foot of a precipitous rock. Vele and his wife took up their abode there, and every day the governor sent them a supply of food. Hoots brooded over the eggs entirely. Before very long the shells cracked, and two little lindworms, dragons, crept out. They were pretty creatures, dainting in all their movements, and obedient to every command of the giant and his wife. The governor used sometimes to go and see them, and delighted in their agility and funny ways. The worst of it was that they had enormous appetites, and the more they ate, the faster they grew, and the more they wanted to eat. They were soon taller than their guardians when they raised themselves in the air and began to show themselves malicious and bad-tempered. The governor hesitated to supply their wants when he found that they needed more than two oxen a day. The wrath of the creatures at what they considered semi-starvation was so great that Vele and Roots grew frightened and took refuge in another cave. As soon as their guardians deserted them, the monsters crept into their hole and began to wander over the whole district, devouring men and cattle and whatever came in their way. The people deserted their old homes and fled to the mountain fastness. All in vain, the lindworms pursued them and continued to devour all who fell into their clutches. The governor sent out large detachments of horse and foot against them, but hardly a man returned to tell the tale of defeat and misery. And with every hearty meal the monsters grew larger and stronger. Everyone was in despair, for it seemed as if the whole kingdom would be devastated. Ortnitz's Fight with the Lindworm One day the Emperor Ortnitz went to his wife and asked her to help him to put on his armor for he had to go out and fight a hard battle. She could hardly pronounce the words, with whom, she trembled so. Well, Libgard, you must know that the dragons which are doing so much harm to the country are the toadstones your father sent me. I am the guardian of my people, and as they helped me when I went to Syria to win you, I must now help them in my turn by going out against these monsters to slay them, or myself be slain. I know not which. The empress wept and told her fears, but her husband comforted her by reminding her that he still had the good sword Rosen that could cut through steel and iron and even dragon scales. Should I not return, he continued, an avenger will come. If anyone brings you back this ring that you once gave me, you may know that he is my avenger, and give him your hand in marriage. He then kissed her and tore himself away. She gazed after him with tearful eyes as long as he was in sight, thinking sadly how many noble warriors had preceded him in his quest, and how none of them had ever returned to home or friends. Ortnit at length reached the rock where he expected to find the lindworms. Seeing them nowhere, he dismounted, blew his horn and loosed the faithful dog that he had taken with him to help him to hunt the monsters down. Suddenly a door in the rock opened, and the giant Vele came out, shouting to him to come on and calling him opprobrious names. But the king cut his great club in two with one stroke of his sword. The giant sprung back and in a moment had unsheathed the sword sixty yards long, whirled it round his head and struck Ortnit so hard a blow upon the helmet that he fell senseless to the ground. "'Well hit, old Munkaf, cried Roots, putting her head out at the door. "'Let me go to him now and wring his neck and throw his body into the dragon's den.' 
At this moment, the setter which had disappeared in the wood began to bark furiously, and Roots rushed away to see what was the matter. Upon this, Otney started to his feet, and with a swing of his sword cut off one of the giant's legs. The monster howled with pain and defended himself resting against the rock, but his opponent immediately cut off his other leg. Hearing the noise, the giantess returned. Arming herself with an uprooted tree, she hit out at the hero with all her strength, but blinded by passion, she miscalculated the distance and brought the tree down so hard on her husband's head that she split it open. Ordinate then slew the giantess, after which he rested a while from his labors ate and drank some of the provisions he had brought with him, and let his steed graze at will on the short sweet grass of the upland meadow. Rested and refreshed, he once more set out on his quest. Riding through a wood, he came up with some charcoal burners and asked them where he should find the lindworms. They tried to persuade him to turn back, but in vain. Then they told him that the monsters had set out to travel west, that one of them, having a nest of young ones, had stayed somewhere in the road hidden in a cave, while the other had gone deeper into the mountains, perhaps even into another land. And heeding the warning he had just received, Ortnit rode away towards the west. When evening came, he rested for a short time, but as his food was nearly finished, and he wanted to reach an inhabited spot as soon as possible, he set out again, and rode all night long. Next day he reached the meadow, and there he saw little Albridge seated under a tree. The dwarf looked very sad, and when Ortnit drew rein beside him, said, My dear son, you are going to your death. Return to garden, for I have no power over the diabolical monsters you are seeking. I cannot help you. I need no help, replied the hero. Have I not the sword, Rosen? It will help me to conquer the powers of hell that are arrayed against my poor people. May you be successful, said the little creature and springing to the saddle he kissed his son. May you be successful, and to that end watch and slumber not. Remember that is the last advice I can give you. Now, give me back the ring you got from your mother. You shall have it again if you return to garden safe and sound. Scarcely had Ortnit returned the ring when he felt a kiss upon his lips, and the dwarf had disappeared. The hero rode on and faltering over hill and dale and through many a wild glen, at last he unexpectedly reached the very lime tree under which he had had his first interview with Alberich. The birds were singing as before. All looked peaceful and still. Both Ortnit and his horse were worn out, so he dismounted and letting his steed graze laid himself at full length on the soft grass, his faithful dog at his side. He thought over his project and was strongly tempted to return home to garden and sweet Liebgard, but he put the desire from him for, he reasoned within himself, the prince and people are as one person, of which the people form the body and the prince the head. So the prince, to be worthy of his high calling, must, as far as in him lies, protect his people from all injury. And I have every right to trust to my strength, my sword and my good cause for victory. It seemed as though the birds in the linden tree had read his thoughts and were singing a paean of joy and encouragement over him and them. He watched them quietly, but soon fatigue gained the upper hand. His eyelids closed and he fell asleep. The dragon finds Ortnit asleep. All at once the birds cease their song. The branches stop their soft waving to and fro, and the flowers bent their heads as though a breath of poison air were passing over them. Crawling through the thicket, trees and bushes, breaking with its weight, came the terrible lindworm, its jaws wide open showing its long, pointed teeth. The faithful dog, with a howl of mingled fear and anger, pulled at his master, hoping to wake him, but in vain, for Ortnit was as though in a charmed sleep. The dog then sprung upon the dragon, but could not touch it because of the way it slashed about with its tail. At this moment the horrible creature caught sight of Ortnit, flung itself upon it, carried him into the thicket, and then broke all his bones by dashing him again and again upon the ground. But though his bones were broken, his armor remained whole as at the first. Then, taking the dead body up in its powerful jaws, the lindworm bore it home to its nest in the noisome cave, where its young ones fell ravenously upon their favorite food and devoured as much as they could get at through the steel rings of the coat of mail. The dog which had followed the dragon home in hopes of saving his master watched all night by the cave, 
but finding himself powerless to help, set out early next morning on his way back to Garden. Sidrat the Sorrowful, Libgard. Meanwhile, Libgard and the old queen were very anxious. They hoped and feared alternately. On the fourth day, as they were sitting together, they heard something scratching at the door. Libgard opened it and saw the faithful dog, her husband's companion on his last journey. Instead of showing his usual joy at seeing her, the dog crept slowly in and lay down at the old queen's feet with a low, moaning whine. "'He is dead, murdered by the monsters,' cried the unhappy mother. These were the last words she ever spoke, for the next moment she sunk back dead in her chair. The shrieks of the young queen brought her women into the room, and soon the sad news was known to all. There was now no king in Lombardy, no one to keep order in the land. The great nobles fought and quarreled unceasingly, and the country was split into factions. At last, tired of this state of anarchy, it was agreed by the notables in council that the only thing that could save the kingdom was for Libgar to choose a husband who had sufficient wisdom and power to make a good ruler. They went to the queen, each hoping in his secret heart that he would be chosen by her. But on hearing what was required of her, she answered with solemn earnestness that she would preserve her faith to Ornit unbroken, and that none was worthy to succeed him unless he could slay the lindworms and avenge his death. The nobles looked at each other in a shame-faced manner and hastened to leave the royal presence, but avarice and ambition soon regained the upper hand, and civil war seemed imminent. Libgat, deprived of all means of support, for even the treasury had been despoiled by the nobles, was forced in company with a few women who were faithful to her to make her own livelihood by spinning. The margrave of Tuscany was much distressed when he heard of the straits to which the queen was reduced. He offered her an asylum in his country, but she said that at Garden she had been happy with Ornit, and there she also wished to sorrow for him. Touched by her faithfulness, the prince sent her food and wine that she might no longer have to work for the necessaries of life. So she lived on, the Lombards trying to force her to seek refuge from the ills of life by a second marriage, but in vain. She bore all the miseries of her lot with quiet patience, for she strengthened herself with thoughts of her husband and of the avenger for whom she hoped. This hope, which sometimes rose like a star on the cloudy night of sorrow in which she lived, was one day to be fulfilled, but not for a long time. End of section 3「Section 4 of Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matea Bracic. Section 4, Part 1, Section 2, Chapter 1. Hug Dietrich and Wolf Dietrich. Hug Dietrich and Fair Hildburg. While Ordnitz's ancestors ruled over Lombardy, the great emperor Antios lived at Constantinople and governed Greece, Bulgaria, and many other lands. When he died, he confided his son, Hug Dietrich, to the care of his faithful friend, Bertung, Duke of Meran, whom he had himself brought up and afterwards covered with honours. Bertung felt that his first duty was to choose a wife for his ward, and that only a princess of equal rank and great beauty and wisdom would be a suitable helpmeet for so mighty a prince. He had travelled far and wide, and amongst all the princesses he knew, there was one and only one that he could propose as a wife for his liege lord. But there were many difficulties in the way. Bertung confided his troubles to the prince, and told him how much he wished to bring about a marriage between him and Hildborg, daughter of King Valgund of Thessalonica, but he feared it would be impossible, for Valgund loved the maiden so dearly that he had shut her up in a high tower and permitted no one to speak to her except the old watchman, himself, her mother, and her maid. This he did, fearing lest she should marry and leave him. Hukitrich listened to the strange story with great interest and determined to get a sight of the maiden if he could. So he set to work to learn all that he might of women's works and women's ways, even going so far as to dress himself in women's garments, after which he announced his intention of going to Thessalonica to make fair Hildbrog's acquaintance. 
he arrived in due course at thessalonica disguised as a great lady with a numerous train of female servants hearing of the new arrival the king and queen invited the stranger to visit them she did so and gave their majesties to understand that she was hilgunde sister of the emperor hug dietrich and that she had been outlawed by her brother she begged the king to protect her and to provide her with a lodging in his palace and at the same time presented the queen with a costly piece of embroidery as a sign of her good will her request was granted the queen then begged her to teach her ladies to embroider as she did herself after this all went so well that berchtung and his men-at-arms were sent back to constantinople their protection being no longer needed fair hildborg heard what was going on and begged her father to allow her to see the embroideries and the artist who worked them no sooner had she done so than she wished to learn the art valgund gave his consent thinking the stranger a very suitable companion for his daughter and hildborg found great pleasure in her company it was not until weeks afterwards that she discovered who her teacher was and when she did their friendship became stronger than before until it grew into acknowledged love the fear lest their secret marriage should be discovered one day reached a climax what will become of us cried hildborg my father will never forgive us he will order us both to be slain then at least we shall die together replied hug dietrich but i hope for better things the guards and your personal attendants are on our side and i expect berchtung very soon to come and take me home to constantinople on the plea that my brother has forgiven me i shall then send an ambassador to ask for your hand in marriage and when your father knows our secret he will not refuse his consent berchtung came as hug dietrich had expected and fetched him away but the wooing had to be put off till a more convenient season as war had broken out on the frontier and the emperor was obliged to take the field meantime hildborg was in greater danger at home than her husband in the midst of battle she had a son he was born quietly in the tower without any one except the three faithful friends who guarded the princess there knowing aught about it it was not until months after this event that the queen her mother sent to say that she was coming to visit her daughter she followed almost on the heels of the messenger the porter pretended to have great difficulty in unlocking the door and by the time he succeeded the watchman had smuggled the child down to our safe hiding place beside the moat it was already evening so the queen spent the night with her daughter when she was gone next morning the faithful servant hastened to where he had hidden the child and it was not to be found after long and anxious search he returned to his mistress and told her that he had taken the boy to a nurse who had promised to bring him up carefully and well soon after this berchtung arrived at thessalonica to thank the king in his master's name for the reception he and his family had given the princess his sister and to ask for the hand of the lady hildborg with whom the emperor had fallen in love from his sister's description the king put off giving any immediate answer to this request and asked berchtung to a great hunt he intended to give in his honour on the following day it was a lovely morning when the hunters set out for the forest they rode on cheerily and had a good day's sport at length chance led the king and berchtung past the tower where sad hildborg spent her weary days in waiting for the husband who came not as they rode along they discovered the fresh track of a wolf leading towards a spring they followed the spoor which led them to a den in the thicket close by and in the den was a strange sight in the centre of the nest and surrounded by a litter of wolf cubs so young as to be still blind lay a beautiful child he was playing with the little wolves pulling their ears and chatting in baby language such as only mothers and nurses can translate but evidently his companions did not like his attentions and the mother wolf's ire was so roused against him that it wanted very little more to make her spring upon the child and put a sudden end to his play the old wolf came up at the same moment so that the danger was much increased seeing this the two hunters flung their spears with so much skill as to kill both the old wolves on the spot then the king lifted the baby in his arms as gently as if it had been his own child 
"'It is very strange,' he said, "'how much I feel drawn to this boy. "'But he must be hungry, poor little man. "'My daughter's tower is close to here. "'We shall find some fresh milk there, "'and she will be glad to see the little fellow. "'She's so fond of children, "'and seldom gets a chance of seeing them.' "'They walked on slowly, Berton carrying the child, "'while the king examined the wolf's track "'with great interest and attention. "'Look here,' he said, is it not strange? The tracks lead straight from the den to the moat. I wonder if the wolf stole the child from anywhere near this. Fair Hildburg was not a little astonished when she heard her father's tale. She took the child in her arms, and at once recognized him by a birthmark on his arm in the shape of a red cross. She struggled to conceal her feelings, and offered as calmly as she could to take care of the child and only begged her father to send a nurse as quickly as possible. When he got home, the king told the queen of his adventure, and she was very curious to see the child. She sent for a nurse, and accompanied her to the tower. Arrived there, the queen sought her daughter, and found her busied with the child. "'How I wish,' said the queen, taking it in her arms, "'that I knew who the boy's mother is. She must be in such distress.' "'Yes.' answered Hildborg, but look at his clothes, how fine they are. They show that he is of princely descent. Oh, dear, sighed the queen, what a lucky woman I should think myself if I had a grandson like that. Hildborg could keep her secret no longer. She threw herself into her mother's arms, and told her with many tears that she was secretly married to Hub Dietrich, and that the child was theirs. The queen was startled, angry, but it was done, and could not be undone. It was at least a comfort to think that the child's father was a mighty emperor. She told her daughter she would say nothing, but would think what was best to be done. Valgund felt strangely attracted by the child. He came to the tower almost every day to visit it and his daughter. On such occasions the queen would tell him how much she wished for a son-in-law, and such a grandchild as this. She reminded him that they might in their old age fall a prey to the barbarous tribes in the neighbourhood, if they had not some young, strong man to take their part, and added that in her opinion Hug Dietrich would not be amiss. In short, the queen prepared the way so well that when Berchtung made his formal offer for the princess's hand, the king, after slight hesitation, gave his consent on the sole condition that Hildburg was not averse to taking Hug Dietrich as a husband. The queen then told her lord the whole story. Wonderful! he exclaimed, too much astonished to be angry. Hug Dietrich arrived soon afterwards and was publicly married to the lady Hildburg. After the wedding festivities were over, he set out for Constantinople, accompanied by his beautiful wife, and the little boy, who was named Wolf Dietrich, in remembrance of his first adventure. With the empress went Sabine, one of the notables of Thessalonica, as her father had much confidence in his wisdom, and wished him to be his daughter's counsellor in any matters of difficulty. He made himself so useful that he soon became necessary to her, and at the same time won the confidence of honest Duke Bertung so completely that he persuaded the Emperor to make Sabine a regent during their absence on a foreign campaign. The high position he had gained through the Duke's kindness made the false-hearted man bolder and more self-confident than ever. One day he went so far as to speak unbecomingly to the Empress. The noble lady reproved him severely, and he fell at her feet, begging her pardon and entreating her not to tell the emperor of his impertinence. She promised, but commanded him never more to appear in her presence. When Hug Dietrich returned victorious, Sabine was the first to meet him. He gave him an account of his stewardship, and at last remarked, as though by chance, that there was a great deal of dissatisfaction among the people regarding Wolf Dietrich, the heir apparent, who rumour said was not the king's child, but the son of an elf, or, worse still, of an Alraun, who had been palmed off upon the royal family by a witch. Hug Dietrich laughed at the story as at a nursery tale. 
the only effect it had on him was to make him take his own son from under the charge of zabina and give him into the care of faithful bertum that he might learn all nightly exercises with the duke's sixteen sons time passed on and the empress presented her husband with two other sons named borgen and wachsmuth who were also sent to bertum to be educated the old duke loved all his pupils dearly but wolf dietrich was his special favourite for he showed himself full of every quality that makes a true knight a noble warrior the busy emperor seldom found time to go to lilienport the castle of moran and hildburg was a still less frequent visitor so that wolf dietrich had grown accustomed to look upon bertung as his father and the duchess as his mother his brothers borgen and wachsmuth had long since returned to constantinople where crafty zabina did all that he could to gain their friendship and confidence their mother was sorry to see it and fearing lest evil should come of it she told her husband all that had happened between them many years before hug dietrich's wrath blazed forth and zabina scarcely escaped alive he fled from the country and sought refuge amongst his kindred in the land of the huns hug dietrich worn out by many anxieties and battles, grew old before his time. When he felt his end approach, he arranged all his affairs with the utmost care. He bequeathed to his eldest son Constantinople and the larger part of the empire, while the two younger sons were given kingdoms farther to the south, and the empress and Bertung were to see the will carried out. But scarcely was the emperor laid in the grave, when the notables of the land met in council and demanded the recall of zabina because otherwise they feared he might carry out his threat of bringing the wild huns upon them the empress did not feel herself strong enough to withstand the clamour of the nobles so she sent for the traitor wolf dietrich and his eleven no sooner had zabina returned than he began to scheme again he spread amongst the people his silly tales about the origin of wolf dietrich he said that the empress had been secretly wedded to an elf while she lived in that solitary tower and that it was elfish spells that had prevented the wolves from tearing the child in pieces the populace believed the story the more easily from its utter incredibility and demanded that wolf dietrich should remain at moran zabina even succeeded in making the royal brothers wachsmuth and borgen believe his tale and give him the power for which he hungered sure of his own position he acted with the utmost harshness he bade the empress leave the palace and go to her son at moran he only allowed her to take with her a maid-servant a horse and her clothes everything else that she possessed whether through her father or her husband had to be left behind the two young kings did not interfere on her behalf for zabina had shown them that her treasures would be very useful to them in equipping an army supposing wolf dietrich and the duke of moran attacked them when hildburg arrived at hugelwater an outwork of lilienporter she was travel-stained and sorely spent at first duke bertung refused to admit her because she had recalled zabina contrary to his advice but at last, filled with pity for the unhappy woman, he led her into the castle, and treated her there with royal honours. The duchess received her surrounded by seventeen young men, who all called her mother. The empress did not at once recognise her son, who was the tallest and stateliest amongst them. But as soon as each knew the other, Wolf Dietrich, throwing himself into her arms, tried to comfort her by promising to restore her to her former rank and splendour. Duke Bertung at first counselled peace, because the position of the two kings seemed to him so strong and unassailable, but at length, carried away by his foster-son's enthusiasm, he not only gave his consent, but placed his sixteen sons and their sixteen thousand followers at the disposal of the prince. It was settled, while the men were being called together, that the duke and wolf dietrich should set out for constantinople and see whether they might not attain their end by peaceful means the day after their arrival they met zabina and the kings in council bertung was received with all honour while nobody seemed even to see his companion 
when Wolf Dietrich rose and demanded his rightful share of the royal heritage, Borgen answered that a changeling had no right to any share, and Sabine added that he ought to apply to the Alraun, his father, for a kingdom in the realms of hell. Wolf Dietrich laid his hand on his sword, but his foster father's words and looks of entreaty sufficed to calm him down and prevent any open expression of anger. The kings and Zabina did their utmost to persuade the duke to join their party, but in vain, and when the council broke up, the old man went away, hiding his displeasure as best he could. He and Wolf Dietrich mounted their horses and returned to Lilienparter without loss of time. After a few days' rest, they set out again for Constantinople, but this time in battle array. On reaching the borders of Moran, they found the royal forces drawn up to meet them. As the evening was closing in, they encamped in a wide valley surrounded on all sides by a forest. Next morning the troops rose refreshed, and each side made sure of victory. The battle song was now raised, and echoed amongst the mountains like rolling thunder. Next instant the armies met. Wolf Dietrich was always to be seen in front. All at once he turned to Berchtung and said, Do you see Zabine and my brothers on yonder hill? I will go and see whether they, or the Alraun's son, are the better men. With these words, he set spurs to his horse and dashed through the enemy's ranks. Old Berchtung, who had vainly tried to restrain him, now followed with his sons and the small body of his men-at-arms. As they neared the hill, they found themselves surrounded by the Greeks on every side. The carnage was terrible. Six of Berchtung's sixteen sons fell at his side, while a stone struck Wolf Dietrich on the helmet and stretched him senseless on the ground. But the old duke and his other sons picked him up and brought him safely off the field. All night long they fled, and after resting only a few hours during the day, resumed their journey. On their arrival at Lilienporter, they found that many of their men had got there before them. We will await the traitors here, said Berchtung. They may break their teeth on our stone walls, and then go away worse than they came. We have supplies enough to last four years, and can bid them defiance. Soon after this, the enemy appeared before the fortress. Sabina demanded that the prince should be delivered up to them and threatened that if this were refused, he would burn the castle and all within it. The only answer made by the besieged was a sortie, led by Wolf Dietrich in person. He was still hopeful of victory, but numbers prevailed. He had to retreat, and with difficulty regained the fortress. From that day he lost the confidence and gaiety of youth, and became grave and silent. His trust in the sure success of a righteous cause was gone. He lost his faith in divine justice and said he had fallen a victim to the resistless power that men call fate. Zigeminer The siege had already lasted three years, and yet there was no hope of an end. The food had grown scanty, and if the enemy chose to make famine their ally, the castle must finally capitulate. The duke vainly sought for some plan of deliverance. One day Wolf Dietrich came to him, and said that he intended to slip out of the fortress by night, make his way through the enemy's camp, and go to Lombardy, there to ask the help of Ortnit, the powerful emperor of the West. The old man did his best to dissuade the lad, reminding him that their provisions would last yet a year, and that the enemy, already weakened by sickness, might raise the siege before long. The young hero was not to be held back, at midnight he took leave of his foster-father and his other faithful friends. "'May God protect you, my dear lord,' said Berchtung, clasping him in his arms. "'You will have to cross the deserts of Romelia, which are uninhabited, save by wild beasts and evil spirits. There you will find Rauch Else, who lies in wait for young warriors. Beware of her, for she is a witch, cunning in enchantments.' If you are fortunate enough to reach the Emperor Ortnit, do not forget your trusty henchmen, me and my ten remaining sons. So they parted. They arranged that the besieged should make a sally through the principal gate of the fortress, 
to draw off the enemy's attention to that quarter, while Wolf Dietrich got away by a postern door at the back. He was nearly out of the enemy's camp when he was recognised. Immediately mounting his horse, he drew his sword and cut his way through their midst, and once in the dark forest beyond, he was safe in pursuit. All night long, Wolf Dietrich rode through the wood. He heard the werewolves howling in the distance, but none came near to seek his life. As morning broke, he found himself by the side of a broad moorland lake. All sorts of strange creatures rose out of it, and sought to bar the road. Two of them he killed, but he let the others escape. He wandered three days in the wilderness, finding nothing for his horse or himself to eat. He shared the bread he had in his wallet with his steed. It was but a little at best, and the faithful creature was at last too exhausted to carry him farther, so he dismounted and led it by the bridle. On the fourth evening, fatigue overpowered him so much that he was forced to rest. He lighted a fire with the brushwood scattered about. The warmth did him good, for a cold mist hung over the face of the earth. He and his horse quenched their thirst at a neighbouring rill, after which he lay down, and making a pillow of his saddle, thought over his sad fate. Sleep was beginning to steal upon his senses, when he was suddenly roused by a noise in the dry grass. Something black and horrible to look upon crept nearer and nearer. It raised itself in the air. Its height was appalling. It spoke to him, not with a human voice. The sound was more like the growling of an angry bear. "'How dare you rest here?' said the monster. "'I am Rauch Elsa, rough Alice, and this ground belongs to me. Besides which, I have another and a wider realm. Get up and go at once, or I will throw you into the quaking bog.' Wolf Dietrich would willingly have obeyed, but he was too tired. He could not move. He therefore begged the bear-like queen to give him something to eat, telling her that his cruel brothers had deprived him of his inheritance, and that he was now starving in the desert. So you are Wolf Dietrich, growled the bear-woman. Well, fate has marked you out to be my husband, so you may count upon my aid upon which she gave him a juicy root, and scarcely had he eaten one mouthful when his courage returned, and his strength seemed tenfold what it had ever been before. It even came into his mind that he could conquer the Greek forces single-handed, and set his eleven faithful servants free. In obedience to Ralph Elsa's command, he gave the rest of the root to his horse, which first smelt it carefully, and then ate eagerly. No sooner had it done so than it began to paw the ground, and neighed with eagerness to resume its journey. Speak! Will you be my true love? asked the bear woman, coming up to the youth and preparing to clutch him to her heart with her terrible claw. Keep back! he cried, drawing his sword. Demon that you are, seek a husband in hell, where alone you will find a helpmeet worthy of you. "'Have I not fed and secured you?' asked Frau Helse. "'Was that done like a demon? "'I have long waited for you to come and free me from an evil spell. "'Love me and save me.' "'It seemed to the warrior as if her voice had all at once grown soft and human in its tone. "'Yes, yes,' he said, "'if only you were not so rough and hairy.' He had hardly spoken when the black flea slowly slipped to her feet and a beautiful woman stood before him, her brow encircled by a diadem and her green silken garment confined at the waist by a jewelled belt. Her voice was sweet and thrilling as she repeated her former words. Speak, young hero. Will you love me? His only answer was to clasp her in his arms and kiss her. You must know, she said, that although Rauch Elsa was my name here in the wilderness, I am really Zygaminna, queen of old Troia. Your yes 
has set me free from the spell of the enchanter so we can now set out for my country of which you shall be king full of joy and thankfulness they started on their way followed by wolf dietrich's horse at last they heard the sound of waves breaking upon the shore to which they soon afterwards descended there they found a curious vessel awaiting them the prow was formed of a fish's head large and pointed at the helm stood a merman whose outstretched arm was the handle by which the rudder or fish's tail was worked instead of sails the vessel was rigged out with griffin's wings the advantage of which was that they enabled it to go against both wind and tide when such a course was thought desirable the merman was so marvellously fashioned out of cedar wood from mount lebanon that it could steer wherever the travellers wished without their help there were other wonders on board the ship such as a cap of darkness a ring with a stone ensuring victory to the wearer a shirt of palm silk and many other things the shirt seemed as though it would only fit a little child but when sigamina put it on her lover it grew bigger and bigger until it fitted him exactly take care of it she said and wear it whenever you are in any danger for it will protect you alike from steel and stone from fire and dragon's tooth wafted by the griffin's wings the vessel clove the western sea swift as the wind and soon brought the travellers to old troia there the people received their beloved queen with shouts of joy and cheered loud and long when she introduced the stately warrior borg dietrich as her future husband the marriage was solemnized with great festivities and a life of joy began for the new king by the side of his fair wife he forgot all his misfortunes and sorrows and alas even the eleven friends he had left in peril of their lives now and then when he was alone the memory of all that had come and gone would cross his mind like something he had dreamt and then he would reproach himself with neglecting his duty but zigamina had only to take his hand and he once more forgot that honour and duty alike bade him be up and doing once when he his wife and the whole court were out hunting a wondrous stag with golden horns broke out of a neighbouring thicket he did not seem to be afraid but after looking at the hunters turned back to the wood up good folk cried zigamina whoever kills that stag and brings me the golden antlers shall stand high in my favour and receive a ring from my own hand a number of huntsmen started in pursuit first among them wolf dietrich the stag led him by many devious paths only to disappear at last wolf dietrich returned to the tents much disappointed when he got there he found all in confusion for that terrible magician giant drusian followed by many armed dwarves had fallen on the camp during the absence of their king and his warriors and had carried off the queen no one knew where he had taken her to wolf dietrich was now as much alone in the world and as wretched as he had been that terrible day in the desert one thought filled his mind the thought of zigamina he would seek her through the world and if he could not find her he would die he exchanged his royal robes for a pilgrim's dress and hid his sword in a hollow staff which served to support him on his journey thus accoutred he wandered through many lands asking everywhere for the castle of giant drusian at length he learned from a tiny dwarf that the man he sought lived in the lofty mountains far over the sea and that many dwarfs owned him for their lord he set out again and journeyed on and on till at length the castle came in sight he sat down to rest by a spring and gazed longingly at the place where as he believed and hoped he should find his wife his fatigue was so great that he fell asleep dreamt of her and was happy in his dreams all at once he was wakened by a rough voice and a blow on the ribs what ho pilgrim said the voice have you snored long enough come home with me and have some food my wife wants to look at you wolf dietrich sprang to his feet and followed the giant who had wakened him so roughly and who now strode before him to the castle he knew that he had reached the end of his pilgrimage and entered the wide hall with thanksgiving and joy there sat zigamina 
her eyes red with weeping and as she looked at him he saw that she knew who he was he pulled himself together with a violent effort not to betray his identity there wife growled drusian there's the priest you wanted to see that he might speak to you about his religion what a might he is to be sure and as dumb as a lizard into the bargain there bag of bones he added turning to the pilgrim sit down by the fire and see if some of our good food will not warm your thin blood the pilgrim did as he was desired for anxious and excited as he felt he was starving wolves brought in food and drink and he ate till his hunger was satisfied the giant questioned him up and down and received short answers some of them it must be confessed far enough from the truth as twilight deepened drusian seized the lady by the hand and pulled her from her seat saying there you see the son of the aron who freed you from the bearskin he will not succeed in freeing you from me a second time he fears a broken skull too much the term you ask for is over now so come with me he would have dragged zygamina from the room but the pilgrim had already thrown aside his disguise and drawn his sword from the hollow staff back monster he shouted that is my wife with these words he sprang upon the giant the suddenness of the attack made the latter jump exclaiming why alraun are you wolf dietrich if that is the case we must have everything fair and in order you must arm and fight with me if you are brave enough that is to say sigamina shall be the wife of the conqueror End of section four. Section five of Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matea Bracic. Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages by Wilhelm Wegner. Section five, part one. Section two, chapter one. Hug Dietrich and Wolf Dietrich. The hero consented to fight the duel, and the dwarves brought him three suits of armour to choose from. One was of gold, the second of silver, and the third of iron, very heavy, but old and rusty. He chose the last, but kept his own sword. Drusian also put on his coat of mail, and caught up his battle-axe. After some time, Wolf Dietrich's shield was broken by a violent blow from his opponent's axe. The hero seemed lost, but avoiding the next blow and grasping his sword with both hands, he struck so hard a stroke that the sharp blade cut deep down through neck and shoulder. Scarcely had the monster fallen when the dwarves swarmed round the victor with their small daggers and spears to avenge their master. The fine needle-points pierced the rings of his armour, but the palm silk shirt protected the solitary warrior from every wound. At last he forced them back, and husband and wife were able to clasp each other's hands, and to assure one another of a love that would last till death. "'Let us away from this cursed house,' cried the hero. "'Who can tell but the dwarfish rabble are spinning new toils for us?' They hastened out into the deserted court, and then sought a stable in which they found two saddled horses. These they mounted and rode away. After a long and tiring journey, they reached old Troia, where the return of the queen and her brave husband was greeted with joy. Zygimina ruled her people with a gentle hand, but justly and firmly. No wonder, then, that they loved her. After her return, she was even sweeter and more thoughtful for others than she had ever been before. But she was pale and thin, and what was worse grew paler and thinner day by day. One evening, when she and her husband were sitting alone together, she raised her sweet face to his and said, When I am gone, you must go back to your own country and people, for then you will be looked upon as a stranger and usurper here, and the land might be wasted by civil war. The thought of her death cut him to the heart, but he strove to look cheerful for fear of distressing his wife. He redoubled his anxious care of her, but all in vain. Her doom was sealed. He had been strong enough to conquer the giant and save his wife, but
but he was powerless to save her now. She died in his arms, and he laid her in her early grave. The Knife Man Once, when he was standing sadly by her last resting place, he suddenly remembered that she had bidden him go back to his own country when she was dead, and then the thought of his mother and his faithful eleven rushed back into his mind. He also recollected that he had never carried out his plan of calling the Emperor Ordnant to their assistance. "'I shall never forget you, dear wife,' he murmured. "'But I should be unworthy of your great love for me if I did not at once set out to bring freedom to those who have been true to the death in their fidelity to me.' He turned away and hastened to make ready for his journey. He passed through many lands, rich and poor. One evening he saw a castle before him and asked a passing traveller to whom it belonged. Sir, replied the man, crossing himself, ride on quickly, if you be a Christian. For that stronghold is where the heathen king Belligan lives, with his daughter Marpilia, a maiden learned in magic arts. He slays every Christian he can catch, and sticks his head on a spike placed on the battlements for the purpose. Look, there is one place empty still. Beware lest your head be sent to fill it. The hero explained that he felt no fear of that, as his armour was good, and he must have sharp weapons who sought to fierce it. But the traveller assured him that the king so thoroughly understood the art of dagger-throwing that none could escape from him alive. Wolf Dietrich and the man parted company. The former would have ridden past the castle had not the owner come out to meet him, and invited him to spend the night with him, an invitation the hero was far too brave a man to decline. The daughter of his host, a young and beautiful girl, received him at the gate, and led him into the hall. While they supped together, Wolf Dietrich, on being questioned, told them whence he came, and whither he was going, and Baligan saw from his answers that he was a Christian. The heathen king then informed his guest, with a diabolical smile, that he had come just in time to provide a head to make up the required number on the battlements. Wolf Dietrich understood what was meant but showing no signs of fear, he raised his goblet to his lips, and emptied it to the health of his host and his daughter. Bedtime came, and Belligan, taking him aside, told him that he had found grace in the eyes of his daughter Marpilia, and that he might marry her if he liked, receiving both castle and kingdom as her dowry, on one condition, that he would worship Mahmed. Wolf Dietrich asked the time to think over the proposal, but the heathen smiled and said, you may have to-night to consider the plan. That is long enough. He then offered him a goblet of wine, into which he had secretly thrown a powder. Drink, friend, he said, and you will sleep long and soundly to-night. The hero was on the point of obeying, when Marpilia, who had re-entered, snatched the goblet out of her father's hand, and emptying it on the floor, exclaimed, Not so, father! I intend to teach the stranger better things to-night. She led her guest to his room, and said, I have saved you from a great danger. My father was about to give you a sleeping potion, that he might slip into your room in the night and cut off your head, as he has already done to many a Christian. I now offer you my hand and kingdom, if you will only pretend to follow our faith. Wolf Dietrich thought of Zygamina, and turning to Marpilia, did his best to convert her to his faith. They spent the whole night talking on these subjects. The next morning Belligan came, and invited his guest to join him at breakfast, and after that, in a little game of throwing the dagger, explaining that such was their custom. As soon as breakfast was over, they went into the court, where the king's servants stood round them in a wide circle. The hero laid aside his armour and sword as he was desired, and received a buckler and three sharp and pointed daggers. The heathen took his stand opposite, armed in like manner. The latter flung the first dagger at his opponent's foot, and he avoided it by springing to one side. "'By the beard of the prophet!' cried the heathen. "'Who taught you that? Are you Wolf Dietrich, from whom it is foretold that evil shall befall me?' Wolf Dietrich would not confess to his name, but stood ready again for the fight. The second dagger scratched his head, carrying off a bit of the scalp. The third he caught on his buckler. It was now the hero's turn to throw. His first dagger pinned the heathen's left foot to the ground. The second scratched his side, but the third, which he flung with the cry, I am Wolf Dietrich, 
struck him to the heart. He was now attacked on all sides, but succeeded in putting his opponents to flight. He then re-entered the castle, put on his armour, took his horse out of the stable, and was about to mount, when he suddenly saw that a wide lake surrounded the castle on every side, and a gale of wind was blowing the great waves so high that there seemed no chance of escape. At the edge of the water stood Marpilia, describing circles in the air and on the ground with a magic wand, and murmuring to herself all the while. Riding up to her, he caught her in his arms and swung her before him on his horse. If I am to drown, witch, you shall not escape, he said. With these words he spurred his horse into the wild waves, and saw that the water stretched out farther and farther until they seemed a sea. He looked around and saw that only one chance was left him. He flung the witch-woman off his horse. Instantly the storm ceased, the waters retired, and he was once more on dry land. But Marpilia was not drowned. She appeared before him again in all her beauty, stretching out her arms as if to embrace him, but he threatened her with his drawn sword. She then changed into a magpie, flew to the top of a high rock, and sought from thence to entangle him with new enchantments, each more terrible than the other. At last, thoroughly spent with fatigue, he exclaimed, Help me, help me, thou three in one, or I die. Scarcely had he uttered the words when the witch vanished. The sun shone once more upon the mountain vale, and before him lay the broad road that led to Lombardy. After meeting with many adventures by land and water, he travelled through a wild mountain region, and there he fell in with a giantess, an old friend of his father, who received him very kindly, and told him, amongst other things, of the sad fate of Ortnit and Liebgard. Although her tale diminished his hopes of help, he was yet determined to continue his journey. The giantess said it would take an eternity travelling as he did. Horses were so slow. With that she picked up both horse and rider, and carried them pickerback on her broad shoulders three hundred and fifty miles in one day, over mountains, valleys, and rivers, and set him down in the fair land of Lombardy. The Lindworm it was a beautiful moonlight night when Wolf Dietrich reached garden. He dismounted, and standing under the shadow of an olive tree, he looked about him. He saw two women walking on the seashore. One of them was tall and stately. When she threw back her veil, he nearly uttered a cry of astonishment. She was so like Zygeminde. Had the grave given up its dead, or had some deceitful elf taken the beloved form to lead him into danger? He stood breathless to listen and heard Queen Liebgard, for it was she, complain to her serving maid of the manifold sorrows and indignities she had been forced to endure. The cowardly vassals, she said, they have courage enough to frighten a weak woman, but no one dares to do the only thing that I desire on earth, to avenge the death of their king on the monster that killed him, and yet I have promised, although unwillingly, to give my hand to the true knight and hero that will do this thing. There is only one man, said the maid, who could do the deed, and that is a Greek, Wolf Dietrich, whose fame is spread abroad in every land. The avenger is come, great queen, said the hero, stepping out of the shade where he had stood. I will venture my life to conquer the dragon. The two women started back in alarm. It is Wolf Dietrich, cried the maid. He once saved me from a band of robbers. Thanks, noble hero, said Liebgard. May heaven protect you on your quest. But the monster will take your life as it did my husband's. Nay, go your way in peace, and leave me to my fate. But when the Greek showed her that his mind was firm, Liebgard gave him a ring which the dwarf had told her would bring good luck to the wearer, wished him all success, and then returned to Castle Garden. Without more delay, the hero turned his horse to the mountains, and made the best of his way to the Lindworm's Hall, which at length he reached. He peeped into the dark cavern, and saw five dragon's heads staring and hissing at him. These were the young worms, but the old one had gone out to seek for food. The hero was about to slay them there and then, but it suddenly occurred to him that it would be better if the old worm knew nothing of his coming and it would be an easy task to kill the little ones when the mother was dead. So remounting his horse, he set out in search of the monster. 
as he rode on slowly saw a beautiful child standing on a rock it called to him you are come to revenge my son ought beware that you sleep not for if you sleep my son will remain unrevenged and you will fall a prey to the dragon my good friend laughed the hero you are too young to be a father i advise you to look out for yourself you would be a sweeter morsel for the monster than i and setting spurs to his horse he rode away laughing like ordnant he came first to the high cliffs and then to the meadow where clover grass and flowers grew in wonderful profusion a linden tree shaded part of it from the heat of the midday sun the hero was tired after his long journey and wakeful night he stretched himself in the shade to rest while his horse grazed in the meadow fatigue the fresh sweet air and the song of the birds in the branches overhead all combined to make him drowsy so he gradually fell asleep perfect peace reigned in the quiet spot it seemed as though it might last for ever but suddenly it was broken by a horrible hissing a crashing of rocks and breaking of trees the dreadful monster the terror of the land was drawing near at the same moment alberich exclaimed wake noble hero sleep no more the lindworm is upon you the dwarf repeated his warning several times in vain the faithful horse galloped up to his master and kicked him but he did not awake it was not until the dragon gave utterance to a loud and hideous roar that made the rocks crack and the mountains tremble that the hero was at last aroused from his trance he sprang to his feet and attacked the monster but his weapons were all too weak for the work they had to do they broke like reeds on the creature's hide without doing it any injury so he flung the handle of his broken sword in the monster's face and commended his soul to god for he was defenceless the worm caught him up in the coils of its long tail and at the same moment seized the horse in its great jaws then it bore its victims away to its den and threw them down as food for its young after which it went away again in search of more food the little dragons tried to devour borf dietrich but could not he was so well protected by his shirt of palm silk so they thrust him aside unconscious and turned their attention to the horse which they soon disposed of in the middle of the night borf dietrich came to himself and began to look about him carefully the moonlight penetrated the cavern and showed him at a little distance something that shone bright red he moved towards it cautiously for fear of waking the dragons and found that the object which had attracted his eye was a huge carbuncle in a sword hilt he at once knew that this must be the sword rosen and took possession of it as well as the rest of ordnance armour that he found lying uninjured amongst other coats of mail which however were all more or less broken with the armour he found a ring this he put upon his finger his preparations were no sooner completed than daybreak came and with it the old lindworm he at once attacked her and thanks to the magic sword slew her and all her brood after a hard struggle thoroughly exhausted he threw himself under a tree where he lay panting and breathless there alberich found him and revived him with food and wine before the victorious hero set out on his return to garden he went back into the dragon's den to get the heads of the monsters but when he had cut them off he found that they were much too heavy to carry so he contented himself with taking their tongues these he put in a leather bag that one of alberich's dwarfs brought him for the purpose and then began his journey which was made longer and more wearisome by having to be done on foot he often lost his way among the wild mountains and did not reach his destination for many days when he got to garden he found the castle full of feasting and mirth wondering much he went to a pious hermit who lived near and asked him the meaning of what was going on from him he learned that the burggrave gerhard had slain the lindworm and was to be married to beautiful liebgard that very evening wolf dietrich then begged the holy man to lend him priestly garments and having received those that had formerly belonged to brother martin the hermit's predecessor he put them on over the armour he had found in the dragon's cave and repaired to the castle he entered the great hall and saw borg grave gerhardt nicknamed hawk's nose seated next to the pale queen who with her maidens filled the glasses of the guests above the borg chair were the dragon's heads symbols of his victory 
when the queen saw the pretended hermit, she took him a cup of wine, which he emptied at a draught, and then gave back, having slipped into it the ring she had given him on the evening he started on his quest. Liebgard did not notice the ring till she had returned to her seat by Gerhard's side. Then she trembled violently, but forcing down her emotion, she desired the hermit to approach, and tell her from whom he got the ring. Lady, you gave it to me yourself, he said, throwing aside his disguise. Every eye was fixed on him as he stood in the middle of the hall, clad in Ortnitz's wondrous armour, and looking more like a god than a mortal man. When, advancing to the queen, he laid her husband's ring in her hand, and told her how and where he had found it, many voices cried, Hail to the avenger of our king, the slayer of the dragon and its brood! Hail to the new king of Lombardy! Borgrave Gerhard was not to be put aside so easily. He pointed to the dragon's heads as proofs of his right, but when Wolf Dietrich produced the tongues from his wallet, there was no more to be said but for Borgrave Gerhard to beg the hero's pardon. This he received on condition of swearing fealty. Wolf Dietrich was now proclaimed king of Lombardy, and was told that he was expected to marry the queen. My lords, he said, as ruler of this kingdom, I am also the servant of my people, and am bound to labour for their welfare. But as regards personal matters, such as the choice of a wife, I must be free, and the queen must also be free to choose as she lists. She is yet mourning the loss of her first husband, but if she holds me worthy to succeed him, and thinks that my love and reverence will comfort her for his loss, I offer her my hand for life. Liebgard, remembering what Ordnit had said to her, placed her hand in the hero's, and was married to him before long. Wolf Dietrich was no longer the impetuous boy who had left Lillian Porter, but a man who can act with wisdom, prudence, and forethought. He felt that his first duty was to restore peace and quiet to Lombardy, and that only after that was done would he be at liberty to consult his own wishes and start to the assistance of his faithful servants. A year was spent in this labour, and then he told his wife that he must go to Lillian Potter. She wept, and said that she feared lest, like Ordnit, he should never return, but in the same breath confessed that he was right, and helped him to make ready for his journey and that of his army, which was to number sixty thousand men. The Eleven Winds and waves were in their favour, and the army landed at a short distance from Constantinople. Whilst the men encamped in the wood, the king set out in peasants' clothes to pick up all the news he could learn. After spending hours wandering about the city, and hearing nothing that was of any use to him, he chanced to meet Ortwin, a gawler, and a former acquaintance of his. The man carried a basket filled with black bread. The hero went to him and asked him to give him a loaf for Wolf Dietrich's sake. The man looked at him keenly and recognised him. Ah, sire, he said. Things have gone badly here with us. The good old empress died during the siege of Lilienpater. When the fortress capitulated, the noble Duke Bastung and his sons were put in irons and flung into a dark and dismal dungeon. Death soon put an end to the old man's pain, but the ten young lords are still kept in strict confinement, and I may bring them no better food than a daily supply of this black bread and water. Wolf Dietrich was miserable when he thought that he was not without guilt with respect to his mother and his old friend. He could do nothing for them now, but he might still do something for the ten faithful servants who yet remained. He arranged with Ortwin that they should have better food, and should be cheered by the hope of a speedy deliverance. The old Gola went on his way, and the king returned to his people. He found his men already under arms, for they told him that Zabina had discovered not only that they were there, but what had brought them. The armies met, and the battle raged long and furiously, without either side getting the better of the other. But at last the fortune of the day turned. The citizens of Constantinople rose in revolt against the tyranny that had ground them down so long, hastened to the prison, and set Bertung's ten brave sons at liberty. Having done this, they put themselves under their command, and marched to the assistance of Wolf Dietrich. It was a glorious victory. The hero was proclaimed emperor on the battlefield. Soon after their return to the capital, Zabine and the royal brothers were brought before their judges. 
The first was sentenced to death, and was at once led away to instant execution. The death of the two latter was likewise demanded by both people and army, and Wolf Dietrich knew that they were guilty of causing the death of their mother, and that of old Berchtung, and had brought upon him all the troubles and difficulties of his early youth. Yet he could not decide what was best to be done, and reserved judgment until the following day. That night, as the victor slept the sleep of the just, his mother appeared to him in a dream, saint-like and beautiful in aspect. She said, Spare my children, and my blessing shall rest on thee. And immediately Bashtung appeared at her side. God has mercy upon his erring children. Do not shed thy brother's blood. As the hero gazed at the apparitions in intense amazement, Liebka joined them, and said gently, Hast thou not gained kingdom, glory, and me, through the ill deeds of thy brothers? Return them, therefore, good for evil. Morning broke. The figures vanished, leaving Wolf Dietrich resolved what he should do. He called the nobles together, and before them all pardoned Borgen and Wachsmuth, restored them their dignities and lands, to be held thenceforth as great fiefs under him. At first no one approved of his clemency, but on hearing his explanation, all were silenced. As soon as his arrangements were completed, Wolf Dietrich returned with his army to Lombardy, and was welcomed by Liebgard with the greatest joy. After resting there for a while, he, his princes, and their followers went to Rome, where he was crowned emperor. At the feast which followed the coronation, he appointed the ten sons of, of good Duke Berchtung to be rulers of great fiefs. Herbrand, the eldest, received Garden and its territory. Through his son Hildebrand, of whose valiant deeds we shall hear later on, he was ancestor of the Wilfings. Hache was given Rhineland, with Breisach as his capital. His son Eckhart was the protector of the Harlongs, Imbrike and Fritele. He is celebrated in song and story as the trusty Eckhart. Berchter, the third son, succeeded his father at Moran. The other sons were as well endowed, but not as famous as their brothers, so their names and possessions need not be told. Wolf Dietrich and Liebkart had a son, whom they named Hug Dietrich after his grandfather. He grew up to be a mighty hero and was a father of a valiant race. End of section 5 Section 6 of Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages by Wilhelm Wagner. Section 6, Part 1. Section 2, Chapter 2 King Samson In the good old times a mighty Jarl, Earl, ruled over the rich town and district of Salem, which was one of the largest fiefs of a great kingdom. The Jarl governed so strictly and justly that peace and plenty cheered the hearts of all that dwelt in the district. He kept up a large army, to defend his coasts from the onslaught of the Vikings, who often descended on them in great numbers in hopes of plunder. Amongst the followers of the Jarl was the warrior Samson, nicknamed the Black, because of his coal-black hair and beard. He was always the first in battle, and he had been known to disperse whole battalions with his single arm. He was terrible to look upon, his dark eyes flashed under heavy, beetling brows. His bull neck and powerful limbs bore witness to his remarkable strength. No one could withstand him in battle. He hewed men down, whether armed or unarmed, with as great ease as if they were made of touchwood. In private life, on the other hand, he was gentle and kindly, unless contradicted, then he would keep silence, but would nonetheless carry out his own will, regardless of the cost to others. As can be readily imagined, few people ventured to oppose him without reason. 
One day the Jarl, who had just been made king, was sitting at a feast in celebration of a great victory. His warriors were round him, sharing in his joy, Samson in their midst. Suddenly he rose, and taking a cup of wine in his hand, offered it to the king and said with all courtesy, Sire, many a victory have I helped gain for you, and now I come to offer you this cup and ask you to grant me a boon. Speak on, brave hero, answered the king, and tell me what you desire. Hitherto you have asked no reward for your great deeds of valor. What you already have was given of my good will, unasked by you. So demand what you like. I can deny you nothing. Good, my lord, said Samson. I do not want any more castles or lands. I am rich enough. But I am very solitary at home now that my mother has grown old and cross. Your daughter, Hilda Swid, is a sweet little thing, and I should much like to make her my wife. Now you know how you can pleasure me by granting this request. Rogier was so astonished at this address that he nearly let the cup fall. You are a famous warrior, he said, but the maiden is of royal birth, and only a king can lead her home. You are in her service as well as mine, so take this plate of sweetmeats and bear it to her in the women's house. Then come back here and drown all memory of your strange request in a bowl of good wine. Samson took up the sweetmeats silently and bore them to the princess, who was busy embroidering with her maids. He placed the dish before her, saying, Eat, sweet one, for I bring you good news. You are to follow me to my home and live there as my good wife. Dress now and bid one of your maidens come with you. On seeing the girl's hesitation, he added, If you do not go willingly, you will force me to kill the Jarl and burn the place with all that are in it. He looked so fierce and grim as he spoke that Hillswood trembled with fear and obeyed him without a word. He took her by the hand and led her down to the court, where a groom was holding his horse in readiness. In the clear light of day and in the presence of many watchmen, none of whom dared remonstrate, Samson placed the princess before him on the saddle and rode away with her into the wood and towards his home. When he reached his dwelling, the door was locked, and he knocked so thunderously that the sound was heard to a great distance. No answer. He knocked again and again. A hoarse voice was at last heard from within, proclaiming that the door should not be opened whilst the owner of the house was from home. Mother, cried Samson, pull back the bolts, for it is I, your son. I have brought you a princess to be your daughter and to tend you in your old age. The door opened, creaking and groaning as though unaccustomed to move on its hinges, and a thin old woman came out on the threshold dressed in rags. What? she cried. Do you bring guests with you? That woman in her grand clothes, her maid and an idle groom? How could you do it, son? You know how poor we are and she looked up at her tall son with a cunning leer. But mother, said the warrior, where is the gold I sent you? Where are the servants I gave you, and what have you done with the gorgeous raiment I sent to clothe you? I hid the gold away in my chest, answered the old woman, for one never knows whether one may not become a pauper in one's old age. I dismissed the servants you gave me very soon, for I thought they would have eaten me out of house and home, and as for the clothes, I have laid them aside to wait for better times. Ah, well, mother, said Samson, if that sort of thing makes you happy, you can do as you like with your own. But now open the door and let us in. We are tired after our long ride, and would fain have a good dinner. They went into the house and sat down. The old woman placed before them a hunch of rye bread and a jar of water. Samson would have made but a poor meal, had his groom not brought out a cut of venison and some wine, with which he had taken care to provide himself 
before leaving the palace. After he had stilled his hunger, Samson begged his lady's permission to go out and see if he could not find a stag to store the larder. The groom went down to the cellar where he was fortunate enough to find a cask of ale, and the old mother withdrew to her own apartments, leaving the princess alone with her maid. The wide hall was dark and eerie and full of strange flickering shadows that grew more mysterious and ghost-like as the evening closed in, and the owls might be heard hooting in the pine trees near. Hillswood could bear it no longer. She sent her maid to ask the old woman to come back to the hall, but she did not, nor did the maid return. The poor child's terror was so great that she determined to go in search of her mother-in-law. She wandered through one empty, dreary, dusty room after another, till at last she entered a large vaulted chamber, and there she saw the old woman crouching over a great chest full of gold and precious stones, muttering to herself. Approaching her, Hildeswid heard her gloating over her treasures, and saying how much they would be increased when she added the princess's ornaments to the number, which could so easily be done by strangling the girl. Hildeswid uttered a low cry of terror, and the old woman looked round. Then, with a shriek of thief, robber, wretch, she threw herself upon the unhappy child and tried to throttle her, but at that moment Samson came in and stopped her. Mother, he said, you cannot remain here. I will take you and your treasure to my other house on the edge of the wood. There you can live in peace. Meanwhile, King Roger had discovered that his daughter had been carried off. He sent out one body of his men-at-arms after another to fetch her home, but they all failed, and he prepared to go himself. Riding along toward Samson's Grange, he and his men saw a little house by the side of a great wood. They entered and asked the old woman they met in the house to tell them where Samson lived. She denied that she had ever heard of such a man, but when the king offered her a handful of gold, she at once pointed out the path that led to his grange, and even went a bit of the way to see that they made no mistake. The king and his fifteen companions had not gone very far when they met the hero. His helmet and armor were coal black, like his beard and hair. His steed was also black, but on his shield was emblazoned a lion on a golden field. There was a sharp, short fight in which Samson came off conqueror. When the battle was over, he set out for his mother's house. On entering the hall, he found her there busily counting the gold the king had given her. Mother, he said, for the sake of that gold, you betrayed your own son, and you richly deserve to die. But as you are my mother, I cannot punish your treachery. The old woman went on counting her hoard as calmly as before. Mother, he began again. You betrayed your son for gold, and you should die by my dagger. But you are my mother, and I cannot slay you. Now listen to me. Take your gold and leave this place, lest harm befall you. The old woman poured her treasures into a huge sack and answered, This should all have been yours. If you had not brought that little fool into the house, I will go and take my wealth to the king. I have slain him and his men, said Samson quietly, but he looked so stern that his mother changed color and muttered, Very well, then I will go and seek an heir who will give both me and my treasures house room. Three times Samson's hand sought sword and dagger, but he mastered his anger and rode away through the dark pine forest to his home. When he got there, he found Hilda Swid hard at work with her maidens. Wife, he said, going up to her, my mother betrayed me for the love of gold. My sword and dagger both thirsted for her blood, but I would not, could not slay her. If you are false to me, then they must do their work. He looked terrible in his wrath, 
but she took off his helmet and coat of mail, kissed him, and led him to his seat. And he at once grew gentle, and told her that he wanted to win glory and honor for her sake, and that he hoped soon to see her acknowledged queen of her father's realm. When the death of Roger was made known in Salem by the only one of his men who had escaped to tell the tale, a thing was summoned in order that a new ruler might be chosen. The votes were all in favor of Brunstein, brother of the late king man, a man of great wisdom in consul, and a lover of justice. There would now have been peace in the realm had it not been for Samson, who made raids into the land and carried off cattle and supplies. So Brunstein called together all the bravest warriors of his own and other lands, and made them lay their hands in his and swear to take Samson alive or dead, or themselves die in the attempt. Then, led by the king, they set out and rode over mountains and plains through the dark forest, and all without finding the object of their search. One evening they reached a strong fortress, and being very tired, rested there for the night. After supper they went to bed and slept. Everyone slept, even the guards, when they had carefully locked and bolted the great gates. That night Samson came. Finding he could not break the gates, he set fire to them, and while they were still burning, pulled them down and leaped into the place. The watchmen awoke and blew their horns, but as there were many thatched roofs within the walls, all of which caught fire, the king and his men naturally thought a large army had broken in upon them, and they were filled with terror. The gigantic figure of Black Samson appearing now here, now there among the flames, added to their fear, and all that were left of them took refuge in flight. The king, followed by six faithful attendants, made his way into the forest, and after riding a long time came in sight of a goodly grange. He entered and found that the mistress of the house was his niece Hildeswood. He asked after Samson, but she said he was out. He then begged her to leave her husband and go with him, but she refused, advising him to go away as quickly as he could, lest he should fall into his enemy's hands. Brunstein confessed that she was right and took his departure, but it was even then too late. Samson had returned, and seeing them, at once set out in pursuit. No courage or strength, however great, could avail against his terrible arm. Brunstein and five of his warriors fell, never to rise again, while the sixth got away with great difficulty, and not without severe wounds. Samson started in pursuit. When he got out of the wood, he saw thirty horsemen galloping toward him. On their banner a lion was displayed on a golden field. So ho, cried the hero. You are Amalungs. Welcome, Uncle Dietmar. I rejoice to see you and your men. When they had rested and refreshed themselves in Samson's grange, Dietmar explained that having heard that his nephew was outlawed and in need of help, he had come to visit him and see whether he could be of any use. Samson was much pleased and announced his intention of taking the open field now that he was no longer alone in the world. So he and his companions set out the next morning. No one ventured to oppose him, and soon he had so large a district under his command that he was able to take up the powers and dignity of Duke. After that he made his way toward Salem, and sent on messengers to desire the citizens to elect him king, under pain of having their town and possessions burnt about their ears. After much conferring together, the burghers came to the conclusion that they could not do better than obey, for while Samson had been their friend, their town had been more flourishing than at any other time. So they sent to beg him to come and rule over them, when the hero found that all was going as he wished, he sent for his wife, and, side by side, they rode into Salem, 
where they were received with acclamation. The new ruler governed with a strong hand and administered justice equally to all, both high and low. He showed a grateful remembrance of every kindness he had met with in his adversity and kept peace on his borders. He grew old in the punctual fulfillment of these duties, and when he felt he was no longer strong enough to do the work alone, he appointed his eldest son to be his assistant and successor. But he did not like it to be supposed that he was too old and weak to be of use. So when his second son asked him what share he was to have in the royal heritage, he answered him nothing, but called together the whole army and made them an address. He told them that when he was very young, everyone had sought to do great deeds, but now people had grown lazy. The long peace that had brought material blessing on the realm had also brought the curse of a love of ease and pleasure, and for fear this evil should increase and the country become an easy prey to some greedy neighbor, he summoned every warrior to appear before him in three months' time, each accompanied by his men and bearing a courageous heart within his breast, for he was going to lead them against a powerful foe. The same day that Samson made this announcement to his army, he wrote a letter to the proud Jarl Elsung of Bern, Verona, a man of about his own age and with an equal love of great and heroic deeds. In this letter he demanded that Elsung should pay him tribute as his liege lord and should give his daughter Odelia to his second son. All this he demanded as a right due from a vassal to his king. When the Jarl read the letter he was very angry and made immediate preparations for war. He began by ordering five of Samson's ambassadors to be hung on the spot and the sixth to be sent back to his master with his tongue cut out. No sooner were the three months over than King Samson started for Bern at the head of his men. The armies met and there was a great battle. The slaughter on either side was hideous. At length, Samson's wondrous strength enabled him to slay the Jarl and gain the victory. The Bernice, seeing that their ruler was dead, thought it most prudent to choose Samson for their king and thus put an end to all ill feeling between the two nations. When this business was settled, the victor sent for Jarl's daughter, Odelia, and told her that he intended her to be the wife of his second son, to whom he was going to make over her father's realm. The maiden wept and said that she could not marry so soon after her father's death. But Samson's rage at the meeting with contradiction was so terrible that the girl in mortal fear consented to wed the prince. His berserker wrath appeased by her obedience, the king at once regained his usual genial manner, kissed her, and assured her of his protection. The marriage arranged, Samson set out on his return to his own land, accompanied by his eldest son. Before he had gone very far, he felt his wounds painful. They would not heal and caused him so much suffering that he had to halt at a little town along the way, and there he died, naming his youngest son ruler of the Rhineland with Fritillaberg as his residence. End of section six. Recording by Tom Mack. Section seven of Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages by Wilhelm Wagner. Section 7. There once was an emperor of Rome called Dietwort. His name was known far and wide for his great deeds. At last, wishing to marry, he sent an embassy to King Ladmer of Westenmer to ask for the hand of his daughter. Ladmer professed himself highly honoured, so that so great an emperor should wish to be allied with his house, and begged that Dietwort would come to Westenmer and see the princess. That done, 
the two young people might make up their minds whether they were suited to each other. Dietwort consented, and after a stormy passage arrived at his destination, accompanied by a hundred of his bravest warriors. Ladmer received his guest with all courtesy, and told him how glad he would be to have him for a son-in-law, but that the choice of a husband lay with the princess herself, for he would never constrain his daughter to marry against her will. At the feast given in his honour, Dietward dressed himself like his men, but the princess, whose duty it was to offer wine to her father's guests, soon saw which was which, and filled his goblet first. That evening her father asked her what she thought of the stranger, and she replied, He seems to be a great prince, but I do not know his ways, and until I know that they are pleasant in my eyes I will not marry him, as I might be very unhappy far away from all that I love, in a foreign land. Her father kissed her, and told her she must do as she pleased, but in his heart of hearts he hoped she would say yes. A great hunt was arranged for the following day, the object of which was the destruction of a number of stags, for they had grown so numerous that they had done a great deal of mischief in the neighbourhood. Now it happened that Princess Minnie was a mighty huntress, and so she begged her father to let her join him on that day also, for she loved the sport, and, as he knew, her arrow could reach its goal as surely as that of any man. Dietwort did not much relish seeing her so employed. He thought it was not maidenly, and confided to his friends that he would rather seek a wife among the daughters of the great princes at home than wed such a hoyden as the Lady Minnie. But, however that might be, it was his duty, and theirs as men, to see that the giddy girl got into no danger through a foolhardiness. As they were going down a narrow glen, Minnie wounded a splendid stag, and the dogs set out in pursuit, while the princess, drawing another arrow from her quiver, hastened after them. Suddenly, the dogs set up a simultaneous howl and rushed out of the thicket. The ladies of the court shrieked aloud, The worm! they cried. The lindworm! Come back, Lady Minnie! Come back! And at the same moment, turning quickly, they fled across the valley and took refuge on top of a neighbouring hill. A frightful hissing, cracking, and trampling was heard, and the dragon crept out of the thicket, its jaws wide open, ready to seize its prey. It was a sight to make the bravest man tremble. Princess Minnie shot three arrows, one after the other, straight at the monster, but they glanced harmless off its horny scales. She turned to fly, but her foot caught a branch, and she fell to the ground, she seemed lost, for the dragon was making ready to spring upon her. Dietwort and his men were close at hand. The latter threw themselves on the worm, while the former took his stand before the girl to defend her. It was a horrible sight. Lances, swords, arrows were no defense. They could not pierce the monster's scales, and one brave man after another was caught in its claws, or was torn by its terrible teeth, which in shape resembled the anchors of a ship. Dietwort rushed to the assistance of his friends. He struck at the lindworm's neck with his lance, but the point slipped from the scales, and the dragon tore his breast with its claws. It opened its great jaws as wide as it could to seize and devour him, but the hero thrust the shaft of his spear into his gigantic mouth, and worked it round and round with such force that the point came out at the other side. A stream of poison and flames of fire issued from the creature's nostrils, and the hero fell fainting to the ground, the dying monster on the top of him. Dietwort was roused from his insensibility by feeling himself violently shaken. When he opened his eyes, he saw the princess struggling to free him from the dragon's body. Some woodmen came up and helped her. When at last he rose to his feet, he was so weak that he could not stand, and the men made a litter of wattled boughs on which they carried him to the palace. The wound on his chest was carefully bound up, and no one thought much of it, because the flesh alone had been torn. But it festered badly, and the edges turned black, as though they had been burned. The doctors declared that some of the dragon's poisonous breath had touched it, and they feared for the hero's life. The king, the court, nay, the whole country, mourned for the man who had rid them of the monster. One morning, as Dietward lay sunk in a feverish doze, 
after the intense pain of the night, he felt a hand busied around his wound. Strange to say, the hand felt both softer and gentler than that of the doctor. He opened his eyes and recognized the princess. He watched her carefully remove the bandages and drop some liquid from a bottle into his burning wound. The pain at once left him. He would have thanked her, but she signed to him to be silent. After she had placed the bandages and motioned to the nurses to be still, she went away as gently as she'd come. The wounded man felt as free from pain as if an angel had brought him some of the water of life. He fell into a quiet slumber. At night the pain returned, but the next morning Minnie came back and poured balm into his wound. On the third morning she came again. He felt so much stronger that he could not refrain from seizing her hand and pressing it to his lips. She withdrew it gently and went away signing to him once more to hold his peace. The doctor rejoiced at the rapid recovery of his patient. When told what had happened, he said that the royal maid had received the miraculous balm from her mother on her deathbed, and that she was forbidden to use it except in cases of great necessity, and for those whom she loved. For those she loved, repeated the hero, and he felt strangely happy. When he was well again, he one day met her alone in the garden, and told her of his love. They talked together for a long time, and when good King Ladmer heard of their engagement, he gave them his blessing. The marriage feast was soon afterwards held, and there, in the middle of the table, as one of its greatest ornaments, was one of the dragon's teeth, set in silver. A nice little tooth it was, weighing at least half a hundred weight. The husband and wife set out for Rome. The winds and waves favoured them, and they soon reached Diet Ward's native land. The legend informs us that they lived very happily together for four hundred years, and had forty-four children, of whom one son, Sigeher, alone survived them. But it does not tell us whether that Lady Minnie took kindly to her household duties, or always remained fonder of field sports than of needlework. End of section 7「Section 8 of Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. « Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages » by Wilhelm Wagner Section 8. Dietrich and Hildebrand Dietmar, second son of Hugh Dietrich, ruled with a strong hand at Bern, and refused to acknowledge his elder brother Emenrich, or any other king as his suzerain. He was a mighty warrior, and so terrible in battle that few of his enemies dared look him in the face. But at home he was gentle to all, especially to his wife Odilia, daughter of Elsung, or according to another saga, daughter of a Danish king. His eldest son, Dietrich, was the joy of his heart. At twelve years old he had the strength of a mighty warrior. His fair hair fell over his shoulders in heavy curls. His figure was tall and slender, yet strong and well-knit. He had regular features, but when he was angry, he was terrible to look upon. From his earliest childhood anyone might see that he would become a lion-hearted hero. It was even said that his breath was like glowing fire when he was angry, and this the people thought an undoubted proof that he was descended from a demon ancestor. When Dietrich was five years old, a famous hero came to his father's court. This was Hildebrand, son of Herbrand, and grandson of the faithful Berchtung. As we said before, Herbrand's fief consisted of the district and castle of Garden. He had brought up his son in the traditional way, so that he grew up to be a perfect warrior and a wise man. King Dietmar was so pleased with his guest that he appointed him to be his son's teacher and governor. This was the beginning of a friendship between master and pupil that lasted till death parted them. 
the sword nagelring now it came to pass that a giant and giantess invaded dietmar's land and slew burned and plundered the people they were so strong that no one could resist them the king went against them at the head of the army but could not find them he saw everywhere on his borders the desolation they had caused but none could tell him where they were concealed at this ill success young dietrich and his master were as much distressed as the king himself they determined to search for the giants till they found them though the search should cost them years they wandered over mountains and valleys seeking the monsters but seeing nothing of them one day they set out to hunt with their hawks and hounds and came to a great forest in the middle of which was a green meadow where they thought they should find plenty of game they uncoupled the hounds and rode one to the left and the other to the right of the meadow holding their weapons in readiness as dietrich slowly advanced keeping a sharp lookout a dwarf crossed his path stooping from his horse he caught up the mannikin and placed him in front of him the little prisoner made so loud a moan that hildebrand heard him and galloped across the meadow to see what was the matter catching sight of the dwarf hallo he cried hold the rascal tight he knows all roads both on and under the earth he is elbegast the prince of thieves and is certain to be a friend of the robbers the dwarf shrieked louder than before and declared that far from being their friend he had suffered much wrong at the hands of the giant grim and his sister hilda that he had even been obliged to forge for them the good sword nagelring and the strong helmet hildegrim and had been forced to lead them to their victims by hidden ways known only to himself he swore to help the warriors if they wished to fight the unholy pair the mannikin was therefore set at liberty he drew a long breath and said you could not catch me now if i wish to escape you but i will serve you faithfully that i may be freed from the power of the giants come back to this place at daybreak to-morrow and i will give you the sword nagelring without which you cannot conquer the monster i shall steal it away from him as truly as i am elbegast the prince of thieves then i will show you his footmarks in the dewy grass that you may track him to his hollow mountain where if you slay him and his wicked sister you will find rich booty to reward you the dwarf had no sooner uttered these words than he vanished the next morning before daylight the prince and his companion came to the edge of the green meadow talking of this and that they agreed that the word of a mountain goblin was not to be trusted and that thievish elbegast would probably be false like all his kindred their conversation was interrupted by a strange clanking sound and at the same moment they noticed the rosy dawn overspreading the sky they started to their feet and looked about elbegast came up to them dragging a huge sword dietrich seized it with a cry of joy unsheathed it and swung it in the air now cried elbegast you have the strength of twelve men and can fight the monster on equal terms look carefully and you will see the marks of his shoes distinctly printed on the dewy grass i had to make his shoes of iron for he is miserly and said that leather was too dear follow the tracks they will lead you to the entrance of his cave i can go with you no farther he vanished and the heroes followed the giant's tracks in obedience to the dwarf's advice at length they reached a great cliff but there was no opening to be seen large enough to serve as a door a few cracks might be noticed here and there in the stone so small that only a dwarf or a lizard could have crept in certainly not a man in armor and still less a giant hildebrand thought that a bit of the rock might perhaps be fitted into the cliff instead of a door he tried to shake and loosen any projecting piece of the cliff that he could clutch his efforts were not in vain an enormous block of stone stirred and rocked beneath his hands and just as dietrich came to his assistance it fell thundering into the valley below the sunlight penetrated the darkness of the deep cavern in the background of which a great fire was burning 
Grim was lying on a bed of bear and wolf skins close to the flames. Wakened by the falling rock, he raised himself on his elbow, and perceiving the warrior's approach, looked about for his sword. Not finding it, he snatched up a burning log, and rushed upon Dietrich. His blows sounded like claps of thunder, and fell as thick as hail. It was only the young warrior's nimbleness that saved his life, which was endangered not only by the force of the blows, but by the smoke and the burning sparks that flew from the log. Hildebrand would have gone to his pupil's assistance had not the latter forbidden him. And indeed he soon had enough to do to defend himself, for the giantess now appeared, and catching Hildebrand up in her arms, held him tight. It was a deadly embrace. The warrior could not breathe. He struggled in vain to free himself from the sinewy arms that held him. At last the giantess threw him on his back, pressing his hands and arms as though in a vice, and making the blood spurt from under his nails. She looked about for a rope with which to bind and hang him. Hildebrand called to his companion to help him in his need. Dietrich, seeing his friend's danger, leaped over the giant's weapon with a despairing spring, and at the same time seizing his sword in both hands, split the monster's head from the crown to the collarbone. Then turning upon the giantess, he slew her after a short but sharp engagement. Hildebrand now staggered to his feet, and said that from henceforth he would regard his former pupil as his master, because that woman had been harder to deal with than any foe he had ever met before. Dietrich and Hildebrand took the treasure they found hidden away in a side cave, as their meed of victory, and brought it home to Bern. King Dietmar rejoiced in the glory of his heroic son, whose name had become famous in every land, but he did not live long after these events. He died loved and honored by all. When Dietrich ascended the throne, he gave his younger brother, Dether to Hildebrand's charge, begging his friend to teach the boy to be a hero and a worthy scion of his noble race. And Hildebrand did his best, with the help of his wife, the good high-souled Uota, whom he married soon after. Together they taught the boy to love what was good and true, to be brave, and to be not only an admirer but a doer of high deeds. Siganot Soon after Grimm and Hilda had fallen under Dietrich's sword, their nephew, strong Siganot, a giant who lived in the western mountains, came down into the forest to visit his relations. When he discovered their dead bodies in the cave, he howled with rage and swore to avenge their death. A dwarf for whom he called told him of the fight between his uncle and aunt and the heroes, but Siganot would not believe the story. He thought that Grimm and Hilda had been murdered in their sleep by Dietrich and his comrade for the sake of their hoard. Years passed on. One evening the heroes were seated together in the great hall of the palace, drinking their wine and talking. Master, said King Dietrich, I never saw a living wife embrace her husband so passionately as Hilda did you that day in the cave. I think the Lady Uota would be angry if she heard how the giantess hugged you. What a monster she was, answered Hildebrand with a shudder, and you freed me from her clutches. Yes, said the king, laughing. It showed my generosity. I returned you good for evil that time, for you know I might have remembered how many thrashings and floggings you had given me when a boy. Now confess, was I not generous? I am quite willing to do so, replied Hildebrand with a smile, and then added gravely, but do not pride yourself too much on the past, for the giant Siganot has long been watching for us in the mountains, that he may fall upon us and avenge his Uncle Grimm's death. From what I hear, he is so strong that no mortal man can withstand him, and even an army would fall before him like corn under the sickle. Hey, what new story is this? cried the king. So Grimm's avenger is laying in wait in the mountains? Why did no one tell me before? I will start to-morrow in search of him, and free my realm from the monster. What? cried one of the guests. Are you going to attack the giant? asked another. The murderous Siganot? 
added a third. "'Listen to me, Dietrich, my pupil,' said Hildebrand solemnly. "'He is not heroic, but foolhardy, who undertakes to do the impossible, and it is impossible to conquer that giant.' "'Listen, dear master,' answered Dietrich. "'Do you remember how you taught me that he is a hero who undertakes what is apparently impossible, because he trusts in his strength and in the justice of his cause? He is a hero, whether he gains the crown of victory or meets with death. My cause is just, because I go forth to free my realm and my people from the power of the monster.' "'Sire,' cried Hildebrand, "'you are no longer my pupil, but my comrade.' and as your comrade I will accompany you to the great battle. The king answered after a short pause. My master used to say, One against one is the way of true warriors, two against one is the way of cowards, so I must go alone. If you do not return in eight days, returned the master, I will follow you and be your liberator, or your avenger, or your companion in death. Why make so much ado? cried Wolfhart. THE KING WILL STRIKE OLD LONG LEGS DEAD, OR ELSE UNCLE HILDEBRAND WILL DO IT, AND IF THEY BOTH SHOULD FAIL, I WILL FOLLOW THEM, AND I WAGER MY HEAD THAT I WILL LEAD HIM LIKE A CAPTIVE BEAR BY A ROBE TO THE CASTLE HERE, AND THEN HANG HIM OVER THE BATTLEMENTS, WHERE HE MAY STAY TILL HIS GOSSIPS IN HELL COME TO FETCH HIM HOME. Dietrich THEN SET OUT ON HIS JOURNEY. ON THE EVENING OF THE THIRD DAY HE CAME IN SIGHT OF THE MOUNTAINS. He felt so cheery and so strong that he would not have feared to offer battle to all the giants in the world. As he was lying on the grass, sunk in happy reverie, he saw a stately elk, sprang on his horse, and followed it till he came up with it. When drawing his sword, he stabbed it in the neck, so that it fell dead. He lighted a fire, roasted a bit of the elk for his supper, and ate it. "'Washing it down with some cups of wine "'he drew from the skin at his saddle-bow. "'A cry of agony disturbed him "'in the midst of his enjoyment. "'He looked up and saw a naked giant "'covered from head to foot with bristly hair, "'who was holding a dwarf firmly bound "'to the end of his iron club. "'The mannequin shrieked to the warrior for help, "'affirming that the monster was about to eat him alive. Dietrich at once advanced towards the wild man and offered him a fair exchange. He said he might have the elk instead of the dwarf, and that he would find it a larger and juicier mouthful. "'Get out of the way, you dog!' bellowed the giant. "'Get out of the way, or I will roast you at your own fire, and eat you up, armor and all!' The hero's anger was stirred at this address, and he drew Nagelring from its sheath, while the giant swept the dwarf from off his club as easily as a snowflake. Then the battle began, and raged until both combatants were so weary that they had to rest a while. The king again offered to make peace with the monster, because he had come out to fight with the master and not with the servant. A shout of scornful laughter was the answer he received, and then the giant cried in a mighty voice that made the trees tremble to their roots. "'Do you think that a little midget like you could conquer Sigonot? "'He would bind you to a stake as easily as I should that dwarf, "'and would leave you to die in agony.' "'And now the fray was renewed. "'The dwarf, who had freed himself from his bonds, "'kept well behind Dietrich, and advised him what to do. "'Hit him over the ear with the hilt of your sword. "'The blade is of no use with him.' Dietrich did as he was advised, and the monster fell with a crash beneath his blow. The sword hilt had penetrated deep into his skull. A second and third blow put an end to him. "'Now quick, let us away,' cried the dwarf, "'before Sigonot, king of the mountains, comes down upon us. "'Should he find us here, we are lost.' Proud of his victory, Dietrich explained the object of his quest. "'Noble hero,' said the mannequin, you cannot escape your fate. If by miracle you are victorious, we poor dwarfs will be freed from an intolerable tyranny, in gratitude for which boon we will be your faithful friends as long as you live. Our father, Alberich, left the rule over thousands of our people in equal portions to me, his eldest son, Valdung, and to Igerich, his younger son. But in spite of our caps of darkness and all our magic arts, 
Sigonot has enslaved us, and holds us now in such vile bondage that many die of hardships, and many more are devoured by him. Well, said Dietrich, show your gratitude by pointing the way to Sigonot. The dwarf showed the hero the snow-topped mountain where his enemy lived, drew the cap of darkness over his head, and disappeared. Dietrich set out, and about midday arrived at the regions of ice and snow. Long gray moss hung pendant from the branches of the pines, and covered the stems to the root. A thick mist suddenly rose, and hit the mountain. All at once the mist parted like a curtain, and Dietrich saw a beautiful woman in snow-white garments, a diadem of precious stones on her head, and round her throat a necklace that shone like the stars. She raised her finger warningly, and said, "'Ride back, hero of Bairn, or are you lost? The destroyer is lying in ambush for you.' She glided past with inaudible steps and vanished among the glaciers, leaving Dietrich lost in astonishment, and wondering whether it were the goddess Freya or the elf-queen virginal that he had seen. He was startled out of his reverie by a shout, and at the same moment perceived the gigantic warrior hastening to meet him. "'So you have come at last,' he cried, "'to give me an opportunity of revenging the murder of Grimm and Hilda.' They began to fight without more ado. As Dietrich tried to make use of what he thought a favorable chance, the blade of his sword, Nagelring was caught in an overhanging bough. All his efforts to withdraw it were in vain. At last the steel broke, and at the same moment a blow of the giant's club stretched the hero senseless on the ground. His helmet was unhurt, but the blow had been so heavy that it left him unconscious. The giant now fell upon him, kneaded his defenseless body both with his hands and his knees, and then dragged him away into his dismal den. Master Hildebrand waited for eight days with great impatience. Then, finding that the king did not return, he took leave of his wife and set forth in search of him. In the wood near the snow-capped mountain, Hildebrand found the king's horse and further on the broken sword. He could no longer doubt what his friend's fate had been. Vengeance, not deliverance, was now alone what he hoped for, and he rode on unheeding the warning that the little dwarf Baldung called after him. On perceiving the newcomer, the giant rushed upon him. The battle between them was long and fierce, and Sigonot disdained no weapon of defense. He tore up bushes and even trees and threw them at the hero. When Hildebrand at last tried to defend himself by a ruse, the club came down upon his head and struck him senseless to the ground. "'Come on, Longbeard,' shouted Sigonot. "'Hilda and Grimm are avenged at last.' So saying, he bound the fallen warrior hand and foot, and seizing him by the head, flung him over his shoulder, and bore him to his cave, singing loudly the while. The giant's dwelling was large and lofty. The roof was supported by stone pillars, and a carbuncle in the center shed a pleasant light over the foreground, while the back of the cavern was dark and gloomy in the extreme. On entering, the giant threw down his burden with such force that Hildebrand thought every bone in his body was broken. Sigonot then went to a side cave to fetch an iron chain with which to bind his prisoner, saying that he would not be long away. When a weak man is in sore straits, he at once gives himself up for lost. Not so the hero. He never abandons hope until he has tried every mode of rescue, however poor. It was thus with Hildebrand. Looking round him, he perceived his good sword, which the giant had seized as rightful booty, lying in a distant corner, and he thought that he might yet fight and gain the victory, if he could only cut the cords that bound his wrists. He was fastened to a square pillar with sharp corners. He sawed the cords on his wrists against the pillar, and cut them through. No sooner were his hands free then he undid the ropes and cords about his feet, and snatching up his sword, hid behind the pillar, which he intended to use as a protection, his shield having been left in the wood. Sigonot returned with the chains, and looked about in astonishment. His prisoner was gone. 
Suddenly he caught sight of him behind the pillar, and the battle raged anew. The ground trembled beneath the giant's tread, and the rocks re-echoed the sound of blows. The combatants were now fighting in the dark background of the cave, led there by the gradual retreat of Hildebrand, when suddenly the hero heard his name called from the depths beyond. He recognized the king's voice, and the knowledge that his friend yet lived gave added strength to his arm. A few minutes more, and the giant was stretched at his feet. The victory was won. He cut off the monster's head, and whilst resting for a moment after his exertion, he heard Dietrich's voice exclaiming, "'Hildebrand, dear master, help me out of the serpent's hole. There are still some adders here, alive, though I have slain and eaten many more.' Finding that the king was confined in a deep hole, Hildebrand looked round for a rope or a ladder with which to help him out. Whilst engaged in this search, he was joined by the dwarf Valdung, who gave him a ladder of ropes, by means of which the king was restored to the light of day. Hildebrand, said Dietrich, taking a long breath of the fresh pure air, you are not my comrade, but my master. After this, the heroes followed the dwarf into his subterranean kingdom, where he provided them with food and drink, and offered them costly treasures. The noblest gift that Dietrich accepted was his sword Nagelring, mended, hardened, and newly adorned with gold and precious stones, so that it was more beautiful as well as stronger than before. The heroes now returned to Bern, where they were received with great joy. Queen Virginal Once when Dietrich and Hildebrand were hunting in the wild mountains of Tyrol, the king confessed that he had never been able to forget Queen Virginal, who had come out to warn him of Sigonot's approach. You would find it as easy to gain the love of a star as to while Queen Virginal away from her glaciers and snow mountains, said Hildebrand. While the heroes were thus talking together, a tiny little mannequin dressed in full armor suddenly stood before them. Noble warriors, he said, you must know that I am Bibung, the unconquerable protector of Queen Virginal, ruler of all dwarfs and giants in these mountains. With my help she chased thievish Elbagast away from her dominions, but the wretch has now invaded her realm with the help of the magician Ortgis, his giants and his lindworms. He has forced her by his black art to pay him a shameful tribute. He obliges her every full moon to give him one of her beautiful maidens, whom he then imprisons, fattens, and eats for his dinner. So Yeraspunt, her palace, is filled with weeping and mourning. My lady, hearing that you conquered the dread Sigonot, entreats you to come to her aid. Therefore hasten to Heraspunt and rescue our great queen." The heroes consented, and asked to be shown the way. The dwarf guided them till they came within sight of a wondrous building shining on the heights in the light of the evening sun. Hildebrand broke the silence that had fallen on them by exclaiming, "'Truly, if the Lady Uota were not my wife, I should be inclined to try my luck with Queen Virginal. But as things are, I will do my best to help you win her.' "'Well, Bibung, why?' "'Where in the world has the rascal got to?' "'The unconquerable protector of the queen has a wholesome terror of Orcus,' laughed Dietrich. "'But now let us on to the palace. "'Night is the time for witches to journey, not honest men,' said Hildebrand. "'So let us stretch ourselves on the soft moss and rest till morning.' The next morning was dull and misty, and a snowstorm beat in the faces of the warriors as they climbed the steep mountain on foot by a road impassable for horses. On and on they went, a weary way. As they stopped to slake their thirst at a spring, they heard a woman's voice shrieking for help. A girl rushed up to them and entreated their aid against terrible Orcus, to whom she had been delivered according to the treaty, and who was now hunting her down with his dogs. At the same moment the holoa of the huntsman was heard, and in another the battle of the heroes with Ortgus and his followers had begun. Gigantic as were Ortgus and his train, they soon fell under the swords of the heroes. One man alone escaped, but he was the worst of the whole crew, for he was Yanibus, son of Ortgus, 
and a great magician like his father. Dietrich and Hildebrand determined to take shelter in the castle of Ortgis, which was nigh at hand. When they knocked at the door, several armed giants rushed out upon them, but at length they too were conquered. A horseman in black armor had kept behind the rest during the battle. He murmured something in a strange language, and obedient to his voice, new giants rose out of the earth to take the place of the slain. Still the heroes were victorious. The black horsemen continued to murmur, and horrible lindworms crept out of the ground, and with them Dietrich and Hildebrand had to fight all night long. The black horsemen disappeared at last, when the first rays of the rising sun lighted up the castle in the valley. At the same moment the hero saw an enormous old lindworm crawling away with an armed man in its jaws. It wanted to creep away unnoticed, but the warriors immediately attacked it. The dragon let its victim fall, and hurled itself hissing upon Dietrich, who stood nearest. With one claw it tore away his shield and ripped up his coat of mail. At the same time it caught up Hildebrand with its tail and flung him to a great distance. But Dietrich thrust his sword right through its jaws, and so deep into a neighboring tree that the creature was pinned down, and died a few minutes after, roaring like thunder. The maiden they had saved from Ortgus had watched the combat from afar. She now approached and bound up Dietrich's wounds, pouring in a healing balm. Meanwhile, Hildebrand had picked up the man the dragon had let fall, and recognized him as Rutwin, the son of Helfrich of Tuscany, who was his mother's brother. Rotwin joined the other two, and promised to help them to punish the wizard Yanibus. Further help appeared in the person of Helfrich. The whole party now moved towards the magician's castle, the gates of which stood open. The court was full of armed men, amongst whom was Yanibus in black armor, riding on a coal-black steed. He murmured magic words, and lions rushed out on the heroes. These great beasts were slain, and so were the men at arms who followed them. Yanibus alone escaped. Dietrich and his followers entered the castle, where they found three of the queen's maidens cooped up for fattening, and set them free. After which they burnt the magician's fortress, that it might not serve as a refuge to Yanibus if he returned to that part of the country. The whole party then started for Aaron, the castle of Helfrich, where the heroes were to rest before continuing their journey to the palace of Queen Virginal. A short respite from their toil was the more necessary, as Dietrich's wounds were very painful, but their hostess's good nursing had soon the happiest effect in subduing the fever and healing the wounds. At last the day was fixed for their departure, and Helfrick had settled to go with them, and lead them to Herospunt. While they were making their final arrangements, a dwarf galloped up to the door, and throwing himself from his horse, entered the hall, his mantle torn and dusty, and his countenance as pale as death. "'Help, noble heroes, help!' he cried. "'Yanibus has come against Queen Virginal in battle array. He has ordered her to deliver all her maidens up to him, and also the carbuncle in her coronet. If he gets that into his power,' No one can withstand him, for it would give him complete command over all the mountains, and over all the giants, dwarfs, and lindworms that inhabit them. Woe to them if they fall into his hands! Dietrich at once declared his readiness to go alone to the queen's help, if the others were not prepared to start on the instant. "'What, alone?' cried the dwarf. "'If you go alone, you are a dead man.' Even I, Her Majesty's special defender, had to turn my back and fly before the foe. What then would become of you? Nobody could help laughing at the mannequin's conceit, but there was no time to lose, and all the warriors hastened to arm and start for the palace. The hero and their friends had a long and hard pull up the mountainside, over snowfields and glaciers, in the midst of which great crevices yawned in unexpected places, but they were cheered on their way by catching from every height a glimpse of Yeras Punt. At length they came so near that they heard shrieks and howls, and other sounds of battle. 
a few minutes later the terrible scene was visible some of the palace guard were killed and mangled others were yet defending themselves gigantic dogs monsters of every sort and hordes of savage warriors formed the enemy's ranks many had forced their way through the broken gate and were raging storming and howling round the queen's throne the sovereign lady sat there unmoved surrounded by her trembling maidens a carbuncle glowed in the diadem that graced her head and a silver veil was wrapped about her her only prediction seemed to be a magic circle that her assailants could not pass whether the magic lay in her wonderful beauty or in the spiritual love that shone on her face it were impossible to say no one had yet dared to approach her even the heroes halted for a moment on first seeing her but then recovering themselves pressed forward they made their way in spite of clouds of snow and lumps of ice to say nothing of a frightful hurricane that almost blew them away the mountains trembled under repeated thunderclaps and a bottomless crevice divided them from the palace but at the same moment dietrich perceived the black horseman reading his magic spells from an iron tablet he sprang upon him broke the tablet and slew the magician a great clap of thunder rolled over the mountains avalanches fell ice fields broke up and then came a silence as of death the spell was broken the yawing gulf closed and the way to the palace was free the magician's followers eager to avenge their master attacked the heroes and their men but their efforts were vain the monsters who yet lived had soon to fly and seek refuge in the solitudes of the snow mountains dietrich now approached the queen at the head of his followers he would have knelt before her but she rose from her throne and offering him her hand greeted him with a kiss unable to utter a word he let her lead him to the throne and seated himself at her side no great hero she said that i have seen your love and your deeds i give up my rule in elfland and will go home with you and live amongst mortal men till death parts us the palace was cleansed by invisible hands the gate and all the broken posts and pillars were mended during the night and the marriage of the mortal hero with the elf queen was solemnized soon after the husband and wife then started for bairn where virginal made his home so delightful that it was long before dietrich thought of seeking more adventures meanwhile there was sorrow in the mountains and in the heart of every elf that lived there the queen had left her country and her people for the sake of a mortal all nature mourned her absence the sunsets no longer had the prismatic hues of former times and the fairy palace was invisible to all end of section eight section nine of epics and romances of the middle ages this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. epics and romances of the middle ages by wilhelm wagner section nine dietrich's comrades heim in all countries and amongst all nations were spread the name and fame of dietrich of bern for he was the favorite hero of many a wandering minstrel and so it came to pass that numbers of brave warriors used to go and visit him and take part in the amusements or serious occupations that engrossed the attention of their hosts during the time of their visit even in the far north his name was famous not only in the castle of the noble but in many a wayside inn and solitary grange at the time of which we speak the renowned horse-dealer called studus lived in the heart of a great forest he cared little for the singing and fiddling of the wandering minstrels but his son heim was different he often declared that he knew he could wield a lance and sword as well as the hero of bern his father was weary of his vainglorious talk and one day when the young fellow was boasting as usual that he was as good a man as dietrich if not better his father exclaimed in a pet 
well if that be the case go up to the hollow mountain and kill the dragon that is doing all this mischief in the neighborhood the lad looked up at him inquiringly the father nodded and Heim, casting a haughty look at him turned and went out he will not do it muttered the old man but i think i have cooled his hot blood for him things were going otherwise than honest studus dreamed in his philosophy his bold son armed himself and mounting one of his father's best horses rode off to the mountain the lindworm sprang at him with open jaws but the lad plunged his spear into his mouth with such force that the point came out behind his head the monster lashed the ground long and furiously with his tail but at length fell dead whereupon heim cut off his head and riding home took it into the grange and flung the trophy at his father's feet saint killian cried studus boy have you really killed the dragon well well answered the bold youth i shall now go and slay the hero of bairn give me the horse that carried me so bravely to-day he will take me to bairn and bring me home again without hurt the old man felt his head go round when he heard his son speak in such a way but he granted the lad's request and heim rode out into the unknown world in the royal palace of bairn queen virginal was busy filling the goblets of the warriors who feasted with her husband and who agreed that great as were the blessings of peace it was high time they should be up and doing something lest their swords should rust in their scabbards in the midst of this conversation the door opened and a stranger entered in full armor he was a tall broad-shouldered man and apparently young hildebrand welcomed him and invited him to take off his coat of mail telling him that purple and silken garments were more suited to a royal feast than the panoply of war my trade is war said the stranger i am heim son of the horse dealer studus and have come to challenge the famous dietrich to come out with me to the open field and try which of us is the better man he spoke so loud that every one heard and dietrich at once accepted the challenge calling upon his guests to come out and watch the fray the king then put on his armor mounted his good horse falcon and in another moment was ready for the combat they fought for some time on horseback but at length the shafts of their spears being broken in the melee they sprang to the ground and continued the combat on foot again a little time and after heim had performed wonderful feats of valor his sword broke and he stood defenseless before the angry king dietrich swung his sword above his head preparatory to giving his opponent the death blow but he had not the heart to do it he had compassion on the youth and courage of the bold warrior who stood so fearless before him letting his sword fall to his side the king offered his hand to heim in sign of peace this generosity conquered the lad completely he took the offered hand said that he confessed himself overcome and swore that henceforth he would be a faithful servant and follower of the glorious king dietrich was pleased to number a man like heim among his followers and presented him with castles and rich lands Vittich. Vittich was the son of Vilent, the smith of Heligoland, by Busvilda, Badilda. From his earliest childhood his father had taught him the use of the bow, and the greatest praise he ever gave him was to say, You are a bowman like my brother, Eigel. Young Vittich wanted very much to learn all he could about his uncle, and Vilent began, When your mother's father, Niduder, Drost of the Nairs, made me a prisoner long ago my brother eagle came to his castle and entered his service as bowman of the guard every one admired his skill he could shoot away the head of an eagle that was flying high as the heavens i have also seen him aim an arrow at the right or left foot of a lynx and pin it to the bow on which the creature sat and he did other wonderful things too numerous to relate but the drost wanted to see something more wonderful still so he desired him to shoot an apple off the head of his own child at a hundred paces off telling him at the same time that if he refused or if obeying he missed his mark 
he would have the boy hewn in pieces before his eyes. Eigel drew three arrows from his quiver, and fitted one into the bowstring. The boy stood motionless, looking at his father with perfect confidence. "'Could you have done that, my lad, eh?' "'No, father,' answered Vittich boldly. "'I would have fetched your trusty sword, Mimung, and have hewn off the head of that wicked old man. And then, if his nyers had tried to avenge him, I would have chased them out of the country.' "'All very fine, young hero,' laughed the father. "'But remember this. "'A true hero only speaks of what he has done, "'not of what he would have done under such and such circumstances. "'It would have been better, however, "'if Eigel had done something of that kind. "'After he had shot away the apple, "'he turned to the drost and told him "'that had he by any accident killed his son.' he would have used the two other arrows in shooting him first, and then himself. The dross took no notice of the speech at the time, but soon afterwards he exiled the bowman without thanks or payment, and no one knows what has become of him. The smith brought up his son on tales like this, which naturally excited the boy's adore for adventure, and made him more and more unwilling to work at the forge. One day the lad spoke out, and asked his father to give him a suit of armor, and the good sword Mimung, that he might hie away to Bern, fight with King Dietrich, and win a kingdom like his ancestors. After many refusals, the smith at last gave his consent, and furnished his son with all that he needed for the enterprise, explaining to him the special virtues of each weapon. Finally he told him to remember that his great-grandfather, King Vilcanus, a mighty warrior in his day, had married a mermaid, who, when the king was dying, had promised him by the memory of their love that she would help any of their descendants who asked for her aid. "'Go down to the seashore, my son,' continued the smith, "'if ever you are in need, and demand the protection of our ancestress.' And then with much sage advice, together with many old stories of things he had seen and known, Vilan took leave of his son. Vitich rode on for many days before he met with any adventure. At length he came to a broad river, and dismounting, took off his armor, which he laid upon the bank, and began to wade across the water, leading his horse, skimming by the bridle. When halfway across, three horsemen in full armor passed by, and seeing him began to taunt him and ask him where he was going. He told them that if they would wait until he had put on his armor, he was ready to try conclusions with them. They agreed, but no sooner did they see him dressed in his coat of mail, and mounted on his good steed, than they bethought them that as they were in a strange place, it would be better to have a man of such thews and sinews for a comrade than an enemy. So they offered him peace instead of war. He accepted, and after shaking hands, they journeyed on together. They rode upstream for a very long way, and at last they came to a castle. A host of savage-looking men poured out of the gates and advanced to meet them. "'There are too many for us to conquer,' said the eldest of the strangers. "'Still I think that our good swords may enable us to hew our way across the bridge. "'Let me go and offer them a silver piece as toll,' said Vittich and setting spurs to his horse he rode on. Arrived at the bridge, he was informed that the only toll demanded or accepted there were the horse, armor, clothes, right hand and right foot of the traveler. He explained that he could not afford to pay so high a price for so small a benefit, and offered them a piece of money. Whereupon they drew their swords and attacked him. The three warriors, meanwhile, kept on a neighboring height, and watched and commented on all that went below. Seeing that their new friend seemed hard beset, two of them galloped to his assistance, while the third held back in scorn. But before they reached the place of combat, seven of the robbers were slain, and at sight of them the others took flight. The heroes now rode on to the castle, where they found plenty of food and much booty. While they enjoyed their evening meal, their tongues were unloosed, and each told his name and deeds. Wittich had more to tell about his father than about himself, 
and then he learnt that the eldest of his new companions was master hildebrand the second strong heim and the third jarl hornbog who was also a comrade of dietrich this is a stroke of good luck for me cried the young warrior for i am on my way to bern to try my strength against the glorious king and i have good hope that i may win the day for my father has given me his sword mimung that can cut through steel and stone just look at the hilt is it not the workmanship beautiful on hearing this the three comrades grew more silent and proposed to go to rest as they were very tired vittich followed their example the young hero was soon snoring in the company with heim hornbog but hildebrand lay awake a prey to sad forebodings he knew that vittich's sword could cut through his master's helmet and he considered what was to be done he crept noiselessly from his bed and taking mimung compared it with his own sword the two blades were wonderfully alike but not the hilts so with the grim smile of satisfaction he carefully unscrewed the blades from the hilts and exchanged them then returned to his couch and soon after fell asleep they started again on their journey next morning in the course of a few days they met with several adventures that proved to hildebrand and his comrades that vittich was of the stuff that heroes are made of on hearing of the arrival of his old master and the rest king dietrich hastened out into the court to meet and welcome them but his astonishment was great when the young stranger pulled off his silver gauntlet and handed it to him in another moment dietrich had snatched it and flung it in the youth's face exclaiming wrathfully do you think it is part of a king's duty to make a target of himself for every wandering adventure to strike at here my men seize the rascal and hang him to the highest gallows the power to do so is on your side answered vittich but bethink you my lord whether such a deed would not bring dishonour on your fair fame and hildebrand said sire this is vittich son of veland the celebrated smith he is no mean man or secret traitor but well worthy of a place in the ranks of your comrades very well master replied the king i will fight him as he desires but should he be conquered i will deliver him to the hangman it is my last word now come to the race course the whole town assembled to witness the duel between the king and the stranger the combat raged long but at last vittich's sword broke and he stood defenceless before the king false father you deceive me he cried you gave me the wrong sword and not mimung surrender vagrant cried dietrich and then to the gallows with you the young warrior's last hour had come if hildebrandt had not sprung between them sire he said spare an unarmed man and make him one of your comrades we could not have a more heroic soul in our company no he shall go to the gallows stand back master that he may once more lick the dust before me the master was sick at heart he thought of how he had wronged the young hero by changing his sword here brave warrior is your sword memung he said handing vittage the weapon at his side and now dietrich do your best the battle began again and memung showed its mettle now bits of the king's shield and armor fell away and a home stroke laid his helmet open surrender king cried the victorious youth but dietrich fought on in spite of terrible wounds then the master sprang forward vittich he cried hold your hand for it is not your own strength but Veland's sword that gives you victory. Be our comrade, and then we shall rule the world, for next to the king you are the bravest of all the heroes. Master, replied Vittich, you help me in my need, and I will not now deny you. Then, turning to the king, glorious hero of Bern, I am your man henceforward, and will be faithful to you as long as I live. The king offered his hand in his firm grasp and made him ruler over a large fief vildeber ilson and other comrades eka was the eldest son of the once powerful king mentiga by the mermaid whom he made his queen 
he loved queen seaberg who lived at cologne in the rhineland seaberg had a great desire to see king dietrich and eka on hearing of it promised to bring him to her or die in the attempt she on her side said that she would be his wife if he came home successful when he went met dietrich and after showing prodigies of valor died at his hands much to the sorrow of the king who had meant to love him during the few hours of their acquaintance when dietrich returned to bern after slaying eka heim came out to meet him and was so outspoken in his joy at seeing him again that the king much touched gave him his good sword nagelring as a sign of his friendship the warrior received it with delight and kissed the trusty blade twice or thrice as he said i will wear this sword for the glory of my king and will never part with it as long as i live you are unworthy of the sword cried vittage who had come up with the other warriors do you remember how you left your weapon in that sheath when the robbers were attacking me and that hildebrand and hornbog alone helped me your self-sufficiency had made me angry as your pitiful tongue does now i will cut it out both men put their hands to their swords but the king stepped between them and desired them to keep the peace in the castle when he learned all that had happened dietrich told heim that he might go his way because it was not seemly in a warrior to leave his comrade unaided in danger but he added that when he had shown by brave deeds that he was really a hero he might return to them once more well sire i think i shall win myself greater wealth by nagelring than i lose in the castles you now take from me having thus spoken the bold warrior sprang on his horse and rode away without taking leave of any one he rode on till he reached the vasara Vesser, where he drew a band of robbers around him and wrought great mischief he plundered the defenceless country people and even bold warriors had to pay him blackmail and thus through highway robbery he became the owner of a great hoard of wealth which he was never tired of increasing dietrich had to tell his friends of his terrible combat with the hero eka in which he had won the beautiful suit of armor he brought home with him and the good sword eka sax one day when the warriors were discussing this subject a monk entered the hall and remained standing humbly near the door he was tall and broad-shouldered and his cowl was pulled forward so as to hide his face the servants began to play him tricks until at last the monk growing impatient seized one of his persecutors by the ear and held him up shrieking in the air when the king asked the reason of the noise the monk stepped forward and begged a morsel of bread for a half-starved penitent dietrich came forward himself and commanded food and drink be placed before the brother but his astonishment was great when the monk pushed back his cowl and displayed well-rounded cheeks that bore no trace of starvation he was still more surprised when he saw the quantity of food and wine the reverend brother could dispose of the holy man has the appetite of a wolf murmured the bystanders five long years i have done penance by prayer fasting and water drinking he said and now have license from the venerable prior to go out into the world and lay penance on other sinners now he continued going on with his meal ye be all miserable sinners with your continual feasting and drinking and i call upon you to do penance and be converted that your sins be blotted out then he intoned in a loud ringing voice o sanctissima master hildebrand had joined the group and now exclaimed why it is my own dear brother elsa and the monk culpa mia cried the monk touch me not unholy brother confess and do penance that thou go not straight to hell like the others but said the master we are all collected here together to convert by kindness or force all monsters giants and dwarves so my reverend brother i now beg of you to lay aside your robes and once more become one of us convert say you yea i have license to convert the heathen and will therefore join you in your pious work 
with these words the monk flung off his robes and stood before them dressed in full armour here he cried touching his broad sword is my preacher's staff and here pointing to his coat of mail my bravery st killian pray for me and for all of us or no probis he sat down amongst the warriors who had all but known the stout monk island for many years he drank and sang now psalms now songs and told merry tales of his life in the monastery evening came on apace candles and torches were lighted suddenly every one was startled by a strange creature pattering in at the door it was like a bear to look upon its head resembled that of a boar but its hands and feet were of human form the monster stood as though rooted to the threshold and appeared to be considering on whom first to make its spring an evil spirit cried elson a soul escaped from the purgatorial fire i will address it conjurote he paused for the monster had turned its face to him i will drag him back to his purgatory again cried bold wolfart springing over the table and seizing the creature by its fur but pull and tug as he might he could not move it by so much as an inch it quietly gave the warrior such a kick that he fell head over heels into the middle of the hall hornbog vittich and other warriors tried to push the monster out with their united strength but in vain give room brave comrades cried the angry king i will see whether the monster is proof against my sword ekasax sire interrupted master hildebrand catching him by the arm look do you not see a golden bracelet sparkling with precious stones on the creature's wrist it is a man perhaps a brave warrior well said the king turning to his strange guest if you are indeed a hero doff your disguise join us and be our faithful comrade on hearing these words the strange guest threw off boar's head and bearskin and stood before the king and his followers clad in armour i know you now said hildebrand you are the brave hero vildebear surnamed the strong and the gold bracelet is the gift of the swan maiden and makes your strength double but why did you so disguise yourself every brave man is a welcome guest to our king vildebear seated himself by the master's side emptied a goblet of sparkling wine and said once after fighting a hard fight with robbers i lay down to sleep on a bank of a lake suddenly i was awakened by a splashing in the water turning my eyes in the direction of the noise i saw a beautiful maiden bathing i spied her swan garment laying on the bank crept up to it softly took it and hid it the maiden sought it everywhere and when she could not find it she began to weep aloud i went to her and begged that she would follow me home and be my wife but she wept the more and said that she must die if she were deprived of her bird's dress i was sorry for her and gave it back whereupon she gave me this bracelet which increases my strength immensely but she told me that to preserve it i must wander about as a bear with a boar's head until the most famous king on earth chose me to be one of his comrades if i did not obey her she warned me that the virtue of the jewel would depart and i should soon be slain in battle having thus spoken she flew away that is why i came to you in such disguise brave hero he continued addressing dietrich and as you have received me into the ranks of your comrades of your own free will i hope that the bracelet will retain its magic power as long as i live pax Viscum, stammered the monk as he staggered away to bed the other warriors soon followed his example and silence reigned in the palace Dietlieb. king dietrich was one day about to mount his horse and set out to visit his brother monarch the emperor ermenerich when a warrior rode into the court the king at once knew him to be heim he was not much pleased to see him back at bern but when heim told him that he had been victorious in many battles against giants and robbers he consented to receive him once more into the ranks of his comrades 
and desired him to accompany him and certain of his followers to Romaburg. At Fratilleberg, where they rested, Dietrich accepted the offered service of a man who called himself Ilmenrich, son of a Danish yeoman, Soti, and enrolled him amongst his servants. When they came to Romaburg, they were received with all honor by the emperor, who gave them both board and lodging. But the emperor forgot one thing in his plans, and that was to provide food for the servants. Ilmenric fed them on the first night. On the second, his private resources being exhausted, he pawned Heim's armor and horse for ten gold pieces. On the third, he pawned Vitige's goods for twenty, and on the fourth, he got thirty for the weapons and horse of the king. On the fifth day, when the king gave orders for their return home, Ilmenric asked for money to free the articles he had pawned. Dietrich was astonished and angry when he heard how extravagant his servant's ideas had been. He took him before Ermenrich, who at once said he would pay the sum required, and asked how much it was. The emperor and all his court made merry at Ilmenric's expense, especially Walter of Vogstenstein, Voskus, who asked him if he were a werewolf, and well up in strange knowledge of all kinds. Ilmenric modestly answered that he had learned to perform many feats of strength and skill from his father, such as putting the stone and throwing the hammer, and that he would wager his head against the lord of Voskenstein's that he could beat him in this. Walter accepted his challenge, and the trial began. Such skill as Elmenric displayed had never been seen before. The heroes all feared for the life of the braid warrior of Vaskenstein. The emperor then called the young victor to him. Hearken to me, young sir, he said. I will buy the head of my vassal from you at whatever price you list. Gold for blood is the old law. Fear not, sire, answered Elmenric. The head of the brave hero is in no danger from me. I do not want it. But if you wish to do me a kindness, lend me so much money as I have expended for the keep of the servants, that I may redeem the weapons, garments, and horses that I pawned. Treasurer, said the emperor, turning to one of his ministers, weigh out sixty marks of red gold, that the fellow may redeem his pledges, and another sixty marks to fill his purse. Thank you, my lord, returned the young man. I do not need your gift, for I am a servant of the rich king of Bern, who will see that I lack nothing. But if you will keep us another day here, I will, with the sixty marks, treat the servants to a better feast than before, and also my master, all his warriors, and you yourself, should you desire to join the party, even if I have to pawn horses and coats of mail again. All the warriors laughed at the merry youth, but Heim frowned and said that if ever he pawned his horse again it should cost him his life. The feast which the servant prepared them was of royal magnificence. All were pleased except Heim, who secretly feared that his property was again in pawn. The young fellow seated himself at his side, and asked him in a low voice if he knew who had given him that scar on his forehead. Heim answered that it was Dietlieb, son of Jarl Bitterolf, adding that he would know him again in a moment, and that the scar should be avenged in blood. Elmenric replied, Methinks, bold warrior, your memory has gone a wool-gathering. If you look at me in the face, you will see that I am Dietlieb, whom you and your robbers attacked as he was riding through a forest with his father. We slew the robber Ingram and his companions, but you escaped with that wound, thanks to the speed of your good horse. If you don't believe me, I have a witness here that will prove my words in the open field. But if you will trust me, the matter may remain a secret between us. Towards the end of the feast, Dietrich told the youth that he should no longer be a servant, but should be received into the ranks of his comrades. And he, thanking him, answered that he was really Dietlieb, son of Jarl Betterolf, whose glorious deeds were known far and wide. All the king's followers, except Heim, received the young hero into their ranks with pleasure. He returned to Bern with the king, and proved himself his trusty comrade in many an adventure. 
but he was of a restless mind and wished to see more of the world so after a time he took service under etzel king of the huns at whose court he found his father settled father and son together were the doers of many a daring deed king etzel wishing to keep them in his service offered them the land of Stiermark, styria as a fief bitter rolf gave up his share to his son who was therefore surnamed styrian but who often appears in story by his right name of dietlieb the dane end of section nine section ten of epics and romances of the middle ages this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages by Wilhelm Wagner Section 10. Dietrich's Adventures King Loren and the Little Rose Garden Dietleep once came unexpectedly on a visit to Master Hildebrand at his castle of garden. He looked sadder than of old, and returned the master's greeting without an answering smile hildebrand inquired the cause of his sadness and he replied that he had a sweet and wise sister named kundhild who had kept house for him in styria one day when she was dancing with other maidens in a green meadow and he looking on she suddenly vanished from the circle and no one knew what had become of her since then he continued i have learned from a magician that it was the dwarf king loren that hid her under a cap of darkness and carried her off to his hollow mountain this mountain is in tyrol where the dwarf has a wonderful rose garden now good master i have come to you for advice how can i free my sister from the power of the goblin it is a ticklish matter said hildebrand and may cost many a good life i will go with you to bern to see dietrich and our other comrades and then we can agree in council what is the best plan to pursue for the dwarf is powerful, not only because of the extent of his empire, but from his knowledge of magic. When the heroes heard what had brought Hildebrand and Dietlieb to Bern, Wolfhart spoke first, and said that he would adventure himself alone upon the quest, fetch home the maiden safe and sound, and bring the royal mannequin to Bern bound to his saddle-bow. Dietlieb then asked Hildebrand if he knew the way to the rose-garden, he replied that he did but that loren watched over the garden himself and exacted the left foot and right hand of any one who was bold enough to venture within its bounds and spoil the roses he cannot exact this tribute said wittich unless he gets the better of the warrior in fair fight well then added the king we will not touch the lovely flowers all we want is to save our friend's sister from the hands of the dwarf and that is a labor beseeming a warrior all the heroes swore to do no hurt to the garden and then hildebrand consented to be their guide the adventurers were hildebrand dietrich dietlieb wittich and wolfhart their road led them northward among the wild mountains and over crevices ice and snow it was a perilous way they trod but they reckoned nothing of fatigue or danger for their hearts beat high with hope at length they reached the garden a lovely place where spring reigned eternally making it a flowery oasis in a wintry desert the heroes feasted their eyes on the beautiful sight and felt as though they had reached the gates of paradise wolfhart was the first to break the spell setting spurs to his horse he called to his comrades to follow and galloped towards the garden his mad career was soon checked by an iron door with golden letters inscribed on it. He tried to break open the door, but in vain. His comrades came to his aid, and the door was at last beaten in by the four strong men. The garden was still defended by a golden thread, such as used to surround the palaces of the Asus in the olden time. The warriors trod down the thread, and then, in spite of Hildebrand's warnings, began to pluck the roses and trample the garden dietrich did not join in the work of destruction but stood apart under a linden tree suddenly hildebrand called out 
draw your swords here comes the master of the garden they all looked up and saw something bright advancing rapidly towards them soon they were able to distinguish the form of a horseman riding a steed that was as swift as the wind he was small of stature and habited in complete suit of armor his helmet was of specially beautiful workmanship and was further adorned with a diadem of jewels in the midst of which a carbuncle blazed like a sun on beholding the damage that had just been done he drew rein and exclaimed angrily what harm have i ever done to you robbers as you are that you should thus destroy my roses if you had aught against me why did you not send me a challenge like honourable men you must now expiate your crime by each giving me his right hand and left foot if you are king lauren answered dietrich we do indeed owe you reparation and will pay you a fine in gold but we cannot afford to lose our right hands for we require them to wield our swords and as to our left feet we could not well ride were we deprived of them he would be a coward who talked of paying any fine except in blows cried wolfhart and i am determined to dash that hop of my thumb together with the cat he is riding against the cliffs over yonder and then his bones will break into such tiny pieces that even his grasshopper subjects can never collect them upon this lauren answered in words of defiance and the combat with wolfhart began only to end in the latter's overthrow the moment he felt the touch of the dwarf's spear vintage was not more fortunate than his friend for he was also thrown from his saddle at the first encounter lauren sprang from his horse drew out a large knife and approached the hero who lay senseless on the ground dietrich sprang forward to rescue his comrade do not venture the spear thrust but close with him said hildebrand in a low voice lauren has three magic charms of which you must deprive him and these are a ring with the stone of victory on his finger a belt that gives him the strength of twelve men round his waist and in his pocket a cap of darkness which makes him invisible when he puts it on after a long and fierce wrestle dietrich managed to get possession of the ring which he at once gave to the master's charge again the combat raged neither side gaining any advantage at last dietrich begged for a short truce which lauren granted the truce over the two kings renewed the fight dietrich caught lauren by the belt and at the same moment the latter clasped him round the knees so tight that he fell backwards the violence of his fall broke the belt he was holding and it slipped from his hand hildebrand then rushed forward and caught it before the dwarf could pick it up no sooner was this done than lauren went out of sight dietrich still felt the blows he gave but could not see him filled with a berserker rage at his own powerlessness he forgot the pain of his wounds he flung away both sword and spear sprang like a tiger in the direction in which he heard the whistling of the invisible sword and seized his adversary for the third time he tore away the cap of darkness and lauren stood before him praying for peace i shall first cut off your right hand and left foot and then your head and after that you may have peace cried the angered hero setting off in pursuit of the dwarf who now took to his heels save me dietlieb my dear brother-in-law cried lauren running up to that warrior your sister is my queen dietlieb swung the little creature on horseback before him and galloped away into the wood there he set him down and told him to hide himself until the king's anger was abated coming back to the place of combat the warrior found dietrich on horseback and as furious as before i must have either the dwarf's head or yours cried dietrich in another moment their swords were flashing a second fight would have begun had not hildebrand held back the king by main force while vintage did the same to dietlieb after a little they succeeded in making peace between the angry men and also in gaining grace for the dwarfs later still the warriors might have been seen in friendly converse with each other and with lauren who was then and there admitted as one of dietrich's comrades this point settled the dwarf proposed to show them the wonders of his hollow mountain 
saying that Dietlieb should then give his sister to him as wife, with the usual ceremonies. It is the old law, answered the hero of Styrland, that when a maiden has been carried away from her home and is recovered by her friends, she should have free choice given her either to remain with her husband or return to her people. Are you willing that it should be so in this case? By all means, said the dwarf. Now let us go. Do you see that snow-capped mountain? My palace is there, so to horse, that my eyes may no longer be pained by seeing the wreck you have wrought in my garden. The roses will bloom again in May. The journey to the snow-capped mountain was much longer than the warriors had imagined. It lasted till noon of the following day. Below the snow they came to a meadow that was as beautiful as the rose garden. The air was filled with the perfume of flowers. Birds were singing in the branches, and little dwarfs were to be seen hurrying to and fro. They followed Loren into the dark entrance of his underground kingdom. The only one of their number who felt the least distrust was Vittich, who had not forgotten the thrust of the dwarf king's spear. IN KING LORAN'S REALM A soft twilight reigned in the vast hall of the palace to which they now came. The walls were of polished marble, inlaid with gold and silver. The floor was formed of a single agate, the ceiling of a sapphire, and from it there hung shining carbuncles like stars in the blue sky of night. All at once it became light as day. The queen came in surrounded by her maidens. Her girdle and necklace were jeweled, and in her coronet was a diamond that shone like the sun, bringing the brightness of day wherever it came. But the lady herself was more beautiful than aught else. None could take their eyes off her face. She seated herself beside Loren, and signed to her brother Dietlieb to sit down on the other side of her. She embraced him and asked him many questions about their old home and friends. By this time supper was ready. Loren was a perfect host, and his guests were soon quite at their ease. Even Vintage forgot to be suspicious. When the meal was over, the dwarf king left the hall, and Dietlip seized the opportunity to ask his sister whether she was willing to remain in that underground paradise as its queen. She answered with tears that she could not forget her home and friends, that she would rather be a peasant girl in the upper world than a queen among the dwarves and that though she must admit that Loren was very good and kind, yet he was not as other men. Dietlip then promised to save her or lose his life in the attempt. Loren now returned and asked the hero if he would like to retire to his bedchamber. He took him there and remained talking with him for some time. At last he told him that his comrades were all condemned to death and that he had only spared him because he was his brother-in-law. "'Traitor! False dwarf!' cried Dietlieb. "'I live and die with my comrades, but you are in my power.' He started forward, but the dwarf was gone, and the door was shut and locked on the outside. Loren then returned to the hall, filled the goblets of the warriors from a particular jar, and entreated them to drink the wine, which would ensure them a good night's rest. They did so, and immediately their heads sank upon their breasts, and a heavy drugged sleep fell upon them. In turning to the queen, Loren desired her to go to her room, for these men must die in punishment for the wreck they had made of his rose garden, adding that her brother was safely locked up in a distant room, that he might escape the fate of his comrades. Kuhnhild wept aloud, and said that she would die if he carried out his cruel purpose. He gave her no distinct answer, but reiterated his command. As soon as the queen had retired, he sounded his horn, and immediately five giants and a number of dwarves hurried into the room. He commanded them to bind the warriors so tight with cords that they could not move when they awoke. After that he had them dragged to a dungeon, where they might remain until he could decide their fate next morning. Having seen his orders carried out, he went to bed and began to think whether it would be better to let the men off to please the queen, or to punish them for their evil deed. The last seemed to him the wiser plan, and he fell asleep, 
gloating over the intended slaughter of his helpless victims. Dietrich awoke soon after midnight. He felt that he was bound hand and foot, and called to his comrades for aid, but they were as powerless as he. Then Dietrich's wrath was roused to such a pitch that his fiery breath burnt the cords that bound one hand and let it free. After that, it was a matter of little difficulty to untie the knots at his wrist and feet, and then to set his comrades at liberty. What was to be done now? They could not break open their dungeon door. They had neither weapon nor coat of mail. They were helpless victims. At this very moment, while they were looking at each other in despair, they were startled by hearing a woman's voice asking in a low whisper if they were yet alive. "'We thank you, noble queen,' answered Hildebrand. "'We are alive and well, but totally unarmed.' So Kuhnhild opened the door, and appeared on the threshold with her brother. She placed her finger on her lips to enforce silence, and led the way to where the hero's armor was piled. As soon as they were ready, the queen gave each of them a ring, by means of which he could see the dwarfs, even when they wore their caps of darkness. Hurrah! cried Wolfhard. We can make as much noise as we like now, that we have our armor on, and our weapons in our hands. Loren, awakened by Wolfhard's loud tones, knew that the prisoners were free, and at once summoned his dwarfish army to his assistance. The battle began, and raged for a long time, without any advantage being gained by either side. Loren was pleased in his heart of hearts that matters had turned out as they had, for he was a bold little fellow, and liked open war better than trickery. At length the underground forces were routed with great loss, and Loren himself was taken prisoner. Dietrich spared the life of the dwarf king at Fair Coonhild's request, but deposed him from royal power, and gave the mountain to Sintram, another dwarf of high rank, for a yearly tribute. When everything was ordered to their liking, the heroes returned to Bern, taking Loren with them as a prisoner. There was great joy in Bern at the return of the heroes, who were much praised for their valiant deeds, while the unfortunate Loren was laughed at by all. There was only one person who showed him any sympathy, and that was Kunhild. One day she met him when he was wandering about alone and melancholy. She spoke to him kindly, and tried to comfort him, and told him he would soon gain the king's friendship if he proved himself to be faithful and true. Ah, he laughed bitterly, they think that they have kicked a dog who will lick their hands, but a trodden snake bites. You may know what I intended to do. I have sent to inform Valberon, my uncle, who rules over the dwarfs and giants from the Caucasus to Sinai, of what has happened, and he is coming at the head of his forces to be my avenger. He cannot fail to win the day, slay strong Dietrich and his comrades, and lay the whole land waste. When that is done, I will take you back to my kingdom, and replant my rose garden, that it may be lovelier in May than it ever was before. Loren, she answered, you carried me away from home by trickery and magic spells, but I have not been blind to your love, and feel myself honored by its greatness. I cannot live in your underground kingdom, but I will love you and be your queen in the rose garden if you will think of love and faithfulness, and not of revenge. She left him, and he sat pondering the matter for a long time. A few days afterwards, Dietrich came to the dwarf king, and taking him by the hand said, that he had been his prisoner long enough, that he must now sit with his comrades, or return to his own home, whichever he liked best. And then, continued the king, I will go with you to your rose garden next spring, and see it in its beauty. The dwarf silently followed the king into the hall. He sat at Dietrich's side at the feast, and thought over the vengeance he would take when his uncle came. But lovely Kuhnhild appeared and filled his goblet, saying a few kind words the while, and immediately love conquered hatred, and he cried, emptying the goblet to the last drop. "'Henceforward I am your faithful comrade in life and death.' Whilst the warriors were still at the feast, 
a messenger from king valveran came in and declared war on dietrich in the name of his master unless loren were at once restored to his kingdom and unless the hero of bern sent valveran all the money and all the weapons in the country as well as the right hand and left foot of every warrior who had taken part in the destruction of the rose garden dietrich answered proudly that he intended to keep his money arms hand and feet and those of his subjects also and tell him added loren that i send him my thanks and greeting for coming to my assistance but that i am now free and have entered into a bond of love and friendship with the king of bern both sides prepared for battle but before a blow was struck loren rode into his uncle's camp and tried to make peace between valveran and dietrich his uncle told him he was no better than a broken-spirited serf and refused to listen to his words so the fight began and raged furiously for many hours at length late in the afternoon dietrich and valberan met and challenged each other to single combat it was a terrible struggle both kings were severely wounded and it seemed to the onlookers as if both must die suddenly loren threw himself unarmed between their swords flung his arms around king valberan and entreated him to make peace almost at the same moment hildebrand did the same by the angry dietrich and after much expenditure of words the peacemakers had their way so the fighting was changed to feasting and the kings entered into a friendly alliance at the banquet that evening the hero of bern made a long speech in praise of loren who had endangered his life in endeavouring to make peace and to whom he therefore restored the free and independent rule over his kingdom and rose garden when he had finished queen virginal came forward leading fair kunhild and laid the hand of the maiden in that of loren saying that she knew he would regard her reward of his faithfulness as the greatest he had that day received for kunhild had promised to be his wife if her brother did not object as no dissentient voice was heard the marriage was celebrated there and then in the may month of the following year when the roses were again in bloom the dwarfs put the finishing touches to a beautiful palace which they had built in the rose garden many a herdsman and alpine hunter has seen it but to those who go in search of it from mere curiosity it remains ever invisible to this day loren and kunhild show themselves at odd times in the valleys of tyrol and there are people yet alive who are reported to have had a distant glimpse of the wonderful rose garden the great rose garden and ilson the monk dietrich was now a man in the prime of life a perfect hero and a man of valor the number of his comrades had much increased and many doughty deeds had been done once when the king was feasting with many of his comrades he looked round the table with pride and said he believed that no ruler on earth had such heroes about him that no other had prospered so well as he with the help of his chosen comrades and that none might be compared with them the warriors shouted their approbation one alone was silent the king turned to him and asked whether in all his journeys he had seen bolder warriors that i have cried herbrand i have seen some that have not their match upon earth it was at the good town of worms near the river rhine in the land of burgundy it is there that the great rose garden lies five miles long by two and a half broad the queen and her ladies tended themselves and twelve great warriors keep watch and ward lest any one enter the garden without the queen's permission whoever does so must fight with the guard and no one yet whether giant or warrior has been able to withstand them let us go and pluck the roses that have been watered with the blood of heroes cried dietrich i think that my comrades and i will get the better of the guard if you mean to try your luck said herbrand you must know that the victor will receive a kiss and a wreath of roses from lovely women ah well said the old master for the sake of a rose and a woman's kiss i would not risk a single hair of my head or beard he who wishes to pluck roses or kiss women will find enough at bern 
he need not go to the Rhine to find them. Trusty Eckhart and a few more of the comrades agreed with him, for well they knew what the Burgundian warriors were like. But Dietrich loudly declared that he was not going to fight for the sake of roses and kisses, but for honor and fame, and that if his comrades did not wish to go with him, he could go alone. Of course, they would not hear of that, and all who were present agreed to go. The names of those who thus adventured their lives were Dietrich himself, Master Hildebrand, Strong Vittich, Henny Call the Grim, Wolfhard, the young heroes of Sigestab and Amalung, or Amlung, Trusty Eckhart and Hermit, Prince of Rusen, but they only numbered nine in all, and twelve were needed to meet the twelve watchmen of the garden. Hildebrand knew what was to be done. He said, Good Rudiger of Beclaren will not refuse to be the tenth, the eleventh must be brave Dietlip of Styria, and the twelfth my pious brother, the monk Ilson. They started forth at once to induce the chosen three to join them. They went first to Beclaren, in the land of the Danube. Rutiger received them hospitably, and at once consented to go with them, but said that he must first get leave of absence from Etzel, whose margrave he was. The heroes then went on to Styria to visit Dietlieb. They did not find him at home, but his father, Bitterulf, who was there, earnestly entreated them to give up the journey to the Rhine, because, he said, only a fool would undertake a conflict for life or death with the world's bravest warriors, for the sake of a rose and a kiss. But when they met the young hero a short time after, they found him ready to go with them. This settled, they went on to Munchensel, the monastery to which Hildebrand's brother belonged. As soon as Elsen heard the object of their journey, he went straight to the abbot, and asked leave to accompany the hero of Bern to the rose garden. The abbot told him that such was scarcely a monkish quest, but Ilsen grew so angry, and so loudly affirmed that valiant deeds were in his eyes as seemly for a monk as for any other man, that the abbot quailed before him, and gave him leave to go. So Ilsen donned his armor under his monkish dress, and started with his friends. His heart beat high with joy that he was again bound on one of Dietrich's adventures, while his brother monks stood by and shook their heads, saying they feared it would not end well, seeing it was no saintly quest, but a worldly. The heroes went first to Bern, which was to be the general meeting place. Margrave Rudiger was the last to arrive, for he had been detained by his visit to Etzel. Rudiger was now sent on before the others as ambassador to the king Gibich at Worms, to inform him of their intended invasion of the Rose Garden. The Margrave was well known in the Rhineland, and was received as an old friend by the king, who rejoiced to hear of his leader's enterprise. The garden was entered on the appointed day, and the warriors stood opposite each other ready for battle, twelve against twelve, and yet always one against one. It was a terrible sight, for many a hero fell dying amongst the roses, and watered them with his heart's blood. When proud Wolfhart had slain his adversary, he contemptuously refused the kiss offered him by a lovely maiden, and contented himself with a garland of roses. The monk Ilsen walked into the lists on foot, clad in his grey robes, he jumped about among the roses with such strange agility that his opponent thought he had a madman to deal with. But he soon found that his reverend foe was made of sterner metal than he supposed, for he lay vanquished, a wiser man, though wounded almost to death. The victor received the wreath of roses on his tonsured head, but when he kissed the lovely maid who gave it him, she shrieked aloud, for his bristly beard had stung her rosy lips. Seeing this, he said with comical disgust, The maidens of the Rhineland are fair to see, but far too tender to pleasure me. Many other heroes received the prize of victory, while others were severely wounded. Peace was not concluded until sunset. The brave hero of Bern soon afterwards returned home, pleased with the result of his quest. End of section 10
Section 11 of Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages by Wilhelm Wagner. Section 11. Dietrich, the Faithful Ally. March to Etzel. Dietrich lived in friendship with Etzel, king of the Huns, from the time Rudiger first brought them together. When the hero came back from Burgundy, he had sent ambassadors to the king, and promised to help him if he was in any difficulty. It was not long before he was reminded of this promise. The Margrave, who was known in all lands by the title of the Good and Gentle, came to Bern one day, as he had often come before, for he was a welcome guest. On such occasions the warriors would talk over their past adventures, and tell tales of noble and doughty deeds. Rudiger told, amongst other things, his adventures in Spain, and how he had at last left the country, and taken service under King Etzel, who had always been a true friend to him since the beginning of their acquaintance. He went on to relate how King Etzel, powerful monarch as he then was, did not shun to speak of the hardships and homelessness of his early youth. Yes, truly, interrupted Master Hildebrand, and I know as much of his early youth as ever the great king himself. Once when Vilcanus was ruler of the Vilcan men. Ha, my great-grandfather, cried Vittich, what have you to say of him? I only know, continued the master, that he was a mighty chief, and that many kings were subject to him, amongst others King Hernet. After the death of Vilcanus, Hernet rebelled against his son and heir, Nordian, and forced the latter to acknowledge him as his liege lord. The conquered king obtained the rule of Zealand in fief, and declared himself satisfied, although he had four gigantic sons, namely Asperian, Edgar, Aventrod, and terrible Vidwolf of the club, who was always kept chained up, because he did so much destruction whenever he was in a rage. When great Hernet died, he divided his kingdom amongst his three sons. Osantrix, Osric, obtained the rule over the Vilcan men, Valdemar over the Rusin, and Ilius became Jarl of the Greeks. The eldest of the three wooed beautiful Oda, daughter of Melias, king of the Huns. He won her by trickery and force, with the help of Nordian's four giant sons. Oda's father and husband became allies after the marriage, but they could not conquer the bold Frisians, who often made raids into the lands of the Huns, and burned, destroyed, or stole whatever they laid their hands on. For Melias was old and weak, and the Vilcan men lived so far away that their help always arrived too late. The leader of these bold invaders was the mighty man of valor now known as King Etzel, or Attila as he is sometimes called. He was a son of the Frisian chieftain Osid, and after his father's death had to allow his brother Ornit to succeed to the rule of Friesland, and himself go out into the wide world, with nothing but his armor and a good sword. But Frisians were a bold and warlike people. Many of them joined themselves to the young hero, and accompanied him in his Viking raids into the neighboring land of the Huns. When Melius died, the notables of the land elected their former enemy, bold Etzel, to be their king, and thus the robber chief and invader became the sovereign and protector of the country he had once laid waste. Yes, returned Rutiger, that is quite true, and there is more to tell. King Etzel wished to marry Erka, Herche or Helche, the beautiful daughter of Osantrix, chief of the Vilcan men. I was sent as ambassador to her father, and was well received, but when I told the king the object of my mission, he grew wrathful, and said that he would never give his consent to such a marriage, for Etzel was not the rightful chief of the Huns, adding that the position was by his right of his wife, the daughter of Melius. He cared not when I threatened him with war, but desired me to go my way. Etzel invaded the country with his men, and when, after much fighting, 
a truce was at last agreed to neither side had gained much advantage a year later i went back with a number of brave men and had a strong castle built for me in the falster wood this done i stained my face and otherwise disguised by a long beard went again to visit Ocentrix. i told him i was a faithful servant of the late king melias that i had been ill-treated and deprived of my lands by etzel and had therefore taken refuge with him this story gained me his confidence and having occasion to send his daughter urca a message he made me his ambassador i told the maiden of etzel's wooing and how he wished to share his power and glory with her at first she was very angry but at last consented to marry him one moonlight night i brought horses to the gates of the fortress where she was shut up with her young sister broke the bars and carried off the princesses we were pursued but managed to reach the castle in the wood where my men were awaiting me i had scarcely time to send a message to etzel when Ossentrix came upon us with all his host he laid siege to our stronghold but we managed to defend ourselves till etzel came with a great army and forced the vilken men to withdraw ever since then there has been a constant predatory warfare between the two nations and Ossentrix has even now invaded our land with a large army he is accompanied by nordian's giant sons who are the terror of our people now noble dietrich etzel thinks that if you will come and help him he is sure of victory ah well if my dear comrade vildeber will go with me cried vidich i think that we too shall be able to reckon with the giants dietrich promised his help and ordered all preparations to be made for the campaign the bernese heroes arrived just in time for the two armies were standing opposite each other in battle array the fight began dietrich and his men took up their position in the centre division the omlung banner borne by herbrand floated proudly above their heads and vittich rushed foremost into the fray he first encountered the grim giant vidolf who gave him a blow on the helmet with his iron club the dragon that formed the top of the helmet was bent by the terrible blow and although Velen's work did not break the hero himself fell from his horse and lay senseless on the ground over him rushed the men-at-arms in the wild melee Heim alone drew rein he stooped and drew the sword memung out of vittich's hand for he held him to be dead when the wild fight was over and done the vilken men retreated from the field and the huns pursued them plundering where they could hernet nephew of Ossentrix, reached the battlefield too late he could not prevent his uncle's defeat but he found vittich as yet scarcely recovered from his swoon and took him prisoner the victors feasted at sosat and rejoiced over their great deeds but dietrich was sad at heart for he had lost sixty of his men and worse than all his friend and comrade vittich was among the missing in vain they sought him on the battlefield all wondered what had become of him when the king of bern richly rewarded for his help by etzel made ready for his departure vildeber came to him and asked for leave of absence because he would not could not go home without vittich dietrich willingly gave his consent for he could not help the foolish hope springing up within his breast that perhaps vittich might be yet alive and that his friend might find him the next day vildeber went out hunting and slew a bear of unusual size he skinned it and went with the skin to isung the minstrel and arranged with him a plan to free vittich should he be a prisoner in the hands of Ossentrix. isung helped him to draw the skin over his armor and fasten it up carefully then led him in the guise of a dancing bear to the stronghold of the chief of the vilken men now wandering players and merry andrews of every sort were welcome guests in all castles and cottages so isung and his bear were well received Ossentrix laughed heartily at the marvellous agility of the creature in dancing and springing to the sound of the fiddle and even vidolf the grim giant who was led about with a chain by his brother avantrode 
laughed for the first time in his life, making the hall shake with the sound. Suddenly it occurred to the king that it would enhance the sport to set his twelve boarhounds on the bear, to see how strong it was. Isung vainly entreated the king to forbear the cruel sport, alleging that his tame bear was worth more to him than all the gold in the royal treasury, but Olsen Trix was not to be persuaded. The great dogs were loosed, and the barbarous sport began. To the astonishment of all, the boar hounds were either worried or smitten to death by the bear. Olsen Trix sprang angrily to his feet, and slashed at the creature's shoulder with his sword, but the steel armor under inside the bear skin saved the hero's life. Another moment, and the bear had wrenched the sword from the king's hand, and split his head open. The second blow did to death Grim Vidolf, the third his brother Avantrod. Isung stood staunchly by his friend when the Vilken men sought to avenge their king. The courtiers, however, soon took flight in deadly fear of the player and his wild beast. Vildeber now threw off the bearskin, took the helmet off one of the giants, and, fully armed, set out in search of Vittich. The heroes searched the palace. They found Vittich's good steed, Skamming, and his armor, but neither him nor the sword Mimung could they discover. At length they lighted on him in a damp, dark dungeon, chained to a wall, and grown so pale and thin as to be hardly recognizable. Fresh air, food, and wine soon made a change in his appearance. He put on his armor, and sadly took another sword, saying that none could be as good as Mimung. "'Now let us be gone,' said Isung, "'lest the Vilken men should come back.' So Vildeber and he helped themselves to horses from the royal stables, and the three heroes galloped away. "'Of a truth,' cried King Etzel, when he heard their story, "'you are bold men. You have done me good service, and have brought the war to an end unaided. The Lord of Bairn is richer than I, in that he has comrades who willingly venture their own lives to serve a brother in arms.' He kept the heroes for several days to recruit their strength, and then sent them home laden with rich gifts. Dietrich was overjoyed to see his brave warriors again, and showed them honor in many ways, but noticing that trusty Vittich was silent, and had no appetite for wine or food, he asked him what ailed him. And Vittich answered that he sorrowed for the loss of Mimung, his father's best gift, and would go in search of it, though he had to wander through every land. "'I have a notion that you need not take so long a journey,' replied the king, "'for I cannot help thinking that the sword Heim wears is as like Velen's work as one drop of blood is like another.' The conversation was interrupted by the arrival of two warriors in rich armor, who had been sent by the emperor Ermenrich, Dietrich's uncle, to tell the hero that Jarl Rimstein, his vassal in a great fief, had revolted against his authority. Ermenrich therefore entreated his nephew's aid, and Dietrich promised to help the emperor. March against Rimstein Before starting, Vittich said that he could not go to Rimstein without his sword, and Heim refused to give it up, alleging that it was his by right of war but the king smoothed matters for a time by desiring Heim to lend it to his comrade during the campaign. The warriors set out. The rebel Jarl proved himself a tougher foe than had been expected, and even after weeks and months had passed, his castle seemed as impregnable as ever. One moonlight night, when Vittich was out alone, he met six warriors whom he knew, by the device upon their shields, to belong to the enemy. They fought, and Vidich slew their chief, his sword Mimung cutting him in two from the neck to the waist. The other five fled in terror, lest a like fate should befall them. On examining the dead man, Vidich found it was the Jarl himself that he had slain, so he returned to the camp well pleased. Next morning he told Dietrich and his comrades what had chanced, and how the war was now at an end. "'He is indeed a bold warrior,' said Eim, sarcastically. "'He has slain a weak old man, who could not defend himself a bit better than a woman. "'But now I must have Mimung back again, for I only lent it for his enterprise.' 
let me first try it on your head false comrade answered vittich indignantly you left your brother in arms to die in a strange land and were traitor enough to rob him of his weapon of defence as well you shall now pay the penalty of your meanness heim drew his sword nagelring and a fight was imminent but dietrich thrust himself between the angry men and commanded them on their allegiance to keep the peace ermenrich rejoiced to hear of vittich's deed and that the war was at an end he gave rich presents to dietrich and his men and asked the royal hero to give vittich leave of absence that he might marry fair Ulfriana, the emperor's ward and undertake the government of her rich fife of drachenfels the trekkenfell of norse legend dietrich was pleased at his comrade's good fortune and at parting he merely reminded him of his oath of fidelity which the hero at once renewed not long afterwards vittich was married to bolfriana and was endowed by the emperor with a great fief of drachenfels which extends to fratilaberg friedberg and far beyond the eastern mountains so vittich became a mighty chief as he had told his father that he would heim also when his father studis died went to ermenrich's court to take the oath of allegiance he received other lands from his imperial master and what he liked still better much red gold besides end of section eleven section twelve of epics and romances of the middle ages this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages by Wilhelm Wagner. Section 12. Part 1. Section 3. Chapter 5. Ermenrich, the Harlings. Ermenrich had a great and mighty empire. His land stretched out to the east and west, and many kings owed him fealty. His counselors were wise and clear headed men whose advice was of the utmost use to him. Chief among these was Sibich, the marshal of the realm, who was helped in his arduous labours by Ribberstein, the head of the royal household, and his constant companion. These men had always used their influence with the emperor to keep him true to his alliance with his nephew, the king of Bern, of whom in his heart of hearts his imperial highness was not a little jealous but a great change was soon to take place in the policy pursued at Romaburg. Sibic had a young and beautiful wife, of whom he was very fond. Now Ermenrich once sent him away on a long journey, and during his absence did him foul wrong. When the marshal returned, and heard from his weeping wife of the emperor's treachery, he was filled with wrath. At first he snatched up a dagger to kill his foe, but restrained himself for he had thought of a subtler mode of vengeance. He desired to make the emperor the murderer of every member of his family, to deprive him of all his allies, and finally have him assassinated. It was a plan worthy of the devil himself, and was carried out with great craft and intelligence. Sibic's first step was to buy over Ribbestein to his design, which he did for a large sum of money, avarice being the man's weak point. This done, Ribberstein agreed to write letters to the Emperor as if from the Duke of Tuscany, the Count of Ancona, the Prince of Milan, and others, warning him that his son Friedrich was plotting against him. The evil deed was easily accomplished, as Ribberstein had copies of all the coats of arms and seals used by the grandees of the Empire. Ermenrich was naturally of a suspicious disposition, so he readily fell into the snare laid for him. He consulted Sibic as to what were best to be done, and the false counsellor advised him to send Prince Friedrich with a letter to Jarl Randolt, ostensibly to demand payment of the tribute the Jarl owed, but really containing an order that the prince should be slain. The Emperor did as he was advised, and Sibic took care that the deed should become generally known. A cry of horror went through the land, and Ermenric was hated by all. Reginbald, the second son met his death in a different fashion. 
he went down in the rotten ship in which his father had sent him on a pretended mission to England. One son alone remained, Ronver, the third and youngest, a high-spirited, handsome youth in whom there was no guile. That helped him nothing, however. One day, in the innocence of his heart, he gave his young stepmother Svanhild a bunch of flowers, when they were out hunting with the whole court, and Ermenric, whose mind had been poisoned by false civic, ordered Svanhild to be trampled under foot by horses, and Ranver to be hung. His commands were obeyed. He was now alone in the world, a childless old man. "'Well, Ribbestein,' said the marshal to his accomplice, "'we are getting on very well. The Emperor's only remaining heirs are the Harlungs, Imbreca and Frida, who live at Breisach on the Rhine, with their governor Eckhart, and then Dietrich of Bern. The Harlungs and the hero are both brothers' children. You were not born and brought up in Romaburg, so I will tell you the story. Ermenric's grandfather left two sons beside him, namely Dietmar, the father of Dietrich, who received the kingdom of Lombardy, and Dieter, surnamed Harlung, who, during his father's lifetime, received the Breisgau and an enormous hoard of red gold. Now listen to this. If we can only get rid of the Harlungs and the hero of Bern, yes, open your eyes and ears as wide as you can, you and I can divide between us the inheritance of Ermenrich. Rebischstein jumped at the proposal, as a fish jumps out of the water with joy on a bright day. He had never thought of such a thing before, but he quickly understood what was required of him, and set about the evil work at once. The Harlungs were first brought under suspicion. Letters were shown to the Emperor purporting to be from Imbreca. Fritala, and even from their governor Eckhart, addressed to different notables of the Empire, and setting forth Ermenric's crimes in the darkest colors. One of the letters contained the following passage. Since our liege lord has, in his desperate wickedness, slain his own children, he must himself perish, and that on the highest gallows. The emperor was so angry when he read these words that he determined to collect an army and march against his rebellious nephews. The troops were called out without anyone knowing against whom the campaign was to be made. They marched towards the Rhine till they reached Trallenburg, which belonged to the Harlungs and where the brothers then lived. Two horsemen kept watch by the river. When they saw the armed men they feared something was wrong, and, dismounting, swam with their horses across the river. They gave the alarm, and all was prepared for defense. Imbreca and Fritala knew the science of war, but they were still very young, and Eckert, their governor, was detained at Breisach by business of the state. When the Harlings saw their uncle's banner, they thought all danger was over, but soon found to their cost that it was a warlike and not a peaceful visit. Wittich and Heime were with the imperial army, but as soon as they learnt Ermenric's plans they rode away to Breisach to warn the faithful Eckhart of what was going on. As they journeyed together they became good friends again. Trollenberg was at length reduced by fire and taken by storm. Without seeing his nephews, Ermenrech ordered a gallows to be erected, and the two brothers to be at once hung thereon. In those days the word of a mighty potentate was law, and the Emperor was obeyed without remonstrance. Ermenrech now took possession of the Harlung's land, and sent out men to search for the rich hoard the murdered princes had inherited from their father. It was at length found hidden in a cave. The Emperor rewarded his army richly and kept the rest of the treasure-trove for himself. Meanwhile Haima had returned. He had come back intending to reproach his liege lord with his evil deed, and to throw up his fief. But on receiving a large share of the booty he forgot his better purpose. He was entrusted with the care of taking the treasure to Romaburg. When he saw the heap of red gold and precious stones, he took care that a considerable portion of it should find its way to Studa's Grange, and not to Romaburg. Meanwhile curses both loud and deep were uttered in every land against the Emperor. Eckhart brought the news of the Harling's fate to Bern, and Dietrich's wrath burned when he heard it. 
He said that time would surely come when he could demand expiation from Ermenrich and punish his evil counselors Sibick and Rebischstein. The fiery young heroes Alfar and his brother Siegestab wished to start at once alone with Eckhart to avenge the murder, but their father Amelolt and Hildebrand persuaded them to wait. "'What is only put off may yet be done,' said Alfar to his brother, laying his hand upon his sword. Somewhere about this time Sibick and Rebischstein met to hold counsel as to what they should do next. "'Another stone is out of the way,' said Sibick. "'Now we must try to find levers strong enough to move the great rock that stands in our way.' The accomplices felt that they must be careful and not push matters too fast, for, in the first place, the Emperor's own soul was darkened by the crimes he had committed and whenever he was alone he was haunted by the unsubstantial ghosts of those whose death he had compassed. And in the second place, before declaring war upon the hero of Bern, they felt it would be safer to gain over as many as possible of his comrades to their side. But they were hurried on faster than they wished, for Ermenric's uneasy conscience would not let him rest. He must have excitement. The first step taken was to demand tribute of Dietrich of Bern, so Reinhold of Milan was sent into the land of the Amelungs to levy the tribute. The messenger returned in a few weeks' time with empty hands. He said that the notables had flatly refused to pay what he demanded, for they had already paid it to the lord of Bern, and Dietrich had desired him to tell the murderer of the Harlungs to come himself and take the tribute which would be paid to him to the last mark at the spear's point and the sword's edge. The Emperor sent Hyma to Bern to tell Dietrich that if he did not pay the tax he would come in person and hang him on the highest gallows. Hyma was well received in Bern. Dietrich thought that he had come in memory of old times, but when he delivered the Emperor's message the hero asked him if he remembered his old oath of fidelity, to which Hyma replied, that he had served out his bond, and that he was now a vassal of the Emperor, who had given him land and gold, and to whom he therefore owed service. Therewith he took his leave. Hyma was not long gone when Vidic appeared. He galloped up to the castle gate. "'Arm, comrades, arm!' he cried. "'There is not a moment to lose. Ermenric approaches with an innumerable army.' I rode on before to warn you of his coming. Faithless Sibic intended to have taken you by surprise, and whoever falls into his hands is not far from death." Dietrich reminded him of his oath, but like Hyma he excused himself and rode away. The Norns appeared at this time to have thrown their darkest web over the head of the hero of Bern. One blow struck him after another. From Wittig, he hastened to the sick queen virginal. All night long he held her in his arms. In the morning she died, and grief for her loss prevented his acting with the quick determination usual to him. Master Hildebrand, however, was not idle. He had summoned all the vassals with their following from far and wide in the land of the Amelungs. And the night before the queen's death many allied princes joined them. Amongst the number, Berchtunga Pola in Istria, and the king's faithful comrade Dietleib of Styria with all their men. In the morning the old master called the king, and told him that the time was come to fight for his land and people. The hero of Bern made a mighty effort to master his grief. He pressed a last kiss on the pale lips of his dead wife, and passed away on his march to the great battle. The emperor had already subdued the duke of Spoleto and had advanced as far north as Milan. There he encamped, and not suspecting any surprise, he and his men all went to sleep. Meanwhile Dietrich had arrived within a short distance of his camp. While the others rested, Hildebrand rode forward to see what watch the enemy kept, and finding them unprepared, he advised an immediate onslaught. The imperial forces were suddenly aroused by the battle-cry, "'Hey for Bern! Hey for the Red Lion!' They hastily got ready for the fray. The battle raged furiously. Dietrich and his followers were far outnumbered by the foe, but that only made them fight with the more desperation. 
and which of them could have failed to do his duty under such a leader? Wolfhart cried, If we must die, let each man throw his shield behind him and take his sword in both hands. He did as he said, and Sigerstab and Eckhart followed his example. Wittig and Heima fought bravely as of old, but they avoided their former chief and were at length carried away in the general flight. For the imperial troops were routed by a flank movement made by Hildebrand. Ermenric went back to Romaburg in a very bad humor. He felt inclined to hang Sibic and Rebischstein for leading them into a scrape, yet he refrained, as he hardly knew what he could have done without them. Dietrich sent the treasure gained in Milan home to Bern under the charge of some of his comrades, and Berktung of Pola undertook to provide pack horses on which to convey it. The convoy travelled by forced marches, but when they reached the lake of Garten and saw the stars mirrored in its bosom, and heard the plashing of the waterfall, Amolot thought that being in the land of the Wolfings they need no longer fear robbers, and might enjoy a little needful rest. The wearied men hailed his proposition with joy, and after supping on the provisions in their wallets soon fell asleep on the soft turf. Hildebrand with ten of his followers tried to keep awake, but they were so tired that the sound of the murmuring water acted on them like a lullaby, and soon they were sleeping as soundly as the rest. At daybreak they were roughly wakened. Wild faces glared upon them, strong hands bound them, and scornful laughter echoed in their ears. Four of the warriors, who had sought to defend themselves sword in hand, were cut down, the others all bound and carried away with the treasure. They had not been prisoners long before the comrades saw that they had fallen into the hands of their deadly enemy, faithless Sibic. He had heard of their journey in charge of the treasure, and had brought his troops by sea to Garden, and lain in wait near the lake, and had then fallen upon the sleeping men. Thus it was that the brave heroes were conquered by cunning. One warrior had escaped the common misfortune, and this was Dietleib, the hero of Styria. He was sleeping in a thicket a little apart from the rest, when Sibic's men fell on the camp. Hearing the noise, he sprang to his feet, slew several of the men-at-arms, mounted his horse, and fled to Bern, a bearer of sad tidings. He found every one there in great anxiety. Ermenric had again invaded the country, had taken Milan, Robin, Ravenna, and Mantua, and worse than that, many of Dietrich's men had deserted him and joined the enemy. The warriors who preserved their faith and were determined to die with their lord if needful were few in number. A message was sent to Ermenric that the hero of Bern was willing to exchange his prisoners of war for his brave comrades. The answer he received was that he might do with his prisoners as he liked. The warriors the emperor had taken were all condemned to be hanged. This was the worst news Dietrich had ever heard. Then the Lady Uta, Hildebrand's high-hearted wife, arose, and, accompanied by other noble ladies, went to the enemy's camp and entered the presence of Ermenric. She offered him in exchange for the prisoner Sibic had just made, all her jewels, and those of all the other women and maidens of Bern. Ermenric told her harshly that what she offered him was his already, and that if the king wished his comrades to be set free, he and they must leave the country as beggars, on foot, and leading their horses. Hildebrand's wife could not bear to hear that. She had fallen on her knees before the emperor. But now she rose, and told him proudly that the heroes of Bern and their wives knew how to die, but not how to leave their country in dishonor. The women left the camp in deep sorrow. When Dietrich heard the bad news, he had a long struggle with himself. He had been victorious before, with smaller numbers to support him, but victory was always uncertain. And how could he allow his dear old master and noble Bergtung, brave Wulhart, Amelot, Sigaband, Helmschrott, and Lindolt, to die a shameful death? It was a hard struggle. At length he bowed his head to necessity. He consented to Ermenric's terms. On being set free from prison, 
his comrades received their horses and arms again, and then they and other faithful souls, three and forty men in all, accompanied their lord on his sad journey. There was not a dry eye in Bairn when the king went away, and even in foreign lands the fate of Dietrich and his comrades was spoken of with bated breath. The heroes would not mount their horses when they had crossed the borders of the imperial domains, for the king walked on unheeding over the wild mountain roads. So the small band of brave men wandered through the beautiful Danubian land, and approached Bacalaren, where Margrave Rudiger held court. There they received a brotherly welcome. One day, when they had been some time at Bacalaren, Dietrich, who had been thinking of the contrast between his desolated home and the smiling land he saw before him, said, with a deep sigh, that everywhere around him was peace and unity, and he would like to remain there for ever and forget his woes. Wolfhart reproached him vehemently for wishing to forget his home, adding, "'If that is the case, I shall go back and fight till my last drop of blood is shed.' "'Not so fast, young hero,' answered the Margrave. "'King Etzel owes thanks for the help once granted him. "'I will go with you to the court at Susat, "'and am certain that he will help you to regain the land of the Amelungs.'" End of section 12section 13 of epics and romances of the middle ages this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynette calkins monument colorado epics and romances of the middle ages by wilhelm wagner section 13 part 1st section 3 Dietrich of Bern, Chapter Six, King Etzel, Walter of Wagenstein, Hildigund. When Etzel became king of the Huns, he was the mightiest of all chieftains. But his lust of power was not satisfied. He collected a great army and, falling upon the land of the Franks, demanded tribute with threats of devastation. The Frankish king was unprepared to defend himself. So he paid large sums of money, and gave as hostage for his good faith the boy Hagen of Tronge. His own son was too young, being yet in the cradle. The Huns went on to Burgundy, where they also levied tribute, and received as hostage the king's daughter Hildigund, a child of four years old. They were equally successful with King Alfar of Aquitaine, who paid them much red gold, and gave them his young son Walter as hostage. Hagen and Walter early showed great warlike ability. They learnt from the Huns to ride, throw the spear, and fight after the German fashion, and few could equal them in many sports. Hildegund became very lovely, and was a great favourite with the queen. Time went on, and these young people all grew up. Helsha advised her husband to marry Hagen and Walter to Hunnish maidens of high degree, so as to confirm them in their devotion to himself and their adopted country. But the youths did not admire the beauties of that nation, whose blubber lips did not provoke a kiss. Walter was more attracted by slender Hildegund's rosy mouth, fair curls, and blue eyes than by any of the daughters of the land, and he was more pleasing in her eyes than the bow-legged hun whom the queen desired her to marry meanwhile the franks and burgundians had thrown off the yoke of the huns and etzel did not dare to enforce it in the then condition of affairs hagen one day found out what had chanced and according to one account he made his escape to his own people but according to another was sent home loaded with honours but Etzel did his best to keep Walter with him, for he knew his bravery and worth. Once, when the king returned with his warriors from conquering an invading horde, he gave a great feast, and asked Hildegund to sing him a song. The maiden complied, and sang about her old home and her mother, and how she trusted to return to them once more when the hero came for whom she waited. Etzel did not take in the sense of her song, as she had expected, 
he had raised the wine cup to his lips too often for that but queen helcia understood and determined to watch walter and the maiden lest they should fly together walter too had understood the meaning of the song and soon found an opportunity of arranging matters with hildegund regarding their flight do not sleep to-night he whispered one evening but slip into the treasure chamber and take as much gold and silver as you can carry out of the seventh chest it is part of the tribute money that your father and mine paid the huns long ago put the money you have taken in two caskets and bring them down to the hall you will find me waiting for you at the gate with two saddled horses we shall be gone a long time before the drunken huns find out that we have escaped them they carried out walter's plan in every particular and made their way to Bechelaron first then to the rhine and finally to the mountains of Voskingo, Vosges, in the highest of which the Voskenstein, they found a cave with such a narrow entrance that one man could there defend himself against an army walter wished to rest a while for he had had but little sleep during their long and toilsome journey so he asked the maiden to keep watch lest a sudden attack should be made upon them he had not been long asleep when hildegund saw the sheen of armor in the distance she wakened the hero telling him that the huns were upon them these are not huns but burgundians he answered starting to his feet and he found they were messengers sent by king gunther to demand that the treasure should be given up to him walter offered to hand over a shield full of gold but this was refused and the fray began but the assailants could only approach one at a time so the hero who had learnt from the huns to throw the javelin was able to kill them one after the other with these missiles and when they failed with his sword hagen had come with gunther's men but he stood apart during the fight siding with neither party only when he saw his friends falling fast his hand involuntarily sought his sword but he did not draw it he returned to the king and advised him to try an ambush next day as walter and hildegund were continuing their journey across the open country they were set upon by two men in complete armor who sprang out upon them from behind a clump of bushes they were hagen and king gunther despairing of flight walter leapt off his horse and they did the same with wonderful agility he dodged now to the right now to the left to avoid their blows at length his sword cut through one of king gunther's greaves and the edge entered the bone of the leg he stood over the fallen king and was about to deal him a death blow when a stroke from hagen disabled his sword arm he dropped the sword but with his left hand drew his dagger and plunged it into hagen's eye seeing them all three disabled hildegund came forward to propose a truce and bound up all their wounds after which she and walter went on their way in peace they arrived in aquitaine without further adventure and were there married the young hero in later days always took part with the burgundians and erenrich as we saw before when dietleib challenged him at romaburg end of section thirteen section fourteen of epics and romances of the middle ages this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynette Calkins, Monument, Colorado. Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages by Wilhelm Wagner. Section 14, Part the First, Section 3, Chapter 7, Etzel and Dietrich Against the Roysen. But now we must return to Dietrich and Etzel when the hero of bern desired etzel's help in freeing the land of the amelungs from the tyranny of the usurper he found that it was impossible for the latter to grant it his hands were already over full with his own quarrels valdemar king of the roysen and brother of that osantrix whom etzel had formerly slain and whose daughter he had married now invaded his borders and threatened to overrun the country in truth etzel needed dietrich's help and the latter did not hesitate to grant it the war lasted a long time many men were slain and much fair land was devastated before the invaders were forced to retire dietrich himself was so severely wounded that it was some time before he felt like himself again 
there was one thing which happened during the war that saddened and shamed honest margrave rudiger and that was the remembrance of the way in which etzel had on one occasion fled before valdemar thereby proving the latter the better man indeed every one felt that the defeat of the Reusen was owing more to the leadership and heroism of the hero of bern than to any other cause etzel pursued the enemy within their own borders and forced them to pay him tribute dietrich was held in high honor by the huns but they did not see the advantage of helping him to regain his own land and he felt sad at heart at last queen helsha thought of a way to make him happy she proposed to give him her beautiful niece herat to wife and then they might rule together over the princess's fair land of transylvania dietrich and herat made no objection to the marriage which was soon afterwards celebrated but etzel erred in thinking that the hero of bern would ever be content to sink into the position of a vassal of the hunnish empire neither he nor herat were made of such slight stuff and etzel was obliged after all to give the help he had before refused End of section 14. Section 15 of Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynette Calkins, Monument, Colorado. Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages by Wilhelm Wagner. Section 15, Part 1st. Section 3, Dietrich of Bern. Chapter 8, The Raven Fight battle of ravenna dietrich goes to bern going back to bern dietrich is going back to bern we are to have a campaign in lombardy was the cry which rang through the land of the huns yes dietrich was really going back accompanied by many brave comrades new and old and at the head of a large army even etzel's two sons mere boys as they were insisted on going too the line of march lay through the great mountains and fair plains of lombardy amelot and hildebrand at the head of the wolfings stormed garden and took the fortress but the old master had not time to stay and embrace the lady ute and his son hadrand for they were not in the castle at the time and he had to rejoin the army without delay he came up with the rest at padua which dietrich failed to subdue the army leaving padua behind it moved on to bern from which Dietrich heard that Ermenrich's men had been expelled by the citizens. At length the hero was at home in his beloved Bern, where he was received with great rejoicings. He had not long to rest, for a few days after his arrival, Alfer came, bringing a message from Duke Friedrich of Raben that the Emperor Ermenrich was besieging his town. Therefore he begged the hero's assistance. The Bernese forces made a rapid march, and arrived unexpectedly in the neighborhood of the imperial army. It was of no use to send out scouts. The foe lay hidden in every thicket. Dietrich asked his heroes which of them would undertake to gain the enemy's outpost, and immediately young Alfart, the Lady Utis foster son, declared himself ready. Others wished to have the duty, but he had spoken first, and it was given to him. Alfart's Death the youthful hero rode on toward the dangerous outposts suddenly spears and arrows rained round him and fell rattling from helm and shield but they did no harm for his armor had been made by dwarfs the enemy's leader rode up to him and desired him to yield saying that he might give him his sword without shame for he was duke wolfing and would return the weapon to alfart when he was ransomed what cried the hero are you duke wolfing the only traitor of our race you shall have your wages here to-day and from my hands the combat between the two men was short alfert slew his opponent upon this the duke's retainers hastened up to avenge him but the young hero killed half of them and put the rest to flight a spirit from the nethermost hell has come to fight for dietrich cried the men-at-arms it slew more than fifty of us single-handed and we ourselves hardly escaped with our lives do you not know that the hero of bern is a son of the devil was the answer and what is more natural than that a father should come to his child's assistance no mortal man can be expected to fight with such a foe 
i will go out and see if it be not made of flesh and blood cried stout vidditch even though it had all hell at its back i care not i must have a turn with it he armed himself quickly and caught up a sword without noticing that it was not mimung Jaime, whose life he had saved a short time before offered to go with him and avenge him should he fall alfart recognized the man from a distance ye are two faithless comrades he cried and have come to meet your doom the combat between him and vidditch began forthwith and the latter soon perceived that he had not mimung he was twice felled to the ground in his sore distress he called on his comrade to help him but Heim hesitated because it was considered dishonourable for two warriors to fight against one when alfart however called upon vidditch to yield if he would not be slain on the spot Hyma sprang forward and covered his comrade with his shield, thus enabling him to get to his feet again, after which both warriors attacked the young hero. Alfart was as active on foot as he was strong of hand. He felled Hyma, but Vidich came to his help, and so the battle went on. The three warriors bled from many wounds, but it was Hyma's hand that finally dealt the death blow. Faithless comrades that ye are, sighed the dying Alfart the curse of your dishonourable deeds will follow you to the grave the conquerors left the place of combat in silence they did not noise abroad the fame of their deed yet their armour was bloody and they were sorely wounded the men-at-arms whispered in mysterious tones they have been fighting with that spirit from hell have slain it but have seen some terrible sight the news of alfart's death was received with deep sorrow in the bernese camp Dietrich prepared to offer battle to the emperor on the following day, and made all necessary dispositions in case he fell in the fight. THE BATTLE Master Hildebrand held watch. Not contented with keeping a distant lookout on the enemy's movements, he went to see with his own eyes what was passing within their lines. A thick mist covered the earth, and hid every object from view. Suddenly the old master and his companion, Eckhart, heard the tramp of a horse. They drew their swords and waited. At the same moment the moon broke through the mist, and they recognized by its light Reinald of Milan, who, although one of Ermenric's men, was at the same time a friend of theirs. They greeted each other heartily, and Reinald said that if he might advise Dietrich, he would counsel him to return to the land of the Huns where he had made himself a home, for the emperor was too powerful to be overthrown. After taking leave of their friend, Hildebrand looked about carefully and discovered a path leading through the wood by which he could outflank the imperial forces unperceived. On his return to the camp, he arranged with Dietrich that he should take three divisions by this path and fall upon the enemy at daybreak. Meantime, the king was to be ready to attack in front the moment he heard Hildebrand's horn sound to the rear of the enemy no sooner had the sun risen than the battle began great deeds of valour were done on either side it were an endless task to tell of each hero's achievements among those who fell were the two young sons of etzel who showed themselves worthy of their name during the course of that day dietrich and vidich met at last and it was in this wise twilight was drawing on apace when vidich led by his evil star or by his companion reinald of milan went back to visit the outpost. Dietrich saw them go, and, remounting, galloped across the valley towards the height, and the other two turned to meet him. When Vidich saw the king riding towards him, his face distorted by the angry spirit that possessed him, and his breath issuing from his mouth like flames of fire, a terror he had never known before overmastered him. He turned his horse and fled, followed by Reinald. "'Halt, cowards! Halt!' cried the king two against one surely ye are strong enough halt comrade said reinald i cannot bear the shame of this vidish turned but no sooner did he see the terrible face and flaming breath of his old leader than he fled once more leaving reinald alone to bear the brunt of the attack stop traitor shouted dietrich you have the sword mimung in your hand with which you once conquered me at bern and do you now fear to stand but Vidich, by encouraging words and a free use of the spur, urged his noble steed to a yet swifter pace. The king did the same, 
and Falcon was even fleeter than Vidich's gallant charger. The surf might now be heard beating on the seashore. The fugitive warrior reached the strand. He could fly no farther. And behold, at the same moment, two white arms and a woman's head rose out of the waves. Vachilde, ancestress, save me! Hide me from that spirit of hell! he cried, and took the terrible leap. And Vachilde received him in her arms and bore him to her crystal hall at the bottom of the sea. Dietrich did not hesitate to follow. The waters swept over him and his horse, but Falcon rose again and swam through the roaring surf to the shore. The king looked all about, but Vidich had vanished. He could see nothing but the foaming waves. Sadly, the king returned to the camp, having found neither the vengeance nor the death he had sought. The Huns declared that they would return home as soon as they had buried their princes with fitting honor. Dietrich heard their determination unmoved. He was thinking of those who had fallen. Master Hildebrand, on the other hand, did what he could to induce them to follow up the victory that they had gained the previous day, but it was labor lost. They had had enough of fighting at the Battle of Ravenna. Broken-hearted, Dietrich returned to King Etzel, by whom he was received with the greatest kindness, in spite of all that had come and gone. He sank into a state of sorrowful brooding and melancholy, until at length Herat, his faithful wife, came to him and spoke words of comfort and encouragement, and he roused from his dull woe and started again for fair Lombardy, accompanied by the queen. End of section 15section 16 of epics and romances of the middle ages this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynette calkins monument colorado epics and romances of the middle ages by wilhelm wagner section 16 part the first section 3 dietrich of bern chapter 9 going home to garden the king queen and the old master took leave of etzel who was too sad about the death of his boys to take much interest in their coming or going the travellers at length came to a wooded hill with a castle perched on the top this castle belonged to a robber knight named elsung who had always been an enemy of the emelungs and wolfings the old master who acted as guide and led the way bade the king be prepared he did not speak a moment too soon, for Elsung at the same instant appeared, followed by some horsemen. The robber knight drew rein, and haughtily demanded, as told from the travellers, their horses and armour, Hildebrand's long beard, and the beautiful woman who accompanied them. "'We need our horses and armour that we might fight in the land of the Amelungs,' said Hildebrand, "'and we cannot spare the woman, for she acts as our cook.' "'Nay, then, you are Amelungs yourselves,' cried Elsung and must each give me your right hand and left foot as ransom. If you refuse, I will have your heads as well, that I may avenge my father, whom Samson slew. The heroes deigned no further answer. They paid another toll than that demanded, with the points of their swords and spears, and with such hearty good will that Elsung's men were either slain or else took to flight, and their lord himself was finally overthrown and bound. As Hildebrand was about to tie the prisoner to a horse, Elsung said, "'You are Erminrich's men, so I will tell you the news that has just reached me. The brothers of the Lady Svanhilde, whom the Emperor had trodden to death by horses, have fallen upon him and have cut off his hands and feet.' "'Ha!' cried the hero of Bern. "'Do you bring such good news? Take your liberty and payment thereof.' The travellers now pursued their journey." and after meeting with several more adventures, at last arrived safely at Garden, where they were at first received with suspicion. But the Lady Uta recognized her husband the moment she saw him, and Hadebrand was introduced to his brave old father, whom he had not seen since his childhood. To Bern The hero of Bern was welcomed with the utmost joy by his people, and soon collected an army, which among its most celebrated warriors numbered brave Lodwig and his son Conrad, faithful Eckhart and his comrade Hatche. Nor was Heime wanting. 
he had done penance for his sins in a cloister and now hearing of dietrich's return hastened to him to renew his oath death having released him from the fealty he had formerly owed to ermenrich dietrich's and sibrich's forces met a terrible battle took place dietrich fought with heroic valor sweeping down all before him eckhart and hatche sought untiringly for faithless sibich and at last they recognized him among the fugitives although he had cast from him all signs of the imperial dignity he had usurped eckhart seized him by the scruff of the neck swung him before him on his horse and galloped back to the camp remember the harlungs he cried and immediately ordered a gallows to be erected sibich entreated for life bare life he offered much red gold to have his death put off for even a short space but remember the harlungs was the only answer he received and so the victory was won the hero of bern marched to romaburg at the head of his army he was everywhere met by the princes of the land of the emelungs they greeted him as their chief and on his arrival at romaburg he received the imperial crown the passing of dietrich herat was a faithful wife and helpmeet the old master and many of his other ancient friends were round him but in the midst of his glory dietrich could not forget the faithful comrades who had died in his service the friends who had given him their all and to whom he could no longer show either love or kindness his power was great the empire was more extensive than it had ever been before and peace reigned within its borders once indeed a giant had committed great devastations within the land and hyma had sought him out but only to be slain dietrich himself had then gone forth and had conquered the monster it was the last combat in which the aged hero ever took part his wife noble herat soon after fell sick and died from that time forward his character seemed changed he was gloomy and morose and committed many actions for which no after repentance could atone the only one of his former pleasures that gave him any happiness was that of hunting when he heard the cheerful sound of the horns his face would clear up and a smile play on his lips and he would once more look like the dietrich his friends had known of yore once when he was bathing in the river a great stag with golden horns wonderful to look upon trotted slowly along the bank and passed into the wood close by he sprang out of the water threw on his clothes and called for horse and hounds before the servants could bring him what he desired dietrich perceived a coal-black steed come towards him neighing seizing his sword and darts he hastily mounted the noble animal and galloped after the stag his servants followed with the fleetest horses in his stables but could not come up with him the hero rode on faster and ever faster his people waited weeks months and even years for his return but all in vain the mighty empire had no ruler bloody wars broke out in consequence his subjects longed for his return that his strong hand might rule the land again but still he did not come woden his ancestor had caught him up to himself and had made him one of his wild huntsmen many a benighted traveller has seen him rushing past mounted on his coal-black steed the people of lausitz and other parts of germany talk of him as dether burnett and see him in the furious host even to this day End of section 16. Section 17 of Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wilkie Mills, Buffalo, New York. Epics and Romances of the Middle Ages by Wilhelm Wegner Section 17 Part 2nd The Nibelung and Kindred Legends Section 1 The Nibelung Hero Chapter 1 Siegfried's Youth Once upon a time there was a noble prince in the Netherlands called Siegfried alternately Siegfried Sigvart or Sigurur. His father, Sigmund, was descended from the glorious race of the Wulfungs, who traced their lineage back to Wodan. His mother, 
Siglinda was of equally high birth. They both rejoiced in the early signs of strength and activity displayed by their son, and hoped that when grown to man's estate his heroic deeds might gain him glory and renown. The boy, however, soon became aware of his wonderful strength, and showed a haughty, unbending spirit. He would suffer no contradiction. He beat his playfellows black and blue when they displeased him, even those among them who were much bigger than he. The older he grew, the more he was hated by all the other boys, and the more anxious his parents became regarding his future. At last Sigmund told the queen that he only knew of one way to bring the youth rebel under rule, and that was to apprentice him to the smith, Mimer, who lived in the neighboring forest, and who was a strong and wise man, and would teach the boy how to forge the weapons he should one day wield as a warrior. The queen gave her consent, so the father took the necessary steps. When the smith heard the whole story, he declared himself ready to undertake the task assigned him, for he had a strong belief in the pacifying effect of hard work. Everything went well for a time. One year passed on after another, till the prince grew almost to man's estate. But labor in the smithy was irksome to him, and when his comrades set him right, he beat them, threw them down, and, on one occasion, went so far as to drag the best smith among them, Wieland, by the hair, to his master's feet. "'This will not do at all,' said Mimer. "'Come here and forge yourself a good sword.' Siegfried was quite ready to do so. He asked for the best iron and the heaviest hammer, which was such a weight that it took both hands to wield it. Mimer drew the strongest bar of iron out of the forge, glowing red, and laid it on the anvil. Siegfried swung the hammer with one hand, as though it had been a plaything, but when it came down upon the iron the blow was like a clap of thunder. The house shook to its foundation. The iron shivered into splinters, and the anvil sunk a foot deep into the ground. "'This will never do!' said the master as before. We must try another plan, my boy, if you are to make yourself a suitable weapon. Go to the charcoal burner in the pine wood, and fetch me as much of his charcoal as you can carry on your strong shoulders. Meanwhile, I shall prepare the best iron to make you a sword, such as never yet was possessed by any warrior. Siegfried was so pleased to hear this, that picking up the largest axe he could find, he set out into the forest. It was a beautiful spring day. The birds were singing, and the grass was studded with violets and forget-me-nots. He plucked a bunch of flowers and stuck them in his leather cap, from a half-conscious feeling that they might perhaps bring him good luck. He went on further and further, till he reached the middle of a dark pine forest. Not a bird was to be seen, but the gloomy silence was broken by a gurgling, hissing, and roaring that might easily have affrighted a less daring spirit. He soon found the reason for the noise. A dismal swamp lay before him, in which gigantic toads, snakes, and lindworms were disporting themselves. "'I never saw so many horrible creatures in my life,' said Siegfried, but I will soon stop their music. So saying, he picked up dead trees and threw them into the morass, till he had completely covered it, after which he hastened on to the charcoal burner's house. Arrived there, he asked the man to give him fire that he might burn the monsters. Poor boy, said the charcoal burner, I am very sorry for you, but if you go back the way you came, the great dragon will come out of his cave and make but a single mouthful of you. Smith Mimer is a faithless man. He came here before you and told me that he had roused the worm against you, because you were so unmanageable. 
have no fear good man answered siegfried i shall first slay the worm and then the smith but now give me the fire that i may burn the poisonous brood the lad was soon back at the swamp he set fire to the dry wood with which he had covered it and let it blaze the wind was favorable and fanned the flames to a great fire so that the creatures were all burnt up in a short space of time the lad then went round the dismal swamp and found a small rivulet of hot fat issuing from it he dipped his finger in it and found on withdrawing it that it was covered with a horn-like skin ah he thought this would be useful in war he therefore undressed and bathed his whole body in the liquid fat so that he was now covered with horn from head to foot except in one place between his shoulders where a leaf had stuck to his skin this he did not discover until later he dressed himself again in his leather garments and walked on his club resting on his shoulder suddenly the dragon darted out upon him from its hiding place but three good blows of his club slew the monster he then went back to the smithy to take vengeance on the master smith and his comrade at sight of him the men fled affrighted into the forest but the master awaited the youth's arrival at first mima tried the effects of flattering words but finding that they were vain he took to his sword siegfried then dealt him one mighty blow and had no need to strike again having done this the lad went into the smithy and with great patience and care forged himself a sword whose blade he hardened in the blood of the lindworm then he set out for his father's palace the king sharply rebuked him for his evil deed in slaying the master smith who was so good a subject and so useful to the whole country and the queen in her turn reproached him with many tears for having stained his hands with innocent blood siegfried sobered by his father's reproof and softened by his mother's tears did not try to excuse himself but falling at the queen's feet and hiding his face in his hands he said the sight of her tears cut him to the heart and for the future he vowed that his deeds should be those of a gentle knight then the hearts of the parents were comforted from that time forward siegfried was changed he listened to the advice of men of understanding and strove to learn how to act wisely and well whenever he felt one of his old fits of passion coming over him he thought of his mother's tears and his father's reproof and conquered the evil spirit that threatened to master him the expectations of the people were great respecting him they were sure that in him their nation had found a new hero and then he was so handsome and graceful that the women admired him as much for his looks as the men did for his prowess young siegfried sails to isenland his father and mother were so proud of him that they longed for the day when his name and fame should be hailed with applause in every land the king at length deemed that the time was come to give siegfried and his comrades and many young nobles of his own and other lands the sword and armor that marked a warrior this investiture was in those days a ceremony of great importance and took up the same place in a young man's life as the ceremony of knighthood in later times the solemn investiture was succeeded by feats of arms and trials of skill siegfried was victorious in all and at the end of the day the populace shouted long live young siegfried our king long may he and his worthy father rule over us but he signed to them and said i am not worthy of such high honor 
I must first win a kingdom for myself. I will entreat my noble father to allow me to go out into the world and seek my fortune. When the warriors were all assembled at the feast in the royal hall, Siegfried did not take his place at the upper end of the table beside his father, but modestly seated himself among the young warriors who had still their names to make. Some of the party began to talk of distant Isenland the kingdom of the beautiful and warlike Brunhild, who challenged all her wooers to do battle with her, thereby slaying many. They talked of the land of the Nibelungs, learned in magic, of the Drachenstein, where a flying dragon of fiendish aspect had taken up its abode. Others again talked of the lovely princess at Worms on the Rhine, who was carefully guarded by her three brothers and by her uncle, Strong Hagen. Oh, how pleasant it must be to see such marvels and to seek out adventures, cried Siegfried. And approaching his father, he asked his permission to go out and see the world. The king understood his desire for he had had an adventurous youth himself, and promised to let him go, provided his mother gave her consent. It was pain and grief to the queen to part with her son, but she at last permitted him to go, and one fine morning he set out, dressed in a shining suit of armor, mounted on a swift horse, and bearing the sword which he himself had made. His spirits were high, and his heart full of hope, as is the case with every youth of spirit who goes out into the unknown world to seek his fortune. He went northwards in the direction of Isenland. On reaching the seashore he found a vessel ready to start, but the skipper feared a storm, and only set sail at Siegfried's entreaty. After a quick but tempestuous voyage Siegfried landed and went up to the palace. Queen Brynhild received him in the great hall, where many warriors were assembled, each of whom had come determined to woo the lady by great feats of arms. On the following day the warriors assembled in the lists, where Brynhild joined them before long. She was clad in full armor, and looked as haughty and as beautiful as Freya when she led the Valkyries of old to the battles of the heroes. Siegfried gazed at her in astonishment. She was so much taller and nobler looking than any of the maidens in her train, who were armed equally with herself. He almost wished to join the ranks of the wooers and win her hand. He raised a stone in sport and flung it far beyond the lists, then, turning to the queen, took leave of her with all reverence, and returned again to his vessel, saying to himself, I could never love her. She is too like a man. That maiden must be shy and modest, gentle and kindly, who would gain the heart of a brave warrior so utterly that he would think nothing of spending his heart's blood in her service. After a quick voyage, he resumed his journey by land, now through rich and well-cultivated plains, and again through desert lands where wild beasts and robbers had their abode. He had many a hard fight, by the way, and slew all manner of giants and monsters. The minstrels sang of his great deeds in cottage and in castle, so that his name became known far and wide. When he reached the land of the Nibelungs, the kings of that country, Schulbung and Nibelung by name, asked him to divide between them the treasure left them by their father, Nibeling, for they could not agree as to what was a fair division. In payment for this service they offered him the good sword Balmung, which was the handiwork of dwarfs, and was tempered in dragon's blood. The hero divided the treasure with the utmost fairness, yet the brothers were not satisfied. They told him that they were sure he was keeping back the most valuable things for himself, 
and commanded twelve enormous giants to seize him and confine him in the hollow mountain where the treasure was kept the hero at once drew balmung and began slaying one giant after another then the royal magicians chanted their spells and called up a thick mist a storm arose and the mountain trembled under the repeated thunderclaps all in vain the last of the giants fell and finally the two brothers were slain then the mist cleared away and the sun shone full on the victorious warrior when the nibelung people saw the wonders that had been done they greeted siegfried as their king but even yet his difficulties were not at an end an avenger had arisen this was albrecht the dwarf well armed with enchanted weapons he came up against the bold warrior he was now visible now invisible according as he drew the cap of darkness over his helmet or took it off after a long struggle siegfried overthrew him the dwarf was now in his power but siegfried could not kill a defenceless foe albrecht was so touched with this generosity that he swore to be true to his victor an oath he never broke after this no one disputed the hero's right to the land of the nibelungs he was recognized as king by the whole people and also became possessed of all the treasures in the hollow mountain and of albrecht's cap of darkness by reason of his victory over the dwarf when siegfried had reduced the whole kingdom to order and appointed proved men to be governors of the provinces he chose out twelve noble warriors to be his trusty companions the treasure furnished him with rings and chains of silver and gold with which to enrich his followers the whole band looked like an assemblage of kings under the lead of some yet mightier chieftain he and his men now set out on their journey homewards and reached the netherlands without further adventure the king and queen were overjoyed to see their son of whom they had for a long time heard nothing but indistinct rumors siegfried remained at home for many days to rest and recover from his weariness he often passed hours sitting at his mother's feet as when he was a little boy and telling her of his hopes and longings his confidence and trust in her made her very happy but when he stood before her in all the panoply of war her heart beat high with pride that she had such a hero for a son pleasant as it was to be at home siegfried could not long be contented with idleness his soul panted to be out in the battle of life where alone a man preserves his strength of mind and body he told his father that he wished to go to worms in the rhineland and try his fortune with the great warriors of burgundy the king's face clouded when he heard this my son he said do not go to burgundy for there dwell the boldest warriors in the whole world no one has yet withstood them there are grim hagen strong ortwin of metz and king gunther with his brother gernot they all unite in guarding the lovely maiden kiermhild whom many a brave man has wooed only to lose his life ha that is a good story cried bold siegfried these mighty warriors shall yield me their kingdom and the lovely maid as well if she be pleasing in my eyes with my twelve nibelungs at my back i have no fears about the fighting the king's remonstrances and the queen's entreaties were alike in vain they were obliged to consent to their son's undertaking this adventure End of section 17 Recording by Wilkie Mills, Buffalo, New York